That was okay. Oh, okay. Why well, didn't actually so the ones upstairs? Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. a little five button here.
or turn it on. Okay. So we'll get rolling. I just want to thank everybody for traveling around the state and getting here. Enjoyed everybody's company last night. Little icebreaker. Um, hope you're all doing well. I know it's incredibly busy, I think, for everybody right now from every aspect. So we really appreciate everybody getting here. Our uh, our member in the in the crowd in the back, um, Representative Logie, we're sure glad you're here to keep us on the straight and narrow as we uh, look at some things going forward for the 23 legislature, if you have any guidance. Um, so with that, we'll jump right in with home reports and uh, see where we go. So if we could start over there, maybe with Everett, and come around this way. Uh, so I took the opportunity at our region two CAC to talk about trespass and hunter behavior. And we had a subcommittee meeting with about a dozen of our members. And, uh, I think what, what came out of that was both landowners and sportsmen really concerned about what's happening there. Of course, landowners with erosion of, uh, in their private property rights, but sportsmen also with the erosion of opportunity and, uh, perception of other hunters cheating by getting access in ways that they, they really shouldn't be. So I think with what's going on with Wyoming, people are watching that very closely um, with the legislative session coming up, wondering if there's going to be anything that addresses corner crossing in some way. But I think it's that and just poor hunter behavior is really on a lot of sportsmen minds and, and landowners as well. So we, we didn't have anything earth shattering come out of that for solutions. Uh, but definitely an encouragement that we we need to address it in, in some way and continue to look for opportunities to encourage better hunter behavior and and uh, just raise that bar. Uh, the elk management plan is also something in Region 2 we've been talking about quite a bit. And the process and the direction that that is going is, is something that a lot of people have questions about. And uh the the scoping meetings have been have been helpful but i find that those become more of um a questioning of of fwp practices and mainly in the biological sense and how they're doing their counts or surveys or or what uh they're looking for and so we we don't really get to the social aspect as much because we're we're trying to get uh, everybody to basically become a biologist in 20 minutes and that's not going to happen. Right. So uh, I feel like we miss out on some of that social component that I would really like to hear more from uh, the people that are at those meetings, but uh, I'm encouraged that we've got some timelines and some benchmarks that we're looking towards to have that elk management plan put in place and what we might see uh, in the near future from the department on that. And then kind of on a personal note, the, I've been using the app quite a bit. I was able to validate my first e-tag recently and that process went really smooth and I was I was pretty pleased with that. Uh, but I am really wondering what is next for the app and how we're going to continue to improve it in, in that timeline. Um, I know we have phases coming up and I've, I've talked with members of the department, but uh, I'm really concerned that we're we're not moving fast enough and I'm kind of an impatient guy anyway. So I apologize for that. But uh, what I've used so far has been great. I just would really like to see more, more use from it. So that's kind of what we're doing other than chasing animals during the season right now. Well, um, just got back from antelope hunting over in Eastern Montana uh, last night, decided I wanted to join you guys. Uh, Antelope numbers are so so over there. Um, what I'm seeing out there is our mule deer are in a world of hurt, um, especially out south where I, there's always been a lot of uh, mule deer, and I I guess I'm con greatly concerned about that. I saw quite a few out north, but I don't know if, if they moved all south from north or what's going on. But it's it's, it's a concern. The antelope uh, hunting is. There's a few antelope, but not like the numbers that we used to have. I'd like to see. I don't know if that's our job to do something on that. Um, trespass still seems to be a big concern. I had some more landowners say, you know, um, people are trespassing on their property. And 
and leaving garbage and stuff around. I think they're very deeply concerned about that. Uh, I see the elk management plan. We had the comments come in on those uh, from the elk working group. Um, a lot of um, pretty thoughtful things come out of it. Some of it was pretty well duplicated on some of the stuff we were doing, hunter education and stuff like that. Um, I, I guess I looked through the, some of these sportsmen's groups, they seem to be, um, still, um, wanting to attack the 454 program, make it go back to the way it was before when we didn't have any participation from landowners. And I think the 454 looks like it opened a lot of opportunities up and probably even more this year. Um, other than that, I guess that's about all I had right now. Thanks, Paul. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. A um, few things happening up in the north central Montana area just to, to cover. Um, we've definitely been through drought. I don't think that's a, a new news to really anyone in this group or anyone probably around the state. It's been affecting certainly livestock producers in the sense that we're most or a lot of people are shipping cattle early. They're running out of water. Um, three main drainages on our ranch are dry. Um, it's probably been 1988 since, since we've seen something like this. So it's definitely, and it's been accumulating. It's been a few years of that because we've also got a, we this year we had a huge grasshopper issue again, which I think if I remember correctly is now kind of going on three years. So, um, interestingly enough, um, it looks like the, our cattle that we, that we have not sold and we still have are the calves, the cows are healthy. They, the, their weights are good, um, which means that through proper management, we've kind of downsized. We've, we've, we've used other, other fields, things like that, um, to help kind of with that, which I think has also helped um, in the wildlife segment. It's a big part of our ranch as well as keeping a good habitat for them and the wildlife look good. Um, I just had our, our biologist up um, to the ranch and he finished his counts. I don't have all the information back. I talked to him a little bit last night, um, but seemingly looks okay to start, but we really won't know until we kind of get through the whole season to see how harvests were and things like that. Um, with that, um, I've talked to a lot of people along the county road. I think one of the biggest um, things that I've seen um, even more so, and I, I, I can't say that I've scientifically tracked it. I just kind of look as I'm around the ranch. We see more and more numbers of people um, coming over this time of year. We had, um, you know, we've got antelope open now, birds have been open for a while and archery, of course, but lots of traffic that way. Um, and just talking to people um, out, everyone's excited to be out and about. They really like that. It's been an awesome fall to do that. Um, I've been grateful for the fact uh, that, that we haven't, how do I say this without, uh, I, I want so much snow and rain, I can't, I can't stand it. But for people traveling and people wanting to be out and recreating and things like that, I'm kind of thankful it's been a nice fall for that because roads aren't torn up. Uh, people are able to get around safely and and really the grasshoppers took away most of the danger of any fires um, but I have talked to a lot of people just kind of reminding them that hey be careful out there please you know watch um, it would still I mean it we could still have a fire right now and it would it seemed like it was the, the dead of summer um, for that um, a little bit of trespass not not terrible I think I think that's something that again we continue to work on I think again and I may have said this before, I think the biggest thing is a, a lot of people don't really understand the difference between federal lands and state lands. So I still have people kind of driving in thinking that it's, well, it's a gate and it's a road. Um, we, it's, you know, we can get in there and we're trying to get to BLM or vice versa. And it just, it's one of those things that I, 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 don't, I, I it's ignorance, you know, in some respects, but again, it, it hasn't been terrible and people are always really polite and, and, um, I think even with their onyx systems and things they're trying to do their part. So um, I think that's, that's something to kind of uh, keep in mind there. I did have one uh, gentleman um, mentioned to me about, and he's actually from over in Western Montana and it maybe falls into the block management side of things wondered about, and I didn't know if there is any opportunities for opportunities for landowners that do conservation easements or things like that, that would then allow them to have a, a tag or something like that if they did something over and above. Um, and so it was just a comment that was made to me um, as we look at these different programs that, that we have and have opportunity to um, create that, you know, public uh, private relationship. He just mentioned conservation easements uh, in that. And I think uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I, one, one last thing, I guess on birds, uh, I have, I've thought the birds have seemed okay, although I'm not the biologist that, 
that counts them, but um, a couple gentlemen from uh, uh, Minnesota that have come out to some of the state land on our place, um, been coming for 15, 20 years, said they thought uh, the birds were down a little bit um, in our areas, which I thought was surprising considering how I thought usually with dry weather and things that, that would make it good. And the grasshoppers, I figure there's tons to eat, but uh, maybe it's a cover issue. Um, I don't know. They, they thought they, they thought that they seemed to be a little bit down. I, I thought that what I've seen around the ranch that they look pretty good, but again, it's just some observations. So thank you. Thank you, Rich. Tyranny. Yeah, so with rifle on antelope starting, um, just being uh, at the few shippings that I've been out to through the bank throughout Yellowstone County and then back in Garfield County, um, you see a lot of road hunters happening and maybe that's just where the block management areas are, but um, they find them from the road. They're gonna park in the middle of the road. They don't necessarily pull over. They don't find a, a parking spot. So it's kind of tough with a lot of trucks and trailers going about. I know that's been um, one comment that's been brought up um, and then just particular at our place, there may be lack of antelope, maybe that's the issue, but you have some people hunting and you, you see them, um, they're stalking this antelope and you have somebody else just drive up there when they're not supposed to be and they ruin that hunt for them people. So there's some of that going on where we can, we can stop and say, hey, you know, I think th those guys are on those antelope, but we watch them physically go drive and then take off up there. So there's been some of that. So just a lot of traffic. I know just from going to some shippings, um, there's been a lot of hunting traffic and, and it's everywhere. So, um, but there's also some very good hunters. I've had a lot of comments say where people have been, you know, if they stop them, if they see the rancher, the owner out there doing something, you know, they can stop and ask and they're very polite about it. So, so just the uptick in traffic really has just been the comment. I did have somebody comment on the, the app also that just wanted to know um, what all was going on with that. So that's it. Thank you. Drew. Good morning, everyone, again. Um, to average point, nothing <clears throat> really crazy new or, or earth shattering. Um, spent a lot of time in the field this fall, uh, personally hunting, and then I've just <clears throat> I've spent a lot of time at sporting goods stores. <clears throat> my time of year from work, so I, I get to travel not only Montana, but uh, you know the, the Mountain West. and Time and time again, my, my conversations uh, always end up around elk. I don't know why. I must, I'm starting to smell like an elk, I think. so. <clears throat> and, and the number one thing that comes up all the time is the privatization of, of wildlife. Um, the, the 454s, of course, come up next. And it's, it's, it's mixed on, on feelings for that 454. Again, I, I think the folks that uh, are... I wouldn't say that they don't even like it. It's just not that they don't like it, but they're just cautious of it. And, and again, leading to that, that privatization. So um, folks are definitely paying attention to what we're doing and what the other committees are doing and <clears throat> hyper-focused on the upcoming uh, election cycle and, and legislative period. So that's, that's been a lot of my conversations in the field. Ed. Thank you, Drew. Mr. Cornwell. Uh, it's up in our country, we finally got the grasshoppers. Rich sent us some of them. And so anyway, this summer was pretty easy. We had to mow the yard around the house, but the rest of it between the milk cows and the saddle horses and the grasshoppers looks like a pool table. <laughs> we, we had some hay where we could irrigate, and, and the, but the water's drying up. Like Rich said, that we rely on pits. And there's a few springs, but they are always there. But the, but they're the north end of the ranch, up north toward Old Pyman, that's better. We got better antelope than we've had for several years. And the deer, I don't know, they go wherever, wherever there's a green spot. You know, the whitetail all died last year from EHD, so they're where we are. So I think it's okay. Everybody's pretty respectful, you know, and we don't have much trouble. There's enough block management and public land and everybody, most of the people, unless they're from out of state, they're all good. And those guys get good too. There was two guys came from Wisconsin about a month ago and they were, Midnight coyote hunters, never heard of that. But they had a the one guy was an accountant from Madison or somewhere, and his daughter was married to the fish guy for the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks in Valley County, and they stayed there a week. They got eighty-eight coyotes in a week <clears throat> in the dark. One guy said he had one of those guns like Rambo, you know, with the stock slides out on it. 
He said he, the scope cost 23,000 bucks. I said, <laughs> my luck would fall out of the pickup. And <laughs> But no, they had fun. I think it helped, you know, the, the coyotes, the gophers looked like buffalo running across the grass. <laughs> That's about it. <clears throat> Man. Thanks, Lee. Dale. Uh, Mr. Chairman, unlike Rich's country, our country looks very, very good compared to a year ago. I mean, for as bad a drought as we had a year ago, we had great spring rains and there is abundant cover out there. Of course, there's always the threat of fire danger like there is in Rich's area. We also had a lot of grasshoppers, but overall I've been out quite a bit and been very, very impressed with the look of the country. A um, couple of things. What, regarding elk management and the elk management plan, just talking to a few people, they said they just wish there was a, the information was more readily available or was clear of what the process is. And it's like, they know there'll be some public meetings, but the timetable for them and what the expectations are, I talked to a handful of people. It's like, I'm not even sure where this is going. I went online to look some stuff up and I can't really get it figured out. And I, I'd have to say, I share a little bit of that same frustration. Kind of like Paul said, um, boy, there's areas in region seven where, where mule deer are really hard to find. And I've talked to numerous landowners that have said the same thing. Um, I went down Rosebud Creek, which is a major thoroughfare uh, between Miles City and, uh, and Forsyth, and it goes south near the, the Wyoming border. And it's usually just a mecca for mule deer. And I did that on Saturday, purposely left on at about legal shooting time, left the interstate, and I saw 12 deer uh, the entire route and I didn't stop in glass, but normally you're dodging deer the entire way and talked to another landowner down by the Stacy area and said they've never seen and said in the all the years he's lived there, he's never seen so few deer. Talked to another ranch over by the locate area, which is east of Mile City. He's saying the same thing. So um could they be spread out because of the vegetation? Maybe, but it was dry enough and hot enough this year that some of those green fields you would have thought would have been magnets for them. And they're, they're, they're just not there. They're just, we're just not seeing them. Um, lastly, a lady from Miles City who was part of that elk working group, she and I were invited to the Southeast Montana Farm Bureau meeting here about two weeks ago. And, uh, we both gave them updates on in terms of what our group is doing and also what the elk management group was uh, had done. And that was well received. I think they appreciated that that dialogue with us. So that's what I have. Thank you. Thanks, Dale. You're gonna make sure I talk. <laughs> no, really in my area, there's not much happening. Uh, uh, we do have the archery open now, but uh, we don't have many elk or deer anymore. So that's been pretty quiet. Uh, about the only thing people talk about right now is all the bear down and in town and every place else. But uh, uh, it, in that uh, whole region, there's uh, really, well, there's quite a few block management, but there's only the one 454 and no palace. In, the whole region and that so but the one thing i i do find that talking to uh people in that uh that uh they keep reminding me that uh you know anything that we do as a committee that we uh, decide on or anything we put through the legislation it all still boils down to uh the landowner has to accept it and uh you know uh, uh like the program or it isn't going to do any good. That's what I had. Thanks, Ray. Cindy. Um, for me, I, it was the elk management plan. There's, there was a lot of discussion when we had our meeting on the elk management plan, and I'm with Dale. Um, there is a little confusion about the actual timelines and and. Um, goal and when it'll be all established, etc. You see it a little bit on the internet, but it is a little confusing. Uh, 
and still concerned about the 454. I think I think part of it is uh, they're a little hard to understand for Joe Smuckatelli and uh, <laughs> <clears throat> some of them just plain don't like it. That's all. Thanks, Cindy. Donna. Yes. Um, well, my favorite two days of the whole season is about to begin, and that's the youth hunt. And you talk about excitement. And I was thinking about we open our ranch up to you. I mean, we don't have a small area, but oh my gosh. I mean, the grins, the smiles. I mean, last year I had a, a young kid shoot a fawn and he thought it was the biggest animal he ever seen. <laughs> you know, so um, <clears throat> even though we were trying to discourage him from that, <laughs> um, but that's really our true avenue to education and getting the word out about ethics you know i think we concentrate concentrate on getting the adults involved but the true learners the true ones that want to be educated are the youth and um, i just would like to see more concentration on, on that part of it um 454 program talked to some people you know that uh, they they weren't against it they just didn't quite understand it and i think by taking the time to explain it they felt much better after a conversation um we live in a very uh cattle producing area in the words uh privatization of wildlife will get the hair of any rancher going because they're just trying to make a living. And the elk are moving in, eating up their their uh, crops, and they're worried about, and especially drought years, how are we going to get enough feed for our cattle for the winter? They're not intentionally doing that. And so I think those words immediately drive a wedge between ranching community and the hunting community. I would like to see those words removed and, and not used because as uh, citizens of this state and as sportsmen, we should not have conversations. Do you feel privatization of wildlife is going on? It's not for the majority, maybe a small, small percentage of people, but we've got to start working with these ranchers and giving them a black eye. I'll get off my soapbox. Yeah. Thank you, Donna. Um, so in my world, um, standing in the midst of hunters and and landers, ranchers, all of the above, you know, it's been for me a little calmer. Some of the uh, same comments you've had about, while there are a lot of forums talking about help, where do I get involved? And some of that confusion, I think, is true, which is an educational reality. Um, <clears throat> that's been really the majority of comments I've had, other than one that doesn't mean too much, but I will bring it up, and that's e-bikes. Um, it is on the horizon. Um, we sell them. Um, there's confusion as to what an e-bike is. It's either a bicycle or it's a motorcycle. And in some lands, it's one and some it's the other. And so I think there's just some comments and question and what is it? How are we gonna go forward with it? Is it good or bad? I don't have any big vision on it. It's, it's just a, like all these other issues, it's an educational reality and a clarification reality. Is it lower impact than an ATV? Is it lower impact than another vehicle? Is it more impact than a horse? You know, does, the Forest Service need to see it one way and the BLM another and block management another. So I, I think at some point, if this gains traction, it could be a little more of an issue to, to address for us. Certainly not a top burner. <clears throat> As I've hunted, it's interesting. I went to last weekend, I was hunting antelope and I was hunting in a place I hadn't put in for for a while because there weren't many antelope five years ago. And there were a lot of antelope this year. It was great to see a lot of antelope there there's only one road to access the area one public road 
And so from that road, if you're lucky, you see one. Um, but once you go over a hill after you walk a mile, you see herds of antelope that have found that little sanctuary. And I think that's just the reality of hunting. You know, we hunters try to do, we tend to do the easiest, even though we will do the most <clears throat> to access. And so it creates these different issues, even there. <clears throat> we were on a place by written permission, not on block management, <clears throat> excuse me, and <clears throat> very controlled as to the number of hunters. And even within that, hunter behavior is the challenge. And it was more to Tyranny's point of, y'all know as an antelope hunter that if you spot antelope and you park out of their view, you might get a stock on them. But if you spot antelope and you stop while they're looking at you, they just went to the next county, you know? And it's, it's a hunter education, hunter ethic, hunter understanding that always is, is an interesting thing. And I'm coming primarily from the hunter. So everything we've talked about here this morning really is educational, you know, and creating an understanding. I, I appreciate Donna's comment about youth. I've said it before about my kids impacting my views on things that are important, especially when they're little. Now that they're older, I totally disagree with them. <clears throat> but, you know, we've, we've come to this point after almost a year, we have a lot of the same concerns. You know, if you think back to December when we began and started to form, um, but I will say, I think for, as we presented to the EQC, the governor, our biennial report, we have brought some things to fruition and we're gonna go over those and confirm our, our positions, just make sure we understand. And even us that have worked through these for a year, we have to remind ourselves each time the details of these situations, whether it be the 454 or the verbiage we use in these discussions. You know, originally in January, we talked to a couple of uh, sportsmen's groups about how do we engage this conversations, these conversations as partners in this effort. <clears throat> Having had those conversations with many of them, I think we've made a step in the right direction, in my opinion. I think it's the soundbite that always gets the attention of the media that is the challenge, or maybe of a particular group. And I, I appreciate that we all have looked at these things deeply. And <clears throat> I do think we have to be sort of that messenger. In our region, we have to say, this is the detail of 454. You know, this is the fruit of it. This is the challenge of it. And be clear on what the goals are, you know. I think it's hard for the average person. And in our last meeting, we had public, one public commentator who talked about <clears throat> why people don't show up at these meetings. It's open to the public. You know, we have two official representatives here in our public. You know, today's Tuesday. Everybody's working and they expect us to deal with these problems and come up with answers. And then therefore, I think we have to communicate to them pretty thoroughly on what it all means, which is a challenge for us because we're the same way. We're running ranches, we're running businesses, we're running our life. And we're also trying to recreate and enjoy the lifestyle in Montana. So to sum up my long, I appreciate the fact that you are all engaged in your regions. And I appreciate the fact of how different it is in each region. You can simply talk about water, weather, drought, or not. And we realize all the implications that change throughout the landscape of Montana. The one thing that I think that we focus on that remains constant is how we began. The fact that animals, wildlife management exist on this landscape. And our charge is to be part of helping that management through hunting and access. It's just that simple. And so when we bring our ideas together, when they follow that goal of addressing that part of wildlife management, we'll be successful. Not easy, but I still think, you know, we're doing a good job. Um, I think 
we've crawled a bit through this year. That's just my summary. I think we're walking a little more and it's not my term, but I think, you know, in the future, maybe in 23, we can run with it, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate all of you staying in touch in your regions. That, that's what this is about. And uh, formulating through those concerns, then an informed decision on how we go forward. So I appreciate it. Thank you for that. Any other last comments in that regard? So thank you. <clears throat> um, so jumping into, I think we'll we'll get right into the uh, that twice. <clears throat> The recommendations, um, let's see. We've had some discussion about going back and forth on the issues that we brought forth um, to the EQC in our biennial report. <clears throat> so we just need to review those quickly. And that's on the next page. Um, so we presented uh, in September at the UQC and then in, in written report to the governor, our, our recommendations. We're all pretty aware of them, right? And I'll just give you a rundown kind of on how, how that went. Um, so that's the page, PLPW recommendations as of August 22. Um, and kind of my interpretations of their reception. So literally everything we brought forward in a nutshell um, was generally agreed with. That's how I'd say that. The, the one exception, um, when we talked about uh, seeking income tax relief from the payments received in a program, do you remember that? that wasn't gonna go anywhere. <clears throat> and I think when we have the discussion about increasing the cap on block management payments and 100 day payments, that kind of makes it null and void in the first place because we're looking at cost of living changes and such. So that was the only one that there wasn't some sense of support for um, amongst those legislators just for, for your knowledge. Any, any questions on it? Okay. <clears throat> so they heard quite a bit about, you know, how do we coordinate habitat management with BLM, Forest Service, DNRC, to address the concern about wildlife management and how that all interacts. They heard that well. They heard the discussion about uh, more boots on the ground and more presence. There wasn't anything real negative in that regard. Um, and then they were definitely verbally in support of seeking the maximum payment cap increase. And we had a little bit of a historical discussion on that uh, where it began. And there were some questions, is how do you set the per hunter day? What's the value? Um, how do you arrive at a fair number? You know? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. They were in support of our recommendation um, that we seek one like tag for one like tag permit as our recommendation put forth. So that was received well, understanding that legislation would be required to do that. Um, I think they were impressed kind of with the success, the pallet agreements and the 454s. Um, 
and I on the one side of back on the 454, <clears throat> they were uh, maybe appreciative of part of the solution of uh, the the public concern about that equity in that in that type of tag being equal. I forgot to mention that. <clears throat> um, yes, Lee. Uh, question on the Going back a ways, it says continue to move public land out of BMA boundaries. I didn't, I'm uncertain about that as a BMA. They don't, they're not in the boundaries, really. They just show the deeded land up in our country where there's so much federal and state. They just show that they designate the BMA areas, you know, like you got a checkerboard of different chunks of it, or a homestead here and then five miles over another one. I, I'm confused about that one. Dale could address that. We, it really didn't become a point uh, in that discussion. Um, you know, some, so it's an, in the numbers, um, when you look at block management, they've been included together, but they are also noted separately. So it really didn't become an issue within that body. There's no credit to the landowner for the, for the hunting on public stuff. The, the sign-in boxes are all on deeded land. And Correct. Only the through Pal is the only one that, that where the landowner gets credit for. Jason might have a comment about that. <clears throat> Good morning, members. Uh, Jason Cool, Hunting Access Manager for FWP. So, in regards to block management and BMA public land specifically, <clears throat> a landowner would be compensated for the impacts to the entire block management area, and a lot of our block management areas do include public land inside the boundary. So if you could think about the bigger the BMA, the more likely somebody to hunt there, the more impacts, more sign-ins at the sign-in box, that landowner would be compensated for. We're, we're, we've been working on trying to get public land out of the boundaries of BMAs specifically for that reason. But then also just historically, it included the entire ranch to say, you know, you can hunt my property. You can also hunt all this public land that we lease. And so historically with black and white maps, we'd just draw a big polygon around a big circle and you can hunt everywhere in that circle. Well, that worked great until color came out. And then now we've got a lot of public land inside the boundary of BMAs. Yeah, you know, we've got several of them. And there's no, it just designates the deed of this being where you can hunt when you sign the box. And the rules apply for state by the state, got to have their license and the BLM. You know, so I, I wasn't aware that or ours aren't that way. I guess that's my ignorance. Mr. Chairman, uh, just as a follow-up, so PLPW did discuss this at your May meeting in Billings, and the sense from the group was that you agreed with the department's position of moving toward getting those public yeah, lands like out of the boundaries. Way. Yeah, we're, we're working toward that. There's some work to do. Yeah, Region 6 has done a really good job of trying to get that out of there. So Northeast Montana, it's we've done a lot, a lot of work to get the public land out of the boundaries of the BMAs. But um, we're still working on it in other places of the state. Dale? Regarding that issue, I find it a little bit inaccurate to claim that there's X number of acres of inaccessible public land that are made available when you have a county road or whatever that are going through them. But at the same time, when I look at the public land areas or the block management areas in Southeast Montana uh, that contain a bunch of BLM and you start carving out the, the public land that's part of a ranch boundary, I find it confusing then for an entity to be able to understand, okay, there's a two track trail. Do I get to take this two track trail across here? So I, I can certainly see the the point of the block management coordinators of having it in there, it just seems to me that it's it's a little bit inaccurate to say that we have all these acres of public land that we've gained access to when a lot of them, the, the access is already there. But again, I think it could also be confusing and especially where you truly have a scattered land pattern like we do in a lot of uh, mm -hmm. Southeast Montana. Thank you. Still. <clears throat> Paul. Yeah, I think Dale's probably referring to Cherry Creek up there in Mile City, which is the largest block management area in the state, I believe. <clears throat> it's, it, 
it contains probably well over half of its public ground, but I don't see how you'd ever be able to break it out really and, and exclude it. There is access to a lot of it. Now, Page Whittem is the same way. I mean, up there by uh, on the breaks, there's a ton of, of public ground I, and they even got sign in blocks on the BLM. So, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know how you'd ever break it out of there. I mean, it's just, it's, it's already accessible, but how do you, uh, how would you break it out? Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> just a feedback, Dale, too. We, we did an analysis in 2021 with Onyx maps to do that exact uh, analysis of how many acres are truly inaccessible that are open through block. And there was 618,000 acres of inaccessible, legally inaccessible public lands are open through block every fall. So on our, on our total acreage counts, it's about 1.1 million because of the acres that are inside the boundaries and whatnot on the public land side. But then yeah, it's, it's truly 618,000 in 2021 were inaccessible, illegally inaccessible that were made accessible because of the, the, the polygon that would allow you to access the public land. So, so what's really the greatest question in here? <clears throat> To me, I think when I would review the programs and I would look at Pala and I would look at block <clears throat> management and say, okay, in Pala, we opened up X number of acres of public land of which a lot of those acres were already opened up in, in through block management and some of them weren't opened up at all. I mean, they, again, they were legally accessible anyway. It just seems to me we were creating somewhat of a, inaccurate information and maybe a a false understanding by the public of all the acres that we had in fact opened up um, i'm not sure those i, I think the number and, and you alluded to it in in your work with onyx so all those acres were not open but at the same time if we are if we are wanting to simplify things for the public hunters and uh, For the ease of administration for our block management coordinators, we probably need to include the ranch units. Now, if you look at block, the Cherry Creek block management area and a lot of the other BMA areas that, uh, that I'm familiar with in southeastern Montana, at least historically, there's been a line item in there, inaccessible or accessible public lands do not require permission. I mean, it states that on there. So. That information is out there. I'm just not sure how well the public understands that. And there's no question. There's people that sign up for public land, they net or sign up for block management. They never get off of the public land because they really they're not well marked in a lot of cases. They go in, they they're tired after they've hunted the two sections of public land. They've shot their deer in and open, and but they've signed up for block management anyway. And the and the individual cooperator certainly receives payment for those hunter days. Lee? Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to, what, what I, the way I looked at the PALA, which is relatively recent, the, it looked to me like it was an option for the people that had been, like in the case of Whitman <coughs> Grazing Association, where they'd been, they'd been members in good, you know, it's a group, cooperative group of people that 40, 40 ranchers own that ranch. And they put up with all the hype about that breaks elk and all that stuff and in the the pala program they they didn't really open up any they were letting everybody go through there anyway but it, it prevented them from stopping it that that was the way i looked at the pala thing it wasn't a it wasn't a double dipper they, they'd been they were always hit the limit on their bma deal and and they'd been putting up with a lot of it you know, people go out there when there was a, when you when the brakes bow tags. You know, you could get anybody could go buy one. So it was just it was like a prairie dog town out there with hunters, and and it looked to me like I thought the benefit of the pala was that yeah. it it allowed people to leave it in there and still receive some remuneration for the for what they'd been given away basically for all these years. Nobody's going to get rich off a BMA deal, <clears throat> and and with the pala deal, it allowed them to to pay an employee. <clears throat> You know, because every one of those roads goes right through somebody's yard and goes through the, the only way to get there on those points on the lake is to drive through and the roads all went to a homestead and that's the only way to get there. And I just looked at it as a way that 
they could be compensated for something that they've been doing and maybe they just say to hell with it. We're not doing this anymore. We'll just withdraw. If you can take your $15,000 and give it to somebody else and we'll just say no. And that was the way I looked at it. Thanks. Absolutely. <clears throat> Further comment? Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> when Pala was created in regards to that enumeration, you know, it essentially answered that question in my mind that that cooperator could access both programs. Very simply, that's not our decision. The decision is made. And so, you know, if they qualify, they qualify. And I, I think in the beginning, we thought we had concern that it would reduce block, but I think, and I don't know if it's a fact, but it appears that it's increased some block. So, you know, maybe just by coincidence, uh, it's been an effective way to, as you mentioned, Lee, assist in that, in that way for those who have been cooperating for many years. So, Paul. Can we talk about the in support increase and maximum payment cap? Did, is that on the topic right now? Sure. Um, well, we know. will come back to it <clears throat> at another point too with some analysis from the department. All right. Is that good? Yeah, I didn't know if we. <clears throat> we I guess we supported it, but I didn't know how we were. It was going to break out or how we were going to increase it. So we'll have some statistical information, some financial okay, information to review at around 945. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so we good there, Dale? Just on the block management, we on your notes, it says support the increase in the maximum payment cap. But didn't we all, isn't we also make a recommendation to increase the fee paid on a daily basis as well yes and i'm just wondering why that's not reflected on our recommendations it is it's in the official report so this 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 page is kind of a recap of this it's in here yeah you bet good question and we will look at again at 945 at that component of the cap and the numbers so we'll have a better clear picture on that Anything else there? Okay. Um, let's see. Any questions under that elk hunting access agreement portion? Ten percent. We were all in agreement there. Um, as the total allowance, and on the palace. Um, Again, it was just a matter of a re administrative change where we recommend changing from two miles to one mile, um, allowing for smaller distances between those points of access. So we put that forward. Um, the other part there is looking at the process um, for the PALA reviews on our part. And I think we're going to hit that again with you, Jason, a little bit later. Is that correct? Yeah. And on the legislative end of Pala, um, looking at the uh, access managers and supervisors making that sign off um, rather than our complete review. <clears throat> And then also removal of the $5 application fee. So again, that was all given a nod in that venue with the EQC. Mr. Chairman, just a quick, and it's probably in the full report, but when, as far as the rejection, was that in the discussion where we talked about um, the regional uh, on point three of the PL, of the PALA, the department can reject applications. Was, there, was that in some of the discussion where we we're talking about their ability to to look at all the information and if, if say it was overgrazed or things like that, it gave them that opportunity to kind of 
review that without it make it more streamlined, but allow them that expertise and ability to do that. But that's in there. Okay. So within the PALA scoring and and format that's already set up, if the criteria didn't meet, it was a done deal. Yeah. <clears throat> um, unlocking public lands. I mean, that if you recall, that sunsets. And I, I don't remember the number of participants. Four, seven, I don't remember. Um, so the access program, all access program, one application period, one access menu. We will have further discussion about that. Um, it is what we put forward. It involves the department, again, as a recollection. It requires the department to figure out how to do that and how that will all work. Um, one point that has come up is, <clears throat> are we good with, in that recommendation, um, one application, one menu, but do those dates have to be all lined up? So we'll hear about that more later and how that complicates the picture. Okay, that's not something we talked about. We looked at the one menu option for that cooperator to be able to look at the whole uh, plate of what's available. It may be that application dates and such uh, have to vary. So we'll hear about that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So then, <clears throat> Um, within those changes, some of the language, uh, for example, in the PALA agreements, or excuse me, in the 454s, are on the next page. <clears throat> so I know that uh, if you jump down to the middle of the page under B, on the first sec, well, it's underlined and then yellow highlight. So that was the language change. At least one of the public hunters must hold the equivalent license permit or combination of thereof as the license permit or combination issued to the landowner or the landowner's designee. So that was that's our language change. And what that's getting at is that that permit so the first public hunter would be the like permit and mr chairman i'm sorry i'm realizing as i look at the printed version when it got printed it looks like some of the changes were accepted um and so the the one on the screen is going to be the better one to watch for your your discussion on this and review today because it's showing for instance in that first subsection the underlined red language but in the printed version it it got accepted and so you can't see that the change was proposed there. So I think for this portion of the discussion, if you look at the screen, that'll give you the better view of what the proposed changes are. You want to run us through it then? Sure. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, so in, in the first subsection, you had already signed off on that, just that um, adding language that the designee may be an immediate family member or authorized full-time employee of the landowner who's eligible for licensure under Title 87, Chapter 2 in general, just making sure that there's someone who's actually able to hold a license. And then the language that the chairman just reviewed under 3B, the highlighted sentence at the end is the addition um, coming off your August meeting where you um, supported the department's proposal that the public hunter be selected by the department um, for that like tag. Um, scrolling down um, that last section, uh, subsection eight was to add definitions um, to put some meat on the bones of who is an immediate family member and employee. Um, and Jason had worked with the program managers around the state to consider that. And let's see, Jason, remind me that matches the block um, definition. Is that right? Correct. Hope that that um, highlighted blue section matches the definition in, in the block management statute, which you'll cover actually next. Next. Yeah. Um, but the rest of those um, definitions there for immediate family member and employee, that language comes out of the block statute to be consistent. 
you ready for us to roll to the next section, Mr. Chair? Do you want to stop here for a Cindy, minute? did you have a question in that regard as, as to full time? I did. I, I was curious as to what, when we first developed this thing, we had quite a discussion because we didn't want <clears throat> Joe Smuckatelli to this to be able to get it. Anyway, um, so what is the definition of full time? Well, um, Mr. Chair and, and Cindy, I think that's where we landed was that simply striking that year round reference helps. Um, and then relying on whatever the landowner's definition of full time is, um, as as opposed to the department laying out specifically what that is. You talked at your last meeting, for instance, about somebody who might work nine months, but to the landowner, that's full time, or someone who works X many days of the week, and to the landowner, that's full time, leaving it to the landowner's discretion. So what we're saying is, okay, if they only work a week out of the whole year, if the landowner considers that full time, then that applies. Mr. Chairman, uh, Cindy, if you're if you're having someone on your on your payroll <laughs> by state law, they they are either defined as part time or full time. So if someone really wanted to get into the nuts and bolts of it, they could probably look at that and go off payroll. If there was some ever. <laughs> someone made it a giant deal, they could find out whether they're full-time or part-time because you have to clarify when you file a W-2 um, how they are. And so uh, whether it's an intern, they are seasonal, whatever, there's ways to find out. And someone would have to, I mean, if they said that they were here for three months and called full-time, they'd have record of that. Well, one of the reasons I'm asking this question is because we, we really worked on this to begin with. And this is the contentious 454 area that everybody's looking at. So uh, the full-time definition um, is a concern. If I could, Mr. I, I guess, and it's probably not to try to open this up because we've got it kind of going, but I mean, I guess if, if that's the issue that, I mean, we're already struggling through a program that is not seeing super great response as it is and so full-time you know if, if that is what we're kind of getting hung, hung up on and who that full-time employee is I mean ranchers have people that come and work from but I'm sure the feeling out there is that well my rancher friend that comes and fences for a week is some big hunter from so and so and that's the that's the big crux of it I, I think I mean we're kind of I mean we're already in an area where we're <laughs> we're kind of breaking new ground because I mean a lot a lot of the landers in my are still not not happy at all with the whole program and as far as landowners. I mean, the, the, the one to three is already, I mean, people, they, they just, they're not even signing up for it, at least as landowners. So I'm not to bring this whole thing in because we're trying to move forward with something that's a start and it's maybe going to take a few years to get there. But I mean, I, I think the way it's put in there now is the full time. And if someone's really going to hammer that down, I mean, I guess that's their prerogative to go through with that. I think it's this confusion, all that. If someone went and they, they fought it, they go, they look at if they have to basically go to an attorney and then they have to pull up work, you know, payroll records to find out whether the person's full time or not. I guess that's their prerogative to do that. I mean, I think we're, the objective is to try to move forward because I, I think that that it, it's, it's not <clears throat> full time to me seems specific enough. And if someone's going, I don't know how else to word it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Thanks, Rich. Uh, question for Jason in that regard in conjunction with Block. So that's the effort is to have the language the same uh, for consistency. I mean, does the department look at that full-time requirement in that application at the point of application? Uh, Mr. Chair, no, we, we just typically leave that to the landowner. I mean, if we're not checking 1099s or W-2s or, I mean, we just, we're not getting to that level of detail. Um, one thing I'd add on the 454 program is that this new language we're adding under the employee section here in 8 sub B is just providing definition. The, the legislature, when the bill was drafted or created the last time in subsection one, it's the last sentence. Um, it says that a designee may be an immediate family member or an authorized full-time employee already. So it's already, already requiring it to be a full-time employee. What we're doing here is just adding some definition to what that employee means. Um, and that and that's consistent again with with block 
in the most in in most situation there's there's some language we can talk about year round in the next section but um the legislature for 454 is already in this 87 to 513 saw it fit to put in that full-time employee already we're not we're not adding to it thank you dale question for jason <clears throat> As a part of the 454 program, I know that you've beefed up the reporting requirements. As a part of the reporting requirements, does the landowner have to report the actual names of the hunters that were allowed access? And if so, I guess my question is, if, if the public felt that they're pulling a quick one and here's a guy that's not working hardly at all, but he's being given a permit. It seems to me that there are people that are watching and would figure that out in a hurry. And, uh, and that certainly would come back to the attention of the department. Uh, Dale. Yeah. So with our uh, 454 agreements this year, the landowners in most cases pick their one hunter and then the department picked two hunters. So we know who all three of those hunters are for sure, because our licensing unit has been directly in contact with the public hunters, whether the landowner selected or department selected. We've been working between the landowners and those individuals to make sure everybody's coordinated for access this general rifle season. The additional public hunters, we did send out basically a, a roster sheet, similar to a block management roster sign in where it's capturing contact information so that it, the hope is at a later point when after the season's over, we can go survey all of those individuals as well. But we're first and foremost concerned about those three public hunters that we have the direct uh, contact information for. Um, as soon as we get the surveys back. So the surveys were sent out two weeks ago to the landowners as well as their signed copy of their agreement and um, just reminding them, here's, here's what you have to do as a landowner. We need you to fill out this survey on your piece. We also need the public, the two public hunters to have their feedback as well. And so we'll take that and summarize that for the next year's commission approval process. Lee. Mr. Chairman, uh, and Jason, I, I reached before I came to this meeting, I reached out to long time 454. I think they were the second ones, the Lee family reached to Judith Gap. And I asked Bob, he called Kenny and Kenny said, I think I'm dropping out next year. He said, they've changed the reporting requirements to where I don't have time to mess with it. And I don't, I don't, I, it's the question that, so this is the other side of it. That's all I'm telling you for it because you, we can make it so we're so busy taking care of people that don't have a dog in the fight that we, you know, if somebody thinks they got, they got shortchanged on application for a hunt license and that they're not providing the habitat, they don't have any elk. And so we're, so we're, we're over, I think we got to kind of balance what we're doing. You know, the idea is to, is to allow for public hunting, but you shouldn't shouldn't be like figuring out your 4-H record book when you get done at the end of the year. You, you, you're trying to run a ranch and take care of everything else you're doing, and then you got to do the fish and games, all the stuff. Well, now did that guy come? <laughs> Bob said, Kenny called, call, call, Kenny said, a guy called him up, one of the, the fish and games designated hunters said, I'll be down Thursday to get my elk. You know, and so I think we got to kind of balance what we're doing here and not not get to the point. No, no most 98% of us don't cheat. And, and we get down in the weeds about all the who did what and who shot John and all that stuff. And we're missing the point. Thanks. Thanks Lee. And just, just a reminder, I mean, this is, this is language. We've already made a, a directive, a recommendation, and this is just cleaning up the language, this part on full time. And it can, it creates a consistent uh, application throughout block management and other programs. Drew? Thanks. Uh, just again, to maybe uh, talk about that. Most people are in it for the right reasons. We have <clears throat> local landowners, generational landowners that want to reward maybe one of their employees. Again, the optics of it though, and again, to be concerned, and I know we've agreed on it, and, and this is something to continue to, to stay on top of is if ex-senator's son wants to hunt and all of a sudden becomes a full-time employee of whatever ranch, that's the type of stuff that that uh, can, can cause a lot of grievance, right? And, and so that, that stuff can be shuffled and done on paper. And that's the type of stuff <clears throat> where 
a few bad apples can really stir the pot. And, and we have that obligation to make sure that we're, we're at least talking about it and addressing it and knowing that it can happen um, because, because it can and it will, especially as we see more and more landowners in the state that are not residents of the state or are, I mean, yeah, we, we just know that, that a lot of new, new landowners aren't from here and don't share those values. Wait. But if, unless I'm confused, this is the landowner tag that we're talking <laughs> about, right? So the guy, the yes. guy has the option to keep this one himself, or he can designate somebody. Correct. He also has the opportunity to, if he wants to enable a, <laughs> the lieutenant governor's nephew, <laughs> he can, he can, um, he can pick. He's got another pick. So what, what we're talking about in this case is the designated tag that mm -hmm. the landowner gets, so he can, he, he can keep it himself, or he has a right to share it, and. So I, I don't understand what the problem is. If there's a, if he wants to enable somebody else, he's got another opportunity to do that, doesn't he? I think it comes back to the point of, of is this an equitable program and is there enough give and take on both sides, right? So that's what we're, we're trying to balance. We're trying to balance uh, uh, something that's good for the landowner and also good for the for the public sportsman. And if we start to see those those types of things happen, is that truly equitable or is somebody doing something mm -hmm. with wildlife? To maybe curry favor down the road some other way. So just a sec. I appreciate the robust discussion of this particular piece, but <clears throat> as we'll hear in the hunter education uh, line later, um, ethic is hard to legislate. I would just make that point. And we're, I think, we're making this as clear as can be uh, to Rich's point about being an employer and filing a W 2. And the hassle required with reporting on employees it's it's if somebody wants to take it there it's black and white if somebody wants to take it there calling it into question it's there as an employer mr, mr. chair if i may say too just in when we talk of equitable i think the thing <clears throat> to, to just keep in mind is this and i'm glad we're going forward but i i think when i think about it when when we've given one uh one tag to the landowner and he's giving up he or she is giving up three. And I think the of the value of those three tags, of the animals that can be harvested with those three <clears> tags, you can probably all in your minds think of what potentially that do dollar value might be. So for a person doing that and what they're in terms of equity and all of that, I really think it's more than fair. And so moving forward with, with this and where we are now and, and getting caught up on full time, I. I think the value of a, of a landowner giving it to his employee, in all honesty, whether it's full time or not, is is really fair to them to to let them choose who that is um, at this time. And maybe <clears throat> things will go as we go in the future. But just to keep in mind, thank you. Thank you, Rich. I'm Good. sorry I brought it up, <laughs> <laughs> but but I I really wanted to know if there was a legal definition. That really was the bottom line. There is, <laughs> there is. So, all right. Uh, was there more in that that we need to <laughs> pop back up there? Mr. Chairman, sorry, I just need to find my share screen button again. Apologies. And there we go. So the next piece rolling down was, uh, is the statute related to block management with those definitions and also seeking for standardization to strike year round there as well in that definition? Anyone care to bring it up again? <laughs> Just checking. Uh, also then, um, moving into the palace statute 87.1.295, uh, um, in subsection two, this is that discretion where the department could reject with this legislative language change, could reject an application that doesn't meet standards. Uh, Rich had given some examples, you know, if it's overgrazed, for instance, or something like that, changing it from shall to may uh, gives us that flexibility. Also stricken in this uh, is subsection six, where that silly $5 application fee has been living. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was an editorial comment. Um, <laughs> we 
we have all continued to agree that that should be stricken. And so that's where you see that happen in the striking of subsection six. Jason just did a fist pump. Um, in any case, uh, the other piece that you have discussed here is section three, or pardon me, subsection three, the PLPW role uh, in the review process. And that is on um, just a revisiting of that conversation is on the agenda for later today. So I won't belabor that here, but this is what has made it into this section so far, Mr. Chairman. Any discussion or comment? We're good. Thank you. So I believe that gets us to <clears throat> possibly Lena. Do y'all need a break? Quick break. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah. Like 10 minutes, please. Thank you.
All right, we're actually going to get back on track here with the uh, bull cow ratio uh, survey survey information. Well, because you went cross-eyed, Drew, Brian Wakeling will join us from the department uh, to go over that information for us. So, I see Brian up there. Welcome, Brian. Good morning. Thank you. <clears throat> so if you'd like to just jump right in there, we'll get after it. Okay. Um, so uh, what I'll try to do is just provide a real uh, brief overview of the data that uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks collects. Um, the uh, and how we use that to kind of adjust and uh, address those various aspects during our season setting process. Um, we, uh, we have an existing elk management plan uh, that you're probably aware that we're in the process of revising and trying to update. Um, but because we have not updated it at this point in time, we're still relying primarily on the objectives that are set within the existing uh, 2005 plan. Uh, that uh, plan provides um, objectives for uh, population levels. Um, the population levels are monitored primarily through aerial survey. Uh, there are some places where we don't have access to uh, elk during the period of time, which is routinely in uh, late winter when we're conducting those surveys. Um, and so uh, they're, they may be obscured, uh, they may be difficult to see. And so in those, some of those places we rely on ground surveys, uh, some places just not practical and we rely on other things such as harvest uh, to indicate how those populations are, uh, are faring. We, uh, we look at that on an annual basis, uh, despite the fact that the, uh, the commission sets the season on a biennial basis. They also give us some flexibility uh, with the approved quota ranges. Um, and, uh, and so if a particular uh, hunting district or elk management area has a uh, health management unit has a, uh, is regulated by permit or license numbers with a quota there, we do have the ability to adjust those. Um, we also have the ability to go to the commission in off season, um, off year, and request an adjustment to a season structure if necessary. Um, that doesn't happen uh, particularly frequently, um, and uh, but but it does on some occasions occur. Um, in addition to the population objectives that actually refer to numbers that are observed, and the numbers observed is not a, an estimated number. It's not a model number. It's not a number that uh, we use an algorithm to correct for citability. It's actual numbers observed. Um, in addition to that, we also in some units have uh, bull to cow ratios uh, that we look to manage towards as well. Those uh, objectives are uh, also within the plan, um, but they're based off of our midwinter surveys. And those midwinter surveys um, are not um, it's an optimal time to be seeing elk, but it's not an optimal time to be observing bulls. Um, uh, the reason being at that time of year, uh, the, uh, the best time to get the best objective measures of bull to cow ratios would be during the rut, um, how it, which occurs in uh, late September, early October. Uh, we re routinely do not uh, survey there at that time of year because um, at that point in time of the year, it's difficult to observe the animals. Um, and despite we, the fact that we get better ratio data, uh, we don't get as good an estimate of the number of animals that are truly on the landscape. Um, consequently, when they're in the midwinter herds, um, they're segregated. Uh, oftentimes the males are by themselves, females uh, with calves. And uh, uh, so it's, basically a minimum count of bulls at that time in, of year. Uh, some, some of our objectives are based upon uh, just a minimum number of bulls that we might observe um, and uh, things of that nature. Uh, so that's a kind of a real 
snapshot overview. Um, not a lot of times you get uh, people compare Montana to other states. Uh, other states do not always survey at the same time of year uh, that Montana does. And so uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, you get uh, people referencing, you know, higher bull to cow ratios in some other states. And um, it's not a, a directly comparable uh, bit of data. Questions? Paul? Oh, I'm just curious. I was looking at some of the numbers of areas that I hunt, and I noticed the cow, bull to cow ratio goes from 28 bull to 100 cows up to 60 the next year. It just seemed like, is that is that due to just the visibility of the elk at the time you survey? Um, very good question and a very good uh, um, uh, kind of deduction, I guess, if you will. Um, there's a lot of things that influence um, that variability. Obviously, um, the number of animals that harvested influence it. Um, but, you know, the time, just how the severity of the winter, um, you know, sometimes just the vagaries of, of our sampling design uh, as we're, we're flying an area. Um, but what we try to look at is trend over time and uh, correlate that with, uh, um, you know, weather conditions and things of that nature. And yeah, absolutely correct. Um, there's a lot of things that can factor into that. And, uh, and that's consequently why we try to look at um, kind of more of a long-term projection than just any single year data point. Other questions? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Brian uh, Rich Roth um, from Big Sandy. Just looking at, at the different regions that the, that the elk numbers are, are, are captured in and things like that, do you have a sense of, uh, as far as region goes, which is the top of the, of the seven regions or so that are here? What is the best region that you, do you have? A, do you have a top five uh, of best regions as far as how, how the correlations are going? Um, so it, it, as far, I'm not, I'm not certain I understand the question well, entirely, Rich. I, I'm sorry. So if I look at the Salish on the first few rows and look at the uh, calf ratio, the bull ratio in that say region and compare it to my region in the bear paws, which of the two looks better to you? So, um, that, that's a, a real, uh, complex, uh, question. You know, a lot of it, uh, when I look at how things, you know, um, how things are performing, there's a number of, of kind of factors that kind of fit into that. Um, virtually any of our, when you look at bull to cow ratios, for instance, um, you can look at units that are, you know, sometimes single digit bull to cow ratios at this time of year. Or you can look at units that have extremely high bull to cow ratios that may exceed 60. Um, from a biological standpoint, um, the bull to cow ratio has relatively little to do with the, um, the overall biological performance of that herd. Um, the, uh, the, some pretty um, definitive research that was conducted out of Colorado that looked at uh, wide ranging both bull to cow and, and buck to doe ratios on deer. And that wide range has relatively little to do with uh, the reproductive rate and recruitment uh, that plays into it. When I look at things like calf recruitment, um, you know, when we wind up with especially a late winter um, calf to calf to cow ratio that exceeds, you know, 35, uh, that population is probably stable to increasing. Um, now, um, it's important to also, there's, there's some of the vagaries about our survey data. Um, at times, we've got an awful lot of num a large number of unclassified animals uh, that we have to look at, um, you know, just part of the overall count. But sometimes the, the large number can be a little bit uh, overwhelming as, uh, in trying to classify those while you're in the air. So there's a lot of things that we do to try to um, capture that. Uh, photography, for instance, and things of that nature. And sometimes we have to correct after the fact. 
Um, but I'm kind of digressing a little bit, but um, when I see um, a population that's that has recruitment that exceeds 35, especially starts to push much higher than that, um, that population is, is probably stable to growing. And so I look at that as a favorable thing, unless, of course, um, that population is above the objective that we're hoping to manage towards. And at that point, uh, we have to look at, um, you know, are, are we meeting our management objectives? And that leads us to perhaps some more aggressive um, harvest strategies. Right. No, th thank you. Thank you, Brian. I th I, that's what I, I, I thought that to be the case. And I was actually as a cow, as a cow producer, when I look at the calf numbers over there, if I was uh, in the Salish area, for example, if I had a 26% calf crop on my ranch for very long, I would not be in business very long. So uh, I understand, but I do also understand that wildlife is different than, you know, than cows I do. But as I talk to my biologist, you know, we're shooting for that range of 45 to 55% in our calf and about 65% in our bulls um, and to, to manage uh, our area uh, with, our, with our personal uh, wildlife biologist that works uh, with us. So I was curious to hear the uh, comparison between the two. And it looks like that would be a way to look at these different regions and see where we have problems and where we uh, can make changes uh, based on this data. So thank you. Other questions? So in general, Brian, I, I just have a question in regards to this council. <clears throat> and when you look at elk management, the current plan going forward with the new, potentially new plan, what can you give us guidance wise or any insight in regards to our charge of helping access and stabilizing relationships amongst the private public side of the equation in elk management. Do you have any particular insight for this council? You know, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I think what you're asking is really the $64,000 question. Um, it's the, the biggest challenge, um, I believe, that we have uh, towards meeting our management objectives is access to the animals um, during the hunting season. And um, it's you know it, it you know just the whole the whole challenge between trying to get access um, um, we we constantly looking at ways that we can and the trade offs um, you know we hear frequently that if we were to uh, reduce hunting pressure. Uh, that we will see an increase in, in harvest rate by our hunters. And I believe that to be true. However, the harvest rate will not be great enough um, to keep the harvest at the level at which, you know, we're actually looking at, um, at total numbers. And when we're trying to look at harvesting at a level to which we can man maintain a, a particular population size, regardless of what that size is that we pick. Um, and so trying to, um, trying to facilitate that access, I think is the, is the real key to being able to uh, meet the management objectives regardless of where they're set. And uh, I, I'm afraid I really don't have any uh, particularly genius insight to be able to to assist the committee. I mean, that's fair. It's not a simple question by any means. <clears throat> um, you know, I've often, when we look at the regions and these numbers, you know, the question comes into the, eff the efficacy of moving animals, <clears throat> transferring, transplanting, et cetera. Um, can you talk about how you would view that in light of certain specific problems um, <clears throat> with great disparities, whether they be excess or lack of elk on the ground? That's a great question. And it's one we, we hear rather often. Um, and it's, it sounds like a simple solution. Um, however, 
it comes with some really substantive challenges. Um, the primary um, primary thing that it addresses, of course, is that you are able to, if you're able to go in and capture animals, um, you know, routinely the way we would uh, pursue um, kind of a large scale capture when uh, uh, relocations have occurred to certain places, there's usually involves a helicopter, uh, usually involves um, either a drive net or a net gun from the air. Uh, net guns are slower, drive nets are, can be faster. Um, and you can, um, you know, realize a, a pretty substantial reduction in the population. Um, but it's, you know, when I say substantial, um, you know, you, you're talking possibly a couple hundred. And in a lot of instances, uh, in the places where we're over objective, um, you know, that's, that's really not a substantial number. But you can uh, remove animals in that fashion. Uh, when you do that, however, you've got to have some place to put them. And when you think about where you're going to put them, um, there's a lot of places uh, where we could think about new, new areas, trying to move them into areas. And it's in, essentially what we're doing is transferring a problem from one location to another. Um, they may not be, uh, that may not be the, the primary solution. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have with that concept is the risk of, of transferring disease. And, you know, the two primary ones that come to mind uh, are chronic wasting disease and uh, brucellosis. Uh, certainly um, uh, tuberculosis as well. Um, so there's not a really good, fast, quick way in most instances to identify uh, most of those diseases. Um, this chronic wasting disease is, is a, a huge one and, and trying to relocate animals, you just introduce huge, huge problems on that front, huge risks. Um, the other thing that uh, you also have to consider is um, if you are able to eliminate animals at a, a source uh, situation, uh, what will keep that source population uh, from returning to that same level? Um, and so, you know, there, to me, um, there's a lot of, a lot of, you know, trying to catch them and remove them is one of the things that jumps to people's mind a lot of, in a lot of cases. But to me, there's, there's just substantial challenges with implementation that would actually, um, you know, make that functional. Can you actually catch enough to make the difference? Um, you're going to have to do the capture on a place that's probably going to involve private lands, might result in some damage to, uh, to some of the, uh, certainly fences or uh, in the process of trying to do the capture. Um, are you truly going to have a location that you can release those? Um, if, you know, there's a lot of people say, well, we've got other places where we're under under um, under objective, we could give that a shot in the arm. Uh, usually that doesn't solve the, the problems with why it's under objective. There's other, usually again, habitat related issues that's keeping a population limited. It could be a predator related issue. Um, but in either of those cases, putting more there doesn't necessarily solve the problem that they're dealing with. You've got the risk of disease transmission and uh, um, it's just a, it, it's not as simple as it would appear on the, on the surface. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments? Well, we appreciate uh, a look at this data and uh, yeah. And it's a lot to consider in every aspect of this question. And uh, definitely a puzzle for the state of Montana uh, to get a handle around and be able to manage at the best level possible with all the, the interests and concerns that uh, present itself in that question. I imagine you're really looking forward to uh, some conclusion on what, what next is in, in this discussion of the elk management plan and how to go forward. Yeah, yeah, certainly so. Um, and if it's uh, any consolation to the uh, committee, 
you know, I've had the opportunity to, this is Montana is the third state I've had the opportunity to work for. And um, every state that has elk uh, wrestles with these kind of challenges, regardless of how much private land they actually have. Um, elk are, are challenging to manage. And uh, um, they're, so far I haven't seen any silver bullets, but um, it, we're always, always eager to hear the next you know, there's a lot of good ideas out there and they all help. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time and, and work. We appreciate it. Thank Mr. you. Chairman. I asked Brian if he might be able to give a brief update on the elk management plan timeline for the public process. And Brian said he'd uh, take a stab at it for us if he's up for that still. You bet. Hope, um, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, currently, um, we just like uh, three days ago, our uh, public comment uh, period ended where we were been taking, uh, we've been doing an awful lot of, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 45, 46 uh, public meetings uh, that we've been encouraging people to attend, trying to, uh, and what we've been looking at uh, predominantly are those objectives. Uh, what, what should we be managing towards? And so there's going to be a period of time where we're trying to work with the regions, trying to digest all the input that we've received and trying to formulate our uh, next set of, of objectives. Uh, part of that uh, will entail um, tailoring uh, the strategies that we hope to use in order to obtain or attain those objectives that are being set. So uh, there will be a period of time where we'll be uh, drafting the plan and uh, doing some internal work, internal reviews, uh, calibrating the overall process. Um, ultimately, when we get finished with that, um, we'll need to incorporate a, uh, a review through the uh, Montana Environmental Policy Act, um, referred to in MEPA. Um, you guys are all probably very familiar with that, um, but I, I wanted to spell it out because a lot of times, um, people that are unfamiliar with it may confuse NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, with MEPA. And uh, um, they're slightly different, but uh, um, this plan will not go through a National Environmental Policy Act review, but it will need to go through a Montana Environmental Policy Act review. The implementation certainly goes through any Section 7 consultation associated with the National Environmental Policy Act, but it's a state action. Um, so... Our um, objective is to try and get a draft completed, um, hopefully by early spring. And at that point, uh, either through uh, the MEPA process or independent of that, there will be a, uh, a draft available that will then uh, involve additional public review and comment. And that's coming out when, Brian? Um, I don't have an exact date, but I'm hoping that, uh, that, you know, through the whole internal review process and everything, we're looking at early spring, late winter or early spring. Okay, thank you. And I trust you've had a robust uh, amount of comment. When you look across the board, we've had a lot of comments. Um, we've looked for a lot of comments specifically on, on a unit by unit uh, hunting district basis. Um, some districts have had a substantial amount of comment. Others have, have not had the same degree of, of comment that we had hoped for. Uh, so it, it's been a, uh, a little bit of a, a wide uh, array of, of feedback that we've received to date. All right, Everett. Uh, Brian, just as a suggestion, I'm looking at the web page now for the elk management plan, and it would be really helpful to have benchmarks or ETAs or next steps on that page if possible. Uh, all I see right now is that we're looking to have it done by 2023, but even in saying something to the effect of, you know, spring of 23, we, ha we plan to have this proposal summer of 23, we plan to be able to put it out for comment or whatever, submit to MEPA, that kind of thing. So uh, I and, think people are really looking for a, a timeline on this, seeing how we're almost three years into the new EMP and uh, or maybe two, end of 2020, I guess. So um, 
I, I know we're we're all very keyed in on on being a part those that want to be at this point but we just don't know when when the department plans to take those next steps so if we could see that i think it'd be really helpful that's great feedback i appreciate that uh we will um we'll try to get uh, some of our dates and timelines um, a little bit better formulated over the next couple of weeks uh to uh as we especially as we start working through the revisions and we'll try to get that out. It is our intent to use this new plan um, to guide our season setting process uh, for elk for the next biennium. So, um, but I appreciate that feedback and I think that's a, that's a great recommendation. Additional comments? All right, thanks again, Brian. Very very good information and uh, we appreciate your work. Thank you so much. Simple complexities, huh? Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, so on the EHA landowner preference, uh, Director Warsek will be here later this afternoon uh, to discuss that particular line item. Um, so I think we'll jump right to Lena. So are you ready to go? Welcome. So this is the discussion on the block management payment cap and 100 day payment. We have that sheet handout. Thanks, Lena. Yeah, good morning, Chair, members of the um, committee, uh, Lena Havron, Chief Financial Officer for FWP. Uh, I brought over copies of a document that looks like this uh, to walk through the request that you guys were looking for. Um, if you increased the hunter day payment to $18 a day and maxed it out at $35,000, um, and if you increased it to $20 a day, maxing it out at $50,000, um, I've given you a roll up by region of the number of participants that currently or in fiscal year 22 received a contract payment, uh, the number of hunter days that they had provided, uh, the 22 total payments that were made to those landowners. Um, and then what you can see is the number of participants that are currently maxed out at 25,000. Um, then the next column is gonna be your $18 a day, the number of participants that would be maxed out if the cap was 35,000, uh, the cost of the $20 per day, and then the number of participants that would be maxed out at $50,000. Um, right underneath of that information is what the increased cost uh, would be for each of those proposals. Um, and that's above and beyond what we spent in 22, so what we don't have the budget for um, at this point in time to increase that. Uh, there was a request for CPI information. We went back and looked at tying it into House Bill 140 when they changed um, all the license structure and took that information for the CPI and added it to the rate that would give you a rate of $15.73 using that same philosophy. Um, so that's the information you requested. Uh, one other thing I wanted to share is that the department does have proposed legislation currently in to increase the cap to $50,000. Uh, we also have a budget proposal that is not currently approved um, just because of the process uh, by the governor um, to uh, add funding, a uh, necessary budget to uh, maybe put some of these different changes in place. So with that, I will answer any questions you guys might have. Questions? Drew. Thanks. Drew Stenberger again from Billings. Uh, how much, what, what's the, what's the, can you give me a quick budget, like overview, like how much money do we have? How much do we bring in every year for tags? Maybe just to kind of give us all, you know, some of those total, those big numbers. So when we look at this, it helps us understand, are we going too far or not far enough, et cetera? So um, currently there is in the budget, so there's a two parts of the program. There's obviously the operating, all the people that go out and work the program. There's the contract side, the payments to the landowners. Last year, it was $7 million. We are funded for 
how we are currently spending, um, both on the operation side and the contract side. Any increases we make to the program have to be paid for out of the budget request that we have moving forward in the upcoming session. Uh, we are asking for an increase of $7 million just as a buffer. Um, we are also swapping out some of the funding to federal uh, PR versus the state special um, because we look at all the cash behind um, our block management cash and make sure that we don't go negative or we keep a healthy balance in there. So a lot of the changes we make will rely on the cash in 02334, which is a block management account, and then the, the federal PR. So right now cash looks good in federal PR. I think our apportionment was 28 million last year. Um, we're asking for a little bit of leeway in modifying those. Um, if we have to, if the revenue is reduced in um, PR versus the license. Um, I don't have the revenue numbers off the top of my head. Um, Jason, do you, rem do you have those that I sent you for 02334 revenue? Oh, there we go. Um, so there is the revenue information for 02334, which is the, the portion that comes from the license, the hunting license. So we have about 8 million in the budget right now. We're going to, we're looking at about 15, 16 million. Um, so looking at that half of it could come from general license, uh, not general license, hunting access, part of the license if, if necessary. But what we're proposing is more of a 75, 25 for the entire program with federal paying a large portion. Pittman Robertson. Yep. And just as an information piece, this information is on page 13 of the PLPW report that you submitted to EQC, and there is a link to the full report on the PLPW website. Yeah. Thank you, Hope. Thanks for the explanation. I'm not a CFO, so that's... <laughs> Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, and it's, I hate to be repetitive, I'm just trying to... So the fee increase in turn, it's not, it's being paid for out of these other funds. It's not taxpayer funds or it is I, in terms of this increase we're asking for. Uh, Fish, Wildlife and Parks has no uh, taxpayer funds right, so in the all, entire so agency. Get, okay, gotcha. Okay, yep. so that's good. And then, and then the, it's not, the fees aren't being increased for out of state license holders or or in state that's not being asked to be increased there's there's no fee increases associated with what we're trying to implement with the block management it's program all coming from the Pittman it's coming from the cash balance we currently have at FWP which is substantiated by the annual revenues from hunting license sales as is oh as is okay that's yep. okay thank you so yep. thanks for the clarification yep additional questions <laughs> Do you know how much is in that account for cash? Uh, no, off the top of my head, I don't, but we can get you that information. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think, I think in that report, wasn't it like 10 million <laughs> ending balance of 22? Is that what we're looking at? Um, that should be cash if it is all of the, yeah. 10 million at the end of fiscal year 22. Quick question on the, the Pittman uh, portion of that funding. There's proposed uh, legislation or whatever it is for that to be changed or go away. Or again, I don't know the full details of that. Is there a contingency plan on how to fund this if that indeed gets changed or goes away? Um, I'm assuming from the federal side yes. of things. Yeah. Um, There's always a contingency plan. Uh, it, it, whether or not it's a great contingency plan is probably the, the next question. Uh, we do not see that funding going away. Uh, we, we don't see them changing the legislation. It has been around for a very long time. It's very strong and we just, I, we can't see a future where that is, that is taken away. Um, with that said, um, in order to operate, there would have to be a lot of changes 
such as license um, increases, uh, maybe reduction in operation spending, maybe reductions in programs like this, uh, we would, if had to, we would start looking at that. But we don't foresee that. Yeah. Mr. Paul. Chairman, um, I, I know that legislation at the federal level, they're just talking about the funding sources coming and changing that to um, from guns and ammo and sporting goods to um, 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 gas and oil funding. And it will actually, because it's it fluctuates so much that they're talking about, it can fluctuate from $250 million to 500. They're talking about 750. They're talking about capping and it'll just stay about 800 million dollars so it, it's not they're not planning on decreasing it just for fyi it's just how they're going to fund it they want to make it more stable and not come from sporting goods you know. other questions <clears throat> so as you did the um the work on looking at cpi and these um, numbers with the maxed out participants and such on the cooperative level. Any, anything strike you in that at all, as far as looking at the 100 day payment, uh, knowing that we're looking at a $50,000 cap total, anything particular? I tend to look at things from the financial side. Um, so nothing, uh, nothing that stood out, nothing that uh, some great minds can't get together and find a way to make the program stronger um, from the operation side of it. Um, nothing stood out. So I guess where we stand at this point, we've, we've already put that recommendation forward to increase the cap. Um, we haven't really put a recommendation forward in regards to the 100-day payment. Um, number. Yeah. When I was at EQC, um, I was asked the question, well, how was it derived in the beginning? And I did not have that answer. Um, you know, and, and my thought is, how does it relate today? You know, and how does it matter in the equation today? Um, you know, we talk about, um, Heavy pressure on block management um, is one one comment we talk about. I think at what 1900 100 days to reach the current max at the current 100 day payment. Are those things we want to consider in how this is applied um, in our recommendation? To me, this is one of those substantial. Um, recommendations we make it's a very significant recommendation and and how do we go forward with that with those two parts realizing that the 50,000 max is definitely on the table currently Dale I guess one of the concerns I have just looking at the table that talks about the CPI and, and what the current rate would be today. That's assuming a base rate of $13 a hundred day that it was in 2017. But I think we've had some discussion within this group and I think we got feedback from Fish, Wildlife and Parks that said, hey, if you went back to the time that block management was formulated and we had applied the CPI all along, that rate that rate would be significantly higher than the the fifteen seventy three, and I think that's where some of that discussion came from. Um, but you're right. I mean, our recommendation, and if that were to be implemented, can be significant. And what what is what's the unintended consequences uh, of going forth with that? But at the same time, I look at right now we're at fifteen dollars a, a day. 13, 13, 13 a day. And I just see these parcels talking to landowners at, at $13 a day. It's really not enough to be competitive. They need to, they need to want to stay in block management. <clears throat> and uh, 
I, I really think we need to continue the discussion uh, looking at that 18 or $20 a day and, and where does that take us and what are the ramifications for that? And, you know, and I appreciate this information, but I think that number is still, that 1573 is still too low. Just for, oh gosh, I was just gonna say, just on your clarification point, Dale, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has an online inflation calculator, whether trusted or not. But so in, in 1996, when the program started at $10 hunter day, today that value in January of 2022 is $18.21. So that's where the $18. Yeah, and Mr. Chairman, I think Lena has made a case for why that's not the way to calculate that. And she mentioned it briefly in her explanation, but it might be worth having her come back again to explain how she figured it the way that she did in more detail and slowly so us mere mortals can understand it. it it's on. For the audio recording and okay. Zoom folks. Um, I can usually speak loud enough. So uh non-resident license um per house bill 140 uh we apply a cpi to those non-resident licenses uh and their cost increases every year um, based on that cpi so we use the same cpi in those calculations for the non-resident licenses to attach to this it did only go back to 17 um just to stay consistent with the increase to the non-resident licenses uh, Jason made a fair point that if you go back to inception, that $18 a day is not, not out of whack. Um, we just wanted to give you a comparison from that same standpoint. Do you want more hope? Okay. Questions on that? Donna, you had your hand up. Yes, Lena, um, you talked about there's already legislation for 50,000 cap. Um, would it be would we give it more legs if we supported that amount? Uh, absolutely. So we have timelines in state government where you have to have things across the street. We call it across the street to the Capitol um, by a certain deadline. And so we had to submit what our proposed legislation might be. So we took a shot at just putting something together with the hopes that the groups would um, would also come up with their plans and it would it would all work out great and be supported with each other. Yep. And Mr. Chairman, if I could get a, a little more context to where we're at right now, Donna. Um, so that support for the $50,000 cap you did include at your August meeting and signed off on that and put it in your recommendations that went to the EQC. What we still need to flesh out is what does the payment structure look like? Is it simply applying some sort of increase to the 100 day payment and the existing structure. I think in the department, you know, we've been munching on, um, you know, is that the best way to proceed or could we actually restructure the entire block management payment structure with this opportunity to make it make more sense for more landowners. And um, we've been having internal discussions, discussions in the regions with external folks and landowners. To And I think we put this to you at the August meeting, and, and it really did come back to the 100-day payment, as I recall. But, you know, one of the points that has been made internally um, by our director's office is, should we consider, just for stability um, purposes, a different piece of mechanism of having a, a larger base payment um, so that they're much like the CRP, um, sort of analogous to that methodology, having a base payment that landowners always know would come as part of their block management contract. And then the 100 day maybe is applied on top of that. Um, other ideas that have you know percolated and come forward um, is do you uh, potentially keep the 100 day payment where it is, but take the piece, the pieces that account for um, you know, participation in the full fall season and the pieces that account for um, not having any restrictions on species and gender and apply those differently with the base payment. Um, other ideas were longevity payments. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around aggregate block management areas where you have a, multiple landowners in the same block management area and re-looking at that aggregate function and how those payments are calculated, which is something you reviewed in your May meeting in Billings and you said, you know, this hasn't been going very long in this current structure, 
And, um, you know, let's, we recommend just leaving it, monitoring it for another year and revisiting after another year of data comes back. But again, with this opportunity with the pro proposal to increase the overall cap, it kind of changes the game and the discussion and looking, looking at that again and, and uh, kind of kicking all the tires and what might come forward. So if anybody has any particular things that you would bring forward today and say, hey, as you think about all these things, this rings a bell for me. Um, the other piece of the discussion that's been happening is not only about that payment structure, but other incentives that landowners have to participate and sort of that holistic view. Um, you know, Region 6 has made a strong point that it's, you know, for many large landowners, it's not really about the money. Um, and for some, it's about the license opportunity. So there's been some discussion about um, would you seek an opportunity for a large landowner to have uh, right now, if I'm repeating this correctly, and Jason can correct me if I'm wrong, you get one license per landowner. But could you have an opportunity to have a license per contract? Um, could you have an opportunity to put a permit on top of the license opportunity that already exists, which would bring that more in line with the piece of the elk hunting access agreements? Um, so it's sort of a holistic picture we're talking specifically right now about that cap structure, but the holistic picture of what makes it an incentive, a true incentive for different types of landowners based on their particular circumstances. So we're open to any and all ideas. And as we you know, sort of crunch this and figure out what's the best structure to put forward. Well, uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, I've always had a problem with paying by the 100 day because it just, it doesn't encourage um, any type of quality. I mean, some of those areas that I'm surrounded, I mean, I don't know. They're just, they just seem to, over, especially the type one, it's just over flooded with hunters. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of hunters, you know, and then, then you look at something I have that I'm hunting on. If I did that, I wouldn't have any game either. So I think we gotta, I'd like to see some way to incentivize for, I know there's, you know, like Sat Dale and I were talking about the satisfaction on the block management. I'm, I'm sure it is, but um, it just seems to me it would be a better experience. And that means, and I mean by experience, is seeing more game and having an opportunity to harvest something. So I think the doing it strictly by 100 day doesn't encourage the landowner to uh, provide any quality or management. The, man the term management doesn't seem to be you know, in the in the theory at all, because it's just, you can't run that many hunters through there. You're talking 1,800, 100 days on some of these ranches, and it just you can't do that and have any wildlife left on it. So I, I, I'd like to see us somehow have some type of incentive programs or some type of a, a payment program that's not going to just do it by 100 day. And uh, I know a lot of the people, a lot of the landowners like the um, type one um block management but i think that's just because they don't want to have to deal with hunters i mean they don't have time to deal with hunters and i think maybe having some uh folks um um people um um pro are uh, logging in and um scheduling people and, and maybe overseeing some of the property would be a incentive for those landowners to be you know but if they cut down on the 100 days and they lose money and so that just doesn't accomplish a good um, hunting experience, in my opinion. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, so good good points. I mean, we're talking about quantity versus quality, right? And there has to be, you know, from your perspective, there has to be a way we have to be able to quantify that that money. You know, I'm sure I could, maybe Jason be a good way to talk to us about because not all two ranches are created the same, right? I've, I've hunted some some places that are moonscapes and have 12 deer on 100,000 acres and you know a 10,000 acre ranch might have you know a thousand deer right so there's they're not they're not created equal but I think when we look at that cap and then we also in conjunction look at the the per day piece it might be that might be some of the solution to to balancing that that quantity over quality um because it's definitely a concern I mean we yes we want participation but if they're void of life, what's the point of having it? So good points, Paul. Wait. Uh, uh, in our circumstance, region six, uh, there, there's no way we, we, as a landowner, we don't manage a lot of game anyway. 
fish and game does that. And we don't have the ability to restrict hunters. So what we're looking for is somebody to make sure that the bad actors are accountable for what they do. And that's why we, why we sign up for block management is because when they sign that block management deal, come across our little piece of deed to go wherever, they're on notice if they read the rules and they're more afraid of the game warden than they are of us. You know, they don't care about us. They probably know where I'm at most of the time. I'm old, slow. One guy goes one way and, you know, I don't guide them. But, but it's, it's not our, that's not what we sign up for, for us to manage the game. The game is the charge of the Fish and Wildlife, Fish, Wildlife and Parks Department. And, the, and, the, and if you're south of the river, it's the Wildlife Refuge. And now the American Prairie's got a ranch in there and they're managing the game too. And so I don't think that we can predicate this thing on, on quality of hunt. I don't need a bunch more paperwork to do. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'll drop out of it and let them do whatever the hell if that's, you know, because there's no adding more requirements for us to make, a, make something we can't, we don't have any control over anyway, as far as the quality of the hunt goes. It has more to do with the weather and the, and the, and the people that come there. And if they come, the fish and game, they go to the fish and game office if they're not a state hunter, get a license and go to the biggest place they can find, drive the road, and then they go somewhere else. You know? And so we don't really have any control over it anyway, Paul. Thanks. So before Paul, um, Jason, <clears throat> as far as the payment structure, what is the base? Or maybe better, what are, so we look at the PALA uh, agreements, which the early part of this council put the sideboards on and they consider all those things, quality of access, quality of opportunity, how much demand, et cetera. When, when block was created, the simplicity of that system was created for equity amongst the cooperators in a very simple form. I understand that today is down the road, but I think it's been, I mean, 1,400 participants, it's been, a, I would caution us how we do this and how we look at our recommendations because it is, as you stated before, Paul, the most successful access program in the West, probably. And so, yeah. So, you know, we need to really look at this information and see, you know, dealing with, and this is clarifying in my mind, dealing with the 100 day payment and the cap are two parameters that are probably out of date as far as current equity. But how you set that up, I, I would like to be refreshed on each of those components of that initial structure. Mr. Chair, are you referring to how that $13 breaks down or are you talking about how we would enroll a property specifically? Yes. Enrolling a property. <clears throat> so each of these properties does get reviewed by either biologists, wardens, access staff. Um, there is a score sheet that we actually fill out very similar to what you would see for a, a PALA agreement that gets, it's, I think it's one to three for a variety of questions. Um, and I can pass that to Hope and we can share that here in a bit. Um, then each of the regions actually has a review committee. So between the access person, um, typically the wildlife manager, uh, our parks and outdoor recreation, recreation managers, regional supervisors, and then enforcement captains. So each of the properties would get reviewed. Um, and then by that, that committee's decision decide to be whether not to be enrolled in the program. Uh, each of the, the properties does get reviewed on more or less contract end date. So if you have a five-year contract, it'd be reviewed in five years. Um, but each of the properties does get scored, does get reviewed. And then we have uh, annual evaluation in addition to the hunter feedback we get. There is also a, a landowner survey that most of the regions use to get that feedback from landowners on how did your season go, what do you want to see change for next year. Um, and then including when we visit about their contract for the following year, it's it's visiting with the landowner to see how did it go, what changes do you want to see, do you want any rural changes, do you need map changes, do you need roads closed, do you need roads open, um, are you getting overrun by hunters? How, how would you like to handle that? And that's done on an annual basis for most of the contracts. And so within that, what gaps have you seen? Um, or do you see that the majority of those questions get worked out on an annual basis in regards to those cooperators? Um, from my perspective, the, the added benefit we have 
on a hundred day model. One is that it's kind of self-controlling. So if the opportunity doesn't exist or the hunters don't like it, there isn't a whole lot of signatures there. On a Lenar perspective, um, it's very flexible and customizable. So we can restrict dates, we can restrict seasons, we can restrict areas, we can uh, wet, re have weapons restriction areas, we can close off areas of properties. And so I guess I think that the, the current structure is relatively flexible, but it does provide some self-policing. Um, you know, I've thought about this conversation a lot and in terms of, of Paul's harvest objective or how, how you would how you would document similar to like a Wyoming model where you have a, a harvest coupon, let's say, um, that you provide or the landowner submits once an animal is harvested off that property. And you're exactly right in terms of the number of, of people that are impacting the place so that we're paying on those impacts. Um, how many dead critters and what's that value worth to get to the same payment threshold that some of these landowners are at now? That's one of the questions I've you know thought about. What's you know what's a what's a dead elk worth? Is it worth thousand um, dollars? Just on a grand scheme of, I mean, if you got twenty five elk harvested on a BMA and you're paying on a harvest basis, then then you're looking at probably that dollar figure just to get to the current payment where some of these landowners are currently at. And so just a conversation to be thinking about as you, as we've explored alternative models and alternative options is that you know, that more or less 100 day payment structure, although it does have some flaws can also um, kind of self police some properties. And to that point, a number of the larger block management areas that I'm aware of and some of the aggregates that are three or four cooperators. Um, I see the a satisfaction in doing what they want, which is they're providing the access, but they're definitely moving elk primarily um, out of their pastures and places where they're concerned about their, their feed. Um, so it gives me pause to, to really play with that too much you know, within the current block management system um, versus, you know, I think what we hear is type one versus master hunter program. The fact of the matter, and maybe some of you would disagree that the master hunter program is gonna be a very limited opportunity. Not all public hunters will have the opportunity to participate in that type of exclusive program. So to me, they're just on this wide swing. We have type one, type two, you know, a little more control. And I, I think we can, we can enhance type two as we go forward with technology on creating, solving some of those needs, such as reservations um, to accommodate that landowner where they really, they want the department to handle that part um, in, in regards to their time. I don't know, I, I just, um, I don't know how to get to Paul's question of, in his appearance, it's not a quality opportunity when so many folks participated in it, both from the hunter side and the landowner side. And as we've talked, you know, about, you know, the ethic question and the education question, you know, creating that understanding in the hunter about how to minimize that impact, will they do it themselves? Paul. Well, you brought up, Mr. Chair, that you brought up the master hunter program um, and tying that to block management. We really haven't done that yet. We've only talked about it, but um, I guess as far as, you know, I don't, I'm very familiar with Cherry Creek because I mean, I'm next to it hunting a lot out there and I don't, it's just, I mean, I don't think the people, if the word gets out, they just keep coming. I mean, I don't, Dale, you probably know the area better than I do, or you've seen people out there, but I just see vehicle after vehicle going out there because that's, they don't really have another place to go. And so I, I don't know, I guess my, my definition of a quality hunt's a lot different than a lot of people's, um, probably a public land hunter or a block management hunter. So I guess I'm just trying to make it a better 
experience for those um, those public land hunters and the and I'm just trying to figure out how we can make it better for them. Um, and and I just don't think, I mean, I guess I can just look at the one area that and Cherry Creek's a pretty large area, but it's just it's inundated. I mean, you see 15, 20 vehicles going up and down the roads and um, especially on the opening day. And I think they keep coming. I mean, I just I don't I'm not arguing with you, Jason, that they that they would uh, not, you know, they're the word gets out there's no deer out there there's no antelopes and don't go there they they just keep coming and and, and to, to to address lee's deal i wasn't talking about putting i was talking about having a hunt coordinator the department that the block management plays for it so you don't have to do that that's what i was talking about. well doesn't the more. system we have now work the same way because you have places that are asked first places that are restricted places that are outfitted and places that are in type two and type one block management. And so you have the ability to use type two if you're if you really can't control the access to it anyway. And or if you're in a situation like someplace where you want the elk out of the hay machine, you put it in type two and let everybody come move the elk. And if you're in a situation like Rich or some of the ranches are where they manage their elk, well, they help move from Ted Crowley's ranch over to Rich's ranch when you start hunting them. So they're managed there and then they come back, <laughs> you know. That, and so I, I think the situation that we have now, guys, there's an opportunity for everybody to 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 go look. I, on our ranches, it, we're right around the Bitter Creek Wilderness Study area. So there's no control over it. I mean, there's a big block of state land. There's a dedicated road through the middle of it. And, and so people drive the road. You know, some guys hunt by the mile, you know. They got a new pickup and the stereo radio in it and all the latest stuff on and they're smoking around there, seeing how many miles they can make. And if you're up there moving cows or something, hell, the deer right over the hill hiding down in there. You know, there was two old guys come out there from back east last year and they were out there walking about a mile off the road. I was moving the cows and the hunters are going by on the designated route. There's the BLM's got travel plans, too, so you can only drive so many places. And hell, they 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 got an elk or a deer, and I said, "Well, what are you? How are you going to get it home?" He said, "Oh, I said." He said, "Hell, we'll just drag it." <laughs> you know, they were happier than hell. There, there there was deer there. They just you couldn't see them from the road because everybody on the road had looked at them so many times that they just moved away. You no, know, I think the situation we have now is fine. Well, maybe I'm trying to fix something that's not broken. I don't know. Yeah. And we've talked about this many times where it comes down to, to the quality of the hunt. And we all hunt, we all have our own reasons for hunting. And when I'm out there and I see a dad with their 12 year old daughter and they just shot a two point and the smile goes from ear to ear. I mean, I, I've got to be really, really happy for them, you know, for a, this state of mind stage of my life shooting any deer is not a priority for me anymore but I, I certainly enjoy hunting quality habitat but when we start getting into how we define what is quality habitat or quality hunt not habitat quality hunt it varies by so much the other thing is is that and because we're familiar with cherry creek I go out there and I look for antelope, I would not call that a quality hunting experience. I mean, the numbers, uh, I just don't see them like I used to see them. However, if I'm out there hunting for sharp-tailed grouse, it could be really high quality because of the areas where I know to go. So it's, it's hard. I guess my point is it's hard to say this property, the quality hunting is not there. Well, maybe it's not for antelope but maybe it is for turkeys or sharp-tailed grouse or or something else out there and it's just we're going kind of down a slope when we try to say this is quality hunting or it's not quality hunting and i think we need to be very very careful about doing that taking it just a little bit a step further and it's one way to possibly think about how we how we regulate hunter numbers on block management areas. And it, it's something that I know the department has looked at, but you have the type one areas where, you know, it's a, they can't control it anyway, sign in boxes, let them go. 
You also have the type two where there are still those landowners that really enjoy that day-to-day -day interaction with the hunters. And, and it's not so much, it's probably a part of it. They want to control who's out there, but I know some of those landowners that just really enjoy visiting with the hunters and they want them to come by. But I think there's another option that's out there that could be used to control the hunter numbers and also then minimize some of the hunter uh, landowner interactions. And that's having that electronic sign in that I hope will, the department will get there. You know, say, you know what? I don't, I don't wanna have to deal with the hunters every day, but I only want six in here a day. So they have an electric sign in system where they go in, they sign in, um, prints out a, their permit or whatever, and they're good to go. So I think there's another option that could help get to that point of saying, okay, we're gonna meet the needs of the hunters, we're also going to help meet the needs of some of those landowners as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. So in regards to electric sign in, electronic sign in, I mean, do we try to preempt that? Uh, we need to talk about that, I think, some more <laughs> and just kind of see where the department is. Because again, I think it, it's not a concept that they haven't considered. I don't know no. where you're at with it or where the department has gone with it, but I know that's been a point of discussion from my discussions with people at Fish, Wildlife and Parks before. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chair, I think I'll take that one. Um, Paul, when you say suggestions, you mean beyond the monetary pieces? Yeah. Well, the way the bill was presented to the EQC under the title that was requested for the department requested legislation, and now we're gonna get into the ticky tacky of these various avenues of getting legislation. So the way the bill was presented to the EQC for a department piece of legislation, the title is increase the block management cap. So that bill would only have room in the title that was approved for department legislation for the cap. That doesn't mean we couldn't look at other things in other legislation. And I think that the expectation as we talk about what's the structure look like, you know, I think we feel from the department side, those, the, the payment structure has been set in department policy, so we don't need legislation to flesh that out. Um, but, you know, we expect there could be other pieces like the license discussion, a permit discussion that could take legislation and would have to be addressed in a different way. Questions on that point? Yeah. When I looked at the, the sheet that was handed out and, and we talk about the number of participants that are at the hundred or the $25,000 max, there's 121. And then um, if you go to, you know, a 35 or a, a 50, how many there are, but it'd be interesting to know um, if we went to if we increase to um, 18 or 21 dollars, um, how many how many would go over what the current the current 25,000 without putting a number of 35,000 or and I know you need to have some kind of figure in there, but you know if we increase that daily rate, how what's the economic impact in terms of how many people are going to move above that 25,000 may not hit 35,000, but how many are going to be above that, that $25,000 if we went to the, the different caps, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I, I suppose the only person that might have an answer to that at this point, but probably wouldn't would be Lena. Have you proffered that theory? Um, I actually, I, I played with that a lot and I did it. I just cannot remember the numbers. And I was sitting here thinking, 
really wish I would have brought my laptop today because I could have that in like three seconds, but we can get you that information pretty quickly. Um, well, no, we, I had a previous chat where Jason had given me the number of about 50 would be over at $25,000 cap with $18 a hundred day. Does that sound right to you? No, it's, it's substantially higher. Higher. So right now we have 121, I believe that are over the 25,000. You increase that without a daily rate. And I cannot remember if it doubled or tripled, mm. but I worked with so many numbers putting that together. I, I don't want to give you bad information. But I can get it to you. Um, I can send it to Hope prior to your meeting getting over today. So, Dale, in that regard, what would be your main point? Um, well, I guess my concern is you talk about what the cap is, and you know, going to you know, thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars, and the cap is important. If I can just a uh, quick question, because I don't think I, I probably understand it fully, is that I, I guess just thinking maybe a little bit the opposite when you, when you listen to Lee talk about when we're trying to figure out the hunter days, right? Whose responsibility is that of, of the cooperator in there to determine the hunter days? Because um, I'm thinking that maybe it is, maybe the cap is less important than the hunter. And it's, and if you're looking at management of everything and then ease of it, you know, as, as ranchers sign up, I mean, just to have it be one cap and you just, you provide all this stuff and you don't worry. And, and I, the only thing I think about hunter days is what maybe Paul had mentioned is that some of this management and things getting over, you know, hunted and things like that. But maybe when you're filling all that out and you're, and you're at 18 and all of a sudden it's an incentive to, 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 I don't know, fudge or whatever on how many hunter days are you, or you're tracking that more. And that's, but maybe, maybe it's just the, you know, the, the cap is, is, is a bigger number that, that gets more people involved because it's easy. I don't know. Lee. The, the hunter days is all kept track of with the slips that are put in the boxes. So the landowner has no control over any of that. <clears throat> and the way it looks to me like is we tax by the acre in the tax areas, we charge grazing fees by the AUM. And there's, how do you differentiate um, if you're, in our case, we have several miles of road that somehow you have to maintain. And that is that is kind of one of the things that you're doing when you take on block management is you accept that there are gonna be some, some, road, some road issues that happen with it. And so that's the way I looked at it, if it was, like Paul said, if they're driving around through there, well, if they're signing the box and, and they're chipping in, then you get a little money out of them to help fix the roads and, and do that kind of stuff. So I, I just thought that it was, if we're going to be fair about it, well, it's like a due structure for any organization. If you do it by the head or everybody pays the same for the representation you get, and it's just a, it's a fair way as you can do it, really. Whether you, so, thank you. And maybe just a comment to both of those points. If I recall, our perception is that has been that thirteen dollars per hundred day is under market, and that uh, twenty five thousand dollars for those type of impacts as a maximum is under market um, for all the competing factors we've talked about in the past. And that's without addressing them specifically, just in a general way, meaning that the competing factors. So I think that's how we got here is that it just seems so far out of the market now um, for the demand. Is that fair? And we're definitely at this point of uh, recommending, you know, the, the total payment increase. And now it's a matter of how do we adjust the 100A to today's CPI, um, Jason's comparison or just what seems reasonable, you know? 
So I, I guess we're, I'd like to see us just come with that number. And we have, we had asked uh, Lena for this data in regards to the 35,000 at 18 and the 50,000 at 20. So we got there last time, we're already that far. Um, is that when we look at these numbers, you know, at $20 a day versus, and you can see what 18 is, um, do we wanna make a proposition in regards to that number? Is 18 right, is 20 right? In, in our opinion, to proffer or 22 or whatever the number would be. I'd kind of like to see where we're at there. I, I know that's kind of jumping before, but we've got a we've got a max at 50 is what we're looking at. And it, you know, we assume that 50,000 15 cooperators would be there on this projection. Um, I mean, what do you think? Mr. Chairman, I think 20, I think our number is around 12 to 1300 hundred days a year on our ranch. And it's an expansive area and there's lots of ways to access it without signing in. You know, you can go to the, but you still have to maintain those roads. The ranch roads are not county roads, they're ranch roads. And most of them are old fire guards that were put in there in the, in the 40s when the Taylor Grazing Act came in and the, and, the, and the grazing district paid to maintain them. Well, with the travel restrictions and, the, and all of that stuff now, they, you got to go ask somebody if you can go fix them. And I, I got an old road grader here a year or so ago. I don't know if we were very good at it or not. I did about 20 miles in a day. I, I told them they were going to have to drive the road and see if it was an improvement or not. And, <laughs> but anyway, you, I, I think the fairest way is to leave it, leave it at the max, 20, 20 and, and 50, and, and see where we go from there. It looks like the funding's there to handle it. And then... And that's the simplest way to do it. And then it's fair to everybody. If you've got a really, really good area and you're, I don't know how you have one is close to an urban area where you've got lots of hundred days and all that. But most of it with the, with the hundred days comes the, the maintenance that goes along with keeping it. So it's in the, in the process, you know, it's the, fair. that's what I'd say. 20 and 50. We'll never get there. So but a bunch of them. Will. So in regards, Jason, in regards to Lee's comments about roads. So how do the, uh, fences, roads, weeds play into that uh, impact reimbursement. So right now, a cooperator in block management receives an impact payment. That impact payment is to offset impacts or potential impacts of road maintenance. Um, there's a couple of things in statute. I mean, liability insurance, which is maybe moot, but there's also... Um, you know, fire danger. There's also a piece separate from this conversation that is specifically for weed management or weed incentive. So it's in addition to the just basic impact payment that a landowner gets. So right now we're talking about a $25,000 impact payment cap. And that's all inclusive. That, that excludes the weed management incentive also. So yeah, somebody would get 20, uh, could get up to 25,000, spend it how they want. I mean, a lot of them spend it on Christmas money or trucks for ranch hands or whatever, but it's to offset those potential impacts. And so when you have a wet season and roads get tore up, our position with the department has been to the landowner. That's what your impact payment is for. You are to repair the road yourself. We're not going to come in and... No, it's that $13 hunter day. Exactly. Yep. Yep, exactly. So it's that thirteen dollar hunter day impact payment. Um, the the statute, the legislature has all, also authorized up to five percent of that impact payment to exceed that cap. So that was a, a change we made in 20, 2019, I believe, um, to clarify that that weed portion is an addition to the impact payment. So. We talk about a max of 25,000, that's their impact payment. A landowner is also eligible for up to 5% in addition to that 25,000, specifically for weed management on their, their property. So that's another 1250. <laughs> Excuse me. So if they had a significant road impact need. That's, that's, on them to, the that's, that's on them to take care of the road issue, to take care of the fence issues, to take care of whatever. Um, that's, what the, that's what the impact payment yeah. is for. 
Mr. Chair, just a heads up, Ms. Havron needs to head out and uh, last call for finance specific questions for the CFO. Did y'all get that? So did any specific dollar questions um, in regards to these two issues primarily? Seeing none, thank you very much. Ray had a question. So, uh, what I was looking at, uh, they've already put in for the 50,000 cap. In process. At, at, well, uh, uh, proposed it. But uh, where we're looking at the, the $20, that uh, we've already got the figures on that. And Jason's already said that uh, uh, going with the normal rate, it should be over 18 right now with, and that. So, and, and we're looking at, it takes a while for anything to go through. If we look at the 20 right now, we're just be ahead of the uh, game. So that's what I'd propose. Okay, so Ray's recommendation would be $20 as the per 100 day payment increase. Everett, you had a question or a comment on that regard? Uh, no, not to that, but for Jason, I have another question. So, so do we need to hear that before we talk about the 20? Not at all. Or decide on the 20? No. Nope. Okay, good. So then what I understand is we would, uh, according to Ray, propose a $20 per 100-day payment cap um, in the uh, payment structure for block management. Does anybody else have any question or comment on that payment number? I, Rich. I like it. I just just a question. When we say cap, or when does it, when does there an opportunity for that to go up again, or is that and, and is that an opportunity? I mean, obviously we're getting an opportunity, but will that in this whole legislative process and everything? So we're really looking at that twenty dollar limit if it goes through being another three. Would it be, is that right? Before we'd be able to really address it again, it would be legislative session type of thing, or how? That's just a quick yes. question. How? When would that time come again? be another two years after that so okay thank you the the hunter day rate so right now it's 13 dollars. the hunter day rate is a rate set by the department oh. so as long as the funding is there to support it it could be adjusted at any time and, and as long as the the statutory maximum that a landowner could receive right now is twenty five thousand. so right. we're looking at the 23 session changing that to fifty thousand. Right. But the, how how a landowner would get to that on a daily rate basis is set in arm, that it, it's established by the department. So we have a we have the leeway to adjust that. So in so in that case, Jason, um, how does that question usually get sparked? Outside of right here. Uh, it's it's. The last time it was adjusted was in 2017, went from 11 to 13, and that was in a conversation with this council yeah. as a part of changing the maximum payment from 12,000 to 15,000 in statute. Thank you. And I think, Mr. Chair, you know, what I would imagine we look forward, look at going forward is given the cap and cash on hand, et cetera, et cetera. I think we could look at every year, is there an opportunity, especially if the policy became to attach the CPI adjustment to it, um, there would be the opportunity to look at that. Now, without the cap, the max cap changing, you just end up, if the 100 day increases more and more people hit the cap, but um, there'd be a point at which you'd want to reevaluate that. Mr. Chairman, would we have to, would we, would it be part of Ray's, Ray's suggestion that we kind of try it to this consumer price index with the money that is a as an incentive to get it done annually or instead of it's been five years since we adjusted it the last time in order to kind of keep up with it. Somebody made mention in one of the previous meetings about the land trust. There was a deal where you could take it out of block management, and sign it up to a deal where somebody manage it for you in, in, in a different method, not the department. And so would there be any benefit to adding uh, an adjustment to the for the CPI to into this proposal that we're projecting now if the money is there. Questions, though. Thank you. Good question. 
Is it rhetorical or are you looking for a response? <laughs> okay, just checking. I saw the chairman nod and I was like, maybe it's rhetorical. Um, certainly that's a, a recommendation you could decide to make today. And I, and I, and I think that the calculation on the department going back and looking at the recommendation again versus cash on hand, the number of points that Lena provided today is, you know, if you do the CPI, is the $20 the right starting point in relation to the CPI based on where $20 puts us with a max cap of 50? The, the point that came out of EQC, and you heard the chair mention it, was we want to be fair and equitable. Um, whatever comes up, we don't want to disadvantage anybody from where they are currently. And so we would have to do some extra thinking about how that all fits together. Yeah. Yep. Paul. Mr. Chair, I, I think before we make a decision on how much we're going to do, I'd like to see the numbers that she's going to present so we get a full, better overview of what what that would do for which, which numbers the number she's going to send us for what cooper cooper um, cooperators are getting now how many are how many hour, days they have and all that isn't that what she's going to provide to us later in today not on my understanding what was she going to provide yeah that's right here yeah i think I think what I heard her say was she was going to provide if we stayed at the $25,000 cap and increased the per hunter day by X dollars, right. how many people end up over the cap? So, so if we, if we were just looking at raising the per hunter day to $20 and the cap stayed at its current 25, what those numbers were. Cindy. Mr. Chair, um, to make it easier on FWP, wouldn't it be easier if we just recommend them look at raising the cap up to like $20? Because they're going to make the recommendation anyway. You could. I mean, rather than go through these machinations of $18 or $20 or whatever, because we're not going to decide it anyway. Well, we, I do believe we make a decision for a recommendation. Well, we can, but, but I mean, ultimately they're the, the side we can say up to $20 though. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there any other discussion in that? Donna. I didn't even have my hand raised. You must know when I. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I have a couple of things. So by the time this legislation would go into effect would be 23. When the payment structure changes, would that be the year 24 or would that be the year 22? Depends, Mr. Chair. Um, so if, if the payment structure Lena and I've had a couple of conversations. If the payment structure were simply the cap increases and the max hunter day payment increases and nothing else changes about the payment structure, it seems feasible that through a series of contract amendments, we could potentially apply that and increase payments in the 23 hunting season, even though the contracts already would have been set. Um, if it's more, if it's more um, different than that, I'm sorry, that's really bad. English. Um, I didn't want to say complex because I don't want to imply that the new structure would necessarily be complex. But if there are more pieces to that than just those two simple changes, then it would be more likely we would need to get into the 24 season. Um, the other consideration is that with the existing IT database that the contracts are based on um, being tender toward its, its capabilities and its advanced age and um, how much time it might take to just adjust it to sufficiently capture any changes in payment structure. So that complexity with the IT piece could also mean more toward 24. Right. So in the last six years, seven years since 2017, what the environment and the inflation has done, we're not just looking at today, we're looking at two to three years down the road. So when we recommend a figure we just can't look at today's cpi we have to think ahead 
And so my recommendation would also be that 20, but I also have a second thing on that is if they are capped at 5%, and I'm bringing these together because it has to do with funding for weed, can we include, and does this need to go through legislation, an additional 5% to not only include weed, but fence and road repair? Mr. Chair, that would require legislation. And I don't even know if some, if anyone would be interested in introducing additional funding for the fence and road repair. So, Donna, I'm going to excuse myself for a minute. You keep leading on that. Okay. And I'll be right back. No. And I and I am, I'm going to wrap up at that, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the one answer I would have, or a comment to that, Donna, is. When we work through the impact payments, and again, the money that is provided to the cooperators, the $13 currently, the $20, whatever it is, is an impact payment. And back in the early 90s when I worked on it, the discussion at that point, and I don't think it's really changed, is the money that we're paying them is for impacts. The, the rutted roads, the... the uh, fences, the garbage that's picked up. The weeds was a different issue because the weeds could come in from anywhere and all of a sudden you have just a monumental problem. But again, the impact payment, and Jason or Hope or somebody, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was my understanding that all along that money that was paid to them was to compensate them. Okay, they need to get a grader out there to fix the roads. That's why we are giving them the money they are. It's not to allow for access. We're not paying for access. We're paying for the impact of those that access. Thank you. I think for the clarification. I think Dale's accurately represented that. And then I, I think what I could also just go ahead and say is that in some of the discussions that have been happening, that idea has been percolating of would you do any other percent increase above the cap, say for weeds, even given the cost of weed um, supplies right now, weed spraying supplies. And um, the, the feedback I got was that with the significant increase in the cap, the potential for increasing percentages on top of that outside of the cap would probably be low. If I could just, and as we talk about that hope and not to get too sidebar on all this weeds and roads and stuff, but like in our count, I mean, yes, there's the roads that the landowner has that they travel, but in our county, it's not so much that as it is the county roads themselves. And so is there anything in, in all of this process you just had that, that any of the license fees, any of that go to counties um, for, because if I, if, if, if my road is trashed, it's really my county road. And if I were to take my equipment out there, the county would have a fit of me taking my own equipment out there and doing that. So just did you quick, just point in that is that maybe there, I, I don't know that there's opportunity with for counties to acquire some of these these dollars at some point for road maintenance in terms of just people getting on the county roads. I mean, there's no turnouts for, for hunters to park alongside the roads, so they're just parking wherever. I mean, it, this is maybe for a later discussion, but, and that same goes for like weeds. The weeds aren't really, in a lot of cases, and where, where I'm from are not on the property yet. They're on the side, I'm spraying the county roads, and so is the county weed district spraying the roads like we've got a huge napweed problem now right on our county road that goes right into private property and so the county sprays but they get there maybe about august uh, i get there hopefully take care of it sooner so i'm just it's just a, i know i'm sidebarring here a little bit is there any opportunity for for the counties and the, like the county weed department which i think already gets a percentage of that and then and then also counties for their road work that's just a quick question. Yeah, this is a road well trod, this question, Mr. Chairman. Um, and we've had our legal fo folks look at it again since I've been here in the last year. And, and the answer continues to remain in the legal assessment the way the statutory language is written right now. Road maintenance um, outside of an FWP ownership boundary is not an eligible expense, the way the statutes are written for the, our funding sources. 
it's okay. It, it's a routine question, quite honestly. It's nice to have the legal memo to go, well, we've asked that. And we've also answered it. So are you guys wrapped up the day now? <laughs> I know. Yeah. Just one thing I'd comment on the, the thought process about CPI, and I, I appreciate the foresight to look at <clears throat> down the road, not having to address this every year. And even on a CPI basis, that does create some administrative hurdles for us to have to go back and revisit every contract on an annual basis to try and get everything done. We do a lot of contracts on an annual basis, but not all of them. Of them are even on a five-year basis. And so if we have a re revolving, changing dollar amount that just creates an administrative burden. And so, yeah, if you have the foresight to say it's whatever dollar amount into the future, it helps us get ahead of that so we don't have to address it on an annual basis. And we've definitely heard feedback, Mr. Chair, that as we consider what a new payment structure might or might not be, that the best we can do to simplify things as much as possible um, and calculations, et cetera, for staff would be greatly appreciated. So being careful not to um, add additional complexity that becomes a burden in the calculations like Jason just described. So how did that end up with your request on that part, Donna, in regards to the annual? Everyone loves my idea. <laughs> now, um, there was discussion about the increased percentage, so we decided that was not such a, a good idea, but maybe the $20 and the 50000 Okay. So is there a need to have a prompting not for a CPI, but for a three-year periodical review of that number or no? a bad idea versus a CPI? Does that make it complex? I think it's it's good to continuously be revisiting that rate if that's how we're going to continue to pay contracts. Um, just know that we're probably a year to two years from the decision of that point to actually implementation, right? It's always no. It started at 10 and 96, and then it went to 11, maybe late 2000s, and then it went to 13 in 2017, and it hasn't been adjusted since. Yeah. The cap has changed a couple of times. I think it started at 8,000, then went to 10,000, then to 12,000, then to 15,000, and then we got to 25 this last legislative session through help with Representative Logie. Um, and now we're discussing potentially doubling that yet again, which puts us out ahead. We don't have to continuously pay catch up if we can set those rates at a, at a place where it protects us into the future. Okay. So are we at a point where we would make that recommendation to 20? Is that where we're at? A $20 hunter day payment, impact payment? Dale's, Dale's not the only one. Dale's the only one that's not here. What's that? He did. So, no, but we'll maybe wait till Dale gets back here just to make sure. Okay, Dale, we're ready to vote. Are, are we uh, in support of recommending a $20 per 100 day payment? Rich? Sorry, I'm sorry. Every, that's unanimous. Okay. There we are. <clears throat> it's very much, isn't it? Um, yeah. So just to digress back into that other, you know, 5% for weeds, it seems to me that uh, in the review within the department, within the region, within those specific requests that recur, there, there should be a mechanism to address those one off in a in a satisfactory 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 fashion. Um, do you believe that exists? Whether you know whether it's a one off or a regular problem. Yeah, I think there's potential to look at other exclusions or certain specific situations. You know, somebody has a, a BMA burned over and their whole fence needs to be replaced. Right now, our position is that's your impact payment. You need to fix that. There's certain situations where those kinds of examples may be helpful to look at. 
Uh, we've also talked about other al alternative incentives, um, such as you know water infrastructure improvements and those kinds of things that not only benefit the the, the working landscape but also benefit the wildlife. So, um, yeah, I think there's potential to look at those as well. Uh, the weed the weed one is specific in statute at up to five percent, and in addition to the impact payment. So if the the cap were to go through to a fifty thousand dollar cap in the legislature, that <clears throat> potentially would be in excess of that for some cooperators, um, just given their the, the way the the current law is written. The landowner needs to agree that they'll use that money for. They, yeah, correct. They they need to they need to agree on their contract that they'll use it for specific weed management activities on lands that they control. We don't collect receipts. We don't ask you to submit invoices, but that's the commitment the landowner makes when they check yes on that contract piece that yeah they'll use the money for weeds. Which in most cases, you know, even a twenty five thousand dollar twelve fifty. How much does that touch of your weed bill? I mean, in reality, not not much. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments on block management cap or hundred day? Everett. I just was real curious, Jason. Uh, do you think that will entice any new participants? It's hard to say. Um, I think the $20 rate will certainly help. Um, the cap, I don't know. I mean, I think there's other things we can do to try and incentivize further more participation than just the monetary piece, but it certainly doesn't hurt. Dale. I had a conversation with a long-term block management cooperator from my part of the state this past week. And we talked about the different rates and he, without prompting, he suggested to me that if the rate went to $20 a day, he thought you would see an increase in the number of people in this part of the country that would be willing to participate in block management as opposed to the, the $13, especially with the number of 100 days that they could been potentially see. I mean, certainly not scientific, but that was again, given to me by a cooperator that lived in the area for a long time. So I thought that was encouraging. Thank you. All right, um, our next item is, uh, topic is PALA program scoring assessment. We have a public comment coming up in uh, seven minutes. So we'll see where we go here. Jason, I believe you're up again on there. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so what I want to turn to is um, kind of it's, it's under the tab PALA processes. Uh, there's there's two documents there. One is a uh, scoring and assessment form, which many of you have seen before. It looks like this. Um, one of the questions that was raised, I believe, at the, the May meeting and then also touched on again in August was should a landowner be compensated based off of the entire acreage opened versus being compensated for only what they lease. And so the way that comes into play is on the, the back page of that little packet, there's some yellow highlighted section there. Currently when a, when a landowner is compensated through the public access land agreement or PALA, we factor in a variety of questionnaire things as you've seen on the first couple of pages, but then on the back, they do receive a, what this committee uh, distinguished as a contiguous block of public land incentive. And so currently you may not lease 3,800 acres, but your lease opens up that much public land. And so you receive an additional $500 because you open up that much public land. Uh, similarly with those, so it's a sliding scale. So yeah, you you may only lease a section or section and a half, but that section and a half opens up, let's just say more than 10,000 public land total acres, mm -hmm. and you would receive $6,000 currently under the current structure um, for that large contiguous block of public land incentive, more or less. Um, the discussion at this committee has been, well, that's probably not fair if you're receiving um, money for somebody else's lease per se. 
um, that's how this council and the department has kind of worked through it the last couple of years is that we set that for regardless if you leased it or not if you opened up that much public land that's the point in the program and so that's where your compensation additional compensation kicks in Lee. Uh, we've uh, we have my own personal experience here's a half section of county land that a, a designated road a county road went through kind of but they didn't it wasn't designated it was just a line on the map called the bridge road and it, it the way the the road followed the fence line and there's three ranches right there one of them has a pal on it now for 80 acres we have another little, a little chunk of ours sticks out and blocks that county road again they tried to split the land up so it fit the ranches and there's another landowner that's bought a 40 out of that same 320 well the road goes through all three of those pieces and and if by allowing what would keep the guy that had the 40 if nobody else said anything from letting it saying okay i got i'll let you i'll rent you my 40 i'll do a pal on my 40 but i opened up uh three ranches public domain or public hunting access and so i i'd be opposed to to doing that i think you'd create a bunch of problems with the neighbors because they, they all most of them all have the same opportunity they could do something themselves and each one of the ranches that i'm referring to have a public land component that goes with them and i think that they it should be re restricted to the unless nobody leases it in the cases of what could happen with the charles m russell wildlife refuge if you open that that would be different like in the case of whitmere grazing where you know, as the ranches change hands to Page Whittem when they sold their, their ranch to the to the American Prairie Reserve, they lost all the leases on the that they had on the game range, but they but they could open it up for that. But if somebody's actively leasing the land, I don't think that you should incentivize the neighbors to fight amongst themselves or who's going to open it up. If if you if it's your lease and you provide access to the piece that's your lease and it's not your land. But you, you you shouldn't be encouraged to 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 say take credit for opening up access to somebody else's ranch. I don't think that's the way I look at it. Rich, I I just like to concur with Lee. I think in <clears throat> certain circumstances, um, when you're responsible for those leases, you know, I mean, I every year I have to report to the state what I'm doing on there, how it's being taken care of. They're responsible to come out and look at these lands and. If I if I am not in control of them in some respects, then I feel that that's something that's against me. I'm the one that's responsible for those BLM and state. Um, my name's on the my name's on the line for those. So I would I would definitely say I don't know every circumstance. I sometimes find myself thinking about just myself and where I am. So I can honestly say I don't know how that affects everybody in our state or what that situation. But I would certainly say from from the area that I'm in that I I concur with with Lee's comments on that. That I don't believe that should be the case. I'm just curious, is it first come first serve on that? On how you handle who gets compensated? Yeah, I mean, you have to have the, the public land lease. So that's one of the components is that you have to have the public land lease to be able to get into the program. We are in the sense that if once you're there, you can go anywhere. Um, that's the difference. So if you think about your public land lease as one, one small <laughs> entry point, into a larger contiguous block right now if that contiguous block is inaccessible we're, we're compensating whoever that leaseholder is on the smaller piece for the entire thing even though they only have one small piece leased um so how would you how would you do a situation where the new Yeah, that, that's that's what we're talking about now is is if you if you're providing that public access and this could be to anybody, um, as long as you have the public land lease, you can provide that access opportunity if it's and that's where the 
you think back to our, even our first discussion this morning about the, the statutory or the, the arm rule change from two miles to one mile. So if your nearest neighbor's access point is a mile or less or other considerations based off the recommendation we have currently, that would allow both neighbors or, I mean, we're trying to get more or less public access in all different angles, but you have to have the public land lease in order to be eligible. Understood. Dale? When you reviewed all the proposals, it's not one area. And I think I can't tell you that there's four service parcels. It's Dale. like three different people, yeah. but twice you said you went through and all of them were compensated for. It's your speaker. <laughs> Let me start over. And we're up against public. Okay. Just, I was just saying that uh, we've dealt with that in the past where we had that four service. Uh, land and I think we had three different landowners that were compensated for our basically allowing access into the same three parcels. Mr. Chairman, may I just make a real another quick comment? When I look at the yellow highlighted area, I think we need to be careful about uh, putting in the verbiage here, large contiguous blocks of public land because the public land that, that you're allowing may not be contiguous. It may be blocks that still you can get access, but it's not one large contiguous block. So I think you're setting yourself up a little bit of setting a trap for yourself here. So you may just want to consider changing the, the wording there. Thank you. True. I'll hold my comment till after public comment, but I would certainly like to, I know we've already talked about this, but I've got plenty to say as well. So just to be clear, do we need to break for that right now and come back? Mr. Chairman, I think that as long as we do it before our lunch break, we're covered, um, you know, okay. and so. Okay, but then let's continue on this question. Sure. So I, I know we discussed, we, you know, we've discussed this a couple of times and I'll just, you know, respectfully disagree with, with a couple of the landowners in the group where I think, you know, we talk about private property rights and if somebody has private property next to a landlocked piece of public ground, we're okay with letting them do a PALA agreement if they have the lease. But if they don't have the lease, we're saying that private property person can't go into an independent contract. Um, so it's, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, stance to take against private property rights and doing their own contract on their own private land with, the, with an entity. So there's um, kind of talking out both sides of our mouth on, on, that, on that one right there. I would say that again, the whole point of the agreement is to open up as much as we can and do that in a respectful way. We should be encouraging those people to do that. And, and I would I'd bring up the point that if 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 somebody, if if whomever has a ranch and they have a, a lease on a piece of public land that already is is on a, a public access way, there's already people utilizing that. And I, I don't hear from the field from private landowners that weeds are an issue. So I feel like we're using weeds as, as a pretty big crutch all too often. Now, I'm not saying that weeds aren't an issue. I, you know, I have a dad that farms and you know, we talk about weeds every day, right? It's one of those perpetual conversations. Um, but I don't think it's that big of an issue uh, if we already have people utilizing lands that, that you probably already lease anyways. I, I don't know if they're, the weeds are that much more of an issue than they would be if they went through somebody else's property and parked and started walking. Go ahead, Rich. We just disagree with that. It's okay. Paul. Well, I think the intent, and this was legislatively done, and they were adamantly um, that that if, if it opened up access to um, another person's lease, a rancher's leasing that particular public land, that, that this wouldn't qualify, right? No, not in this respect. But we're talking about, what, where is it? That, that... So, so 
this is an additive. This particular piece is an additive to the value on the Pella payment. This particular piece right here in yellow highlight. The legislation requires that whoever is making application, so the landowner that's making application for the Pella, the particular public land that they're applying to grant access to, they must lease. Yeah, we're not talking in, about in that. this case. What we're talking about, they might lease. Let's say they lease a section, and there it opens access to seventeen sections instead of lease issue with with that other side of it. So they qualify for that pallet application. Period. Right. They can make application for that section, and and qualify under the PALA legislation. That's just a fact. This particular piece um, adds monetary incentive to the fact that it's accessing many acres above 10,000. That doesn't matter who has the lease on it? Well, once you open public land, it's public land. So how would you, how would you draw a border well, I'm From just this saying, state, I'm wondering where the landowner happened to have the lease on. So they have to have the lease on the piece of land that oh. provides the access to public okay. land. Period. It. All right. Is that that simple? Does that help? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That explains it. Thanks. Yeah. And if you go back, you don't have to go back, but in the original assessment form. Um, it talks about the total number of accessible acres and scoring that one through five in the initial access agreement, trying to determine how good of a PALA it is. Coming back to monetary value is where, where this particular piece adds incentive to that for providing that access. It would be like the land board just approved and that an agreement that uh, provides. I don't know what the numbers of acres are in that. I didn't pay attention 90, to it enough. How many? It opens up an additional ninety thousand acres by by approving a small acquisition by the state of Montana. It opened up many many thousands of acres. It's that kind of issue, only under the Pallet Agreement, which is why I would I, I would agree with adding incentives to that. Just curious on that example then. So for this, the 640 that they, the section that they have, do they get compensated for the 640 or they get compensated for the additional 17,000? So, so as you look um, on this yellow highlight, those increases in access um, follow those criteria, $500 for 38 to 5,000, et cetera, up to 6,000 for 10,000 plus acres opened. So this, they've already qualified. This is an additive valuation uh, for them on their PALA agreement. Does that help? Yeah. Lee. Uh, I guess going back to what I do, the Bitter Creek Wilderness Study Area is 75,000 acres in the top. But they're also inside of that. There's the, the there's a road system that's approved to use. But it but when it was put in there, the roads that are approved, a bunch of it goes through deeded land. It belongs to different people. That and if you provide access to the edge of that thing, do they and they use the existing road system? How do you keep the the guy that owns the rest of it? To, you see what I'm saying? There's different ranches that are that are in that area. And what's to keep them from saying, okay, they've been allowing access because they're good neighbors or for whatever reason, or they were in block management. And if you incentivize the guy that offered to say, well, I'll just, I'll just take credit for the whole deal, increase my payment. And I just, I just get to worry about the divisiveness. You can't really, um, we, nobody owns the leases, but there's little pieces of deed that's scattered through there. And all the roads go someplace deeded because that was the only reason to have a road was to go where somebody lived at one time. And somebody managed to hang on to that homestead and they own it. And and what's the, like in, in the case of the one up there, there was an out-of-state landowner came in there and bought one of the ranches that had been in block management since it started. 
and he immediately took it out. And it's taken 20 years to get it back in block management again now because he thought he owned it. You know, he doesn't own it. And he finally figured that out. But if you incentivize somebody else to, to change the rules and he looks at that and says, oh, I'm missing something here. You see what I, I just, it's just, I agree with what Drew's saying and everything. You can't, it's kind of like ranching for wildlife, but, but there's, there's still people are going to think about it. That's, I'm just being the devil's advocate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all accurate concerns and questions within this. So, so I think the question in this particular case is, is this, do we leave this or do we want to consider changing that attitude for that? I mean, these are uh, criteria that the previous council put forth. It's, it's just that simple. In the formative stages of it, I think as long as the regional representatives understand it, kind of what the intent of it was, it'll be fine. Uh, well, actually, different, different I mean, this is what they used to score that value. Right. So if it qualifies under that value, they're going to score it that way. And and that that landowner who's made application is going to desire it that way in a great way. I mean, it does kind of, I mean, if in your case, Lee, I don't know if there would be a prescriptive easement situation in those public roads that pass through private historically. Well, somebody then has, you to get do, into has to do maintenance on something to have a prescriptive easement. And it, within the boundaries of the, of, the, Not of the wilderness study area, there has been no maintenance on the road since the wilderness study area was put in there. Yeah. So whether they'd have a prescriptive easement or not, I think it's a case for the judge to decide. You see what I'm saying? I, oh, yeah. I'm trying to be proactive and set the thing up so that we're compensating somebody for what they're doing, but we're not starting to open it up a can of worms that really isn't Montana. That simple, simply said. Understood. Everett. Dale, can I ask you a question? Going back earlier to that idea of contiguous, were you suggesting that we remove that because some people might have checkerboarded land somewhere that might achieve the same net effect? Well, I just think by having the word contiguous in there, to me, it suggests one large block of public land. And I've looked at several of our PAL agreements that we've approved over the years, and there's different parcels mm -hmm. of public land that's provided access to. They're not contiguous. There's some private land that surrounds them. So again, is it a big deal? I don't know. It might be in it's not until somebody says, well, this isn't contiguous. Why are you providing compensation for it? So that's, that's, I just don't know that it does anything for us by having contiguous in there. Yeah, I, I feel like it might be limiting too, but I would kind of want to get Jason's perspective on that. If there might be something that opened up, if we not said contiguous, but something that said substantially together, I guess, or however the legalese would be. Yeah, I'm not an attorney and legalese isn't my thing, but um, it can go either way, right? I mean, that's that's the hard discussion here is that if you are not contiguous, but you open up public access to public land, that's the intent of the program. At the same time, if you open up bigger chunks of public land that's legally yeah. accessible, there's probably more value to that because you're not going to just an 80 or a 120 or a 640, you're going to the six sections, seven sections, eight sections. I mean, that's that's the intent behind the contiguous incentive is that you're we're trying to get as much public land access as possible to provide that experience for the user that's something that they want to go after. And when you get into the contiguous discussion, it's yes, it does increase the number of acres if you take that out for sure. But is it is it worth the incentive then if you have just individual isolated parcels or, or would it as a user, you prefer something blocked up in a bigger chunk? Didn't answer your question, but it's, um, this isn't the limiting factor with the program, if that makes sense. So I, I might pose that question to you, Jason, also. So as it stands, we are today in the Pala agreements that we've gone through for a couple of years. Um, 
would it create more risk to producing this or limiting it in regards to participation versus more conflict with neighbors? Do you have a, a gauge? I don't have a good read on neighborly relations, but I would say the the more changes we make to our scoring and assessment criteria, the more of an administrative burden it becomes because we've made commitments on a three-year, 10-year basis with current landowners or previous landowners under the old rules. And so every time we change the rules, we need to honor those contracts, but we also have to keep track of all the changing rules and then where we, where how, how the rules change in those discussions going forward. So yeah. um, not to say it can't be done, it's just administrative headaches. So just as another theoretical, so this exists, we have agreements that exist with this. If another cooperator on the palace wanted to provide that access, let's just say this one's on the east side, the other one's on the west side, and it's over a mile away, they would have the potential to do that if they were so concerned. Correct. So we all we all good with leaving this as it stands. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Well, I, yeah, I just wanted to address Dale's question about contiguous. I mean, that, that's another point for maybe future discussion, but um, just know that if that's the decision that the committee wants to look at is just pure number of acres versus contiguous acres. Um, we need to have that discussion too, but this, this helps us having a discussion now going into next year's contract cycle to know what we're setting up for and how to have those conversations with landowners as well as we go through the winter. So, thank you. Thank you. And I, I just have a last comment on Pala. So as we go forward with Pala into 23, um, with everything we're proposing um, with Pala, are we good with where we stand on that? And simply the process of reviewing those Palas going forward. Yeah, so that's just the other piece we we aren't I'm not sure how some of those statutory changes will go and we might not know until later into the season after contracts have been available to be signed and stuff in 23 how that process will go for 23 because I mean it's still as is currently for 23 um, the the law changes and we have the opportunity to reject applications and that kind of stuff the we may be able to adjust on the fly for 23, but I think it's really a looking out to the future. The the PLPW will still be involved on a local basis like we do now. It's just whether or not the full the full council sees everything or not. It's the... Okay, thank you. All right. Last comments on that. We're good. Do we have public comment? Mr. Chair, would late. you like to start in person or would you like to start with I online? I see one in person. And do we have online, Jennifer? Uh, for those online that wish to make a comment, please raise your hand. Okay, and then let's start with Marcus. I didn't know that existed, that's amazing. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm not going to you know, take a lot of time. You all want to get to lunch. M mainly the reason I wanted to stand up today and, and uh, share a few things are, um, you know, we've been commenting on the things that you're working on through this whole process. I don't have a lot to add. I just want to say thank you. This was a really good discussion today. You went over a lot of the concerns that the Montana Wildlife Federation has, and um, I feel really good about where this uh, conversation is going. Um, we'll continue to be involved in the process, and I'm looking forward to seeing a finalized product from you all on things like your uh, block management proposal. Love the idea of increasing payments to cooperators. It's a really good idea. I think it'll really help those cooperators and hopefully bring more people in. Um, Palo agreements obviously are important, and then uh, 454s. So not a lot to add. Just wanted to say thank you and uh, acknowledge the good work you folks are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? 
for Mr. Strange. If I can remind commenters to please state your name before making your comment. Thank you. And then uh, Representative Logie, any comment at this point in time? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. A uh, couple comments. One of them, I know that this discussion, a little bit of comment about the e-bikes. And I think there's, there's some legislation that's being proposed on classifying the three classes of e-bikes and that may come into play on some of the use on public and uh, federal and, and state lands in that discussion. Uh, another thing we're gonna probably see in the legislature will be uh, coming out of what happened in Wyoming. I'm sure there'll be some corner crossing discussions and uh, it might be for you folks to even have a little discussion on that. Another one I'm, I'm and we're seeing with all these new landowners, we're seeing things about like the river access and, and uh, access to the high water mark or below the high water mark. And, and I, I know there are going to be some discussions of people trying to maybe uh, change that a little bit and take away some of that public access. But I, I don't see that happening. But I'm just telling you, that's part of what will come. Uh, the fishing access uh, that I was trying to get through legislation through, there's there's more in the works for coming up this next session so that those that are using the fishing access side a way that everybody pays their share on that. And, and basically that's about all. I, one of the things you talk about the quality of the block management and, and I, when I go over East, I've a few of the places uh, when I sign on the first time you get there, you decide if you're gonna go back because the quality probably wasn't there. So some of that takes care of itself. The other thing is even on, on mine, I'm surrounded by state land, all, all of my places with block management are either state or forest service backing. And the quality of the hunt depends on the hunter, sometimes just for that day. You know, it might be they get disgusted, well, there's nothing around here, uh, but the next day you come back and the herd elk can be out in the field. So, you know, when, when you evaluate the quality of the hunt, uh, those that get disgusted might have just had that one bad day. Uh, but I do think when you're when you're talking that fifty thousand dollar cap and and raising that uh, daily, I, I think that's a good idea to try and keep that access open because that's block management's been a good program, and I think we need to have that out there. But right now, that's about, about all I have to say. But one thing, when you do talk about the legislation and thinking the fifty thousand dollar cap, it's it's at least a year away because legislation mm -hmm. generally takes place you know, during the January through April, and then it's effective usually in October, that following. So you keep that in mind when you're thinking ahead of these ideas that you want to carry forward. And uh, I will be sitting for the afternoon too to hear, and, and if I have to drop in some bill requests, uh, I'm willing to do that on probably most of them. I won't say all. <laughs> Thanks. Any questions? Denley? No. Thank you, Denley. Online, we have? We do have one commenter online. Um, Kevin, I, you can unmute and speak. Thank you. Can you all hear me? We can. Awesome. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Kevin Farron. I'm the Montana Chapter Coordinator for Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, listening in today from my home in Missoula. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Uh, we appreciate the conversations and the time and effort you have all put in these issues and working to identify a solution. So thank you. Um, in regards to the conversation about block management that include landlocked parcels of public and those lands being counted in the payment, um, I'd first actually like to hear clarification from the department. On that, it was my understanding that the maps that showed all the lands that are opened and enrolled in block, you know, we all are familiar with those block or those maps. Um, but I was also under the impression that, that landowners were not actually compensated for anything more than their deeded acres, not the public uh, within those. If that is not the case, however, and landowners are in fact being compensated um, based on the public land acreage that's opened via block management enrollment. I would encourage this committee and FVP to correct that. Um, as we all know, block is an impact payment for their deeded lands, not an access payment. 
On the other hand, however, you know, the PAL Act could and should be used to incentivize the current block that opened inaccessible public lands in this situation. Um, but the block payments should be limited to those deeded acres. Let's keep that clean. Let's use this as an opportunity to educate landowners on some of the other access programs. And I actually expect that in some cases, this could actually lead to an increase in the total compensation for landowners, which would be a good thing. Um, along those lines, our chapter enthusiastically and supports a cap increase and a 100 day payment increase for block management. Not only would the suggested $20 per hunter day better reflect the CPI compared to when block was started, as you all have flagged, um, but it would also better reflect the increasing rates for private land hunting leases that we see today. Um, this is something that we look forward to working with you, uh, Representative Logie on, so hopefully we can make that happen. Um, and then and finally, in terms, or sorry, and finally, in regards to the term privatizing wildlife that was flagged at the beginning of the meeting, um, we agree fully that this can create a wedge and cause well-intentioned landowners to become defensive. For that reason, we do our best to reserve that language for when discussing actions by a small and vocal minority of landowners whose behavior certainly warrants this criticism. There are numerous tools and forms of compensation currently available to landowners who provide habitat, public access, or hunting opportunity or who experience legitimate damages from public wildlife, including the shoulder seasons, the hunt damage roster block, 454, landowner permits, the ability for one hunter to shoot up to three elk per year. Um, but for those who refuse to use these programs, continue to hoard elk and then claim the only solution is transferable and sellable bull tags, it's hard to claim, or it's hard to call that situation anything less than an attempt to privatize and commercialize public wildlife. All that said, we sincerely look forward to continue to work with the committee here to decipher between the programs um, and the landowners who are seeking equitable solutions and the ones that are leading us down the dangerous path of privatization and commercialization of a public resource. We would like nothing more than to remove these words from our vocabulary as well. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Hope you have a good lunch and we'll talk to you this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Perrin. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Mr. Chair, that concludes the commenters. Okay. Question, did I miss Don? Do you have any comment? I'm not missing. Okay. <laughs> um, I do want to ask Marcus a question. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, let me first say for the record, Marcus Strange, just like it sounds, representing the Montana Wildlife Federation. So just quickly, Marcus, in regards to um, the elk uh, coalition and the symposium and the elk citizens advisory council, how do you see from MWF and that uh, the progress this year in regards to uh, addressing the questions and improving re relationships in this venue? How do you see that at this point and any particular strong movements? Mr. Chairman, that's a fantastic question. I think going back to the symposium itself, uh, that was a really diverse group that came together. And um, we, not only in terms of the uh, panelists, but also in terms of the people that showed up and that were in the room. And so I think that was a really great starting point to, uh, you know, crossing the aisle, coming together and making some progress on these issues that plague everybody. Uh, moving forward, you know, if, if you haven't, I would recommend you go look at the report. There were some really good recommendations that came out of that symposium. Um, those, uh, those proposals are very collaborative. They're things that benefit both the sporting community as well as the landowner community. And so I think as we move forward, there's going to be more discussions. Um, there's already been talk about doing a follow-up meeting for that. And then as we get closer to the um, legislature, um, the coalition has plans to put out uh, more recommendations, continue to ground truth those recommendations with the public. And, um, you know, I'm here representing the Montana Wildlife Federation today, so I wasn't completely prepared to talk about details, but um, what I can tell you and uh, from the conversations that I've had with the folks that are in the leadership team for the coalition is that um, they want to continue that collaborative process for being very transparent, uh, putting out a lot of information and getting input from the public. So uh, what I would say for this committee, as well as anybody listening and watching, uh, go look at that report that the coalition put out and get us your feedback on those recommendations. Um, that would be the best thing that the public could do to 
uh, continue to uh, engage on that process. So did I answer your question? Yeah, and I would, you know, that's kind of where, you know, I've been hoping it would get to, and we'll see, I guess, the real fruit of that coming in 23 in the spring, um, how we can move together more effectively um, from each aspect of the, of the equation. Absolutely. I mean, when we went around here in the morning talking about what we see at home and we look at, you know, us as hunters and how it all works, you know, that, that part of the equation is so important and how it communicates naturally, I think, is the, the question going forward. How well is that going to happen in the future when it regards behavior, relationships, ethic, all of it? I don't think we can ever have enough boots on the ground to solve all those issues without hunters being the big part in making sure we do it well. Absolutely. And Mr. Chairman, may I add one other thing real quick? I just wanted to acknowledge that several members of this committee um, participated in various ways. Um, Mr. Albus, um, not here, but you know, he was part of one of the panels and several other members attended. And I just wanted to acknowledge and thank this committee, not only for the work you do here, but I don't think you get enough credit for the work you do outside of these meetings. And, and so I just wanted to say thank you for that. And uh, it's one of those fruits that you mentioned, you know, we're coming together and trying to find solutions. So thank you to this committee for that. Thank you. So any final comments? We'll head to lunch. All right. So we will uh, take a break until 1.15 and re-adjourn then. All right. Thank you, everybody.
ya. <clears throat> Okie doke, thank you. Well, thanks for lunch. It's a good lunch. Beats Jimmy John's by a long ways. <laughs> Nothing wrong, Jimmy John's. Chili O's, that was good. Yeah, Ray and I enjoyed the mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, we'll leave it at that. All righty, um, I think Hope has handed out a little uh, updated financial information on the block management 100 day calculation. Mr. Chair and members, uh, Lena Havron provided an update to the document she handed out this morning. She realized in the column that's one, two, three, four in labeled number of participants at max at $25,000. Um, that information there was not correct. It was a carryover from a different table, which is your follow-up document, um, looking at um, participants who are at the max at $15,000, not $25,000, $15,013 mm -hmm. a day. So um, just making a slight correction there. Um, so use this second black and white version for your reference in the future. Um, and then this second document that I passed out is the follow-up to the discussion this morning. So you can see that calculation of how many participants would be at the max at various levels. That's the information he, she had on hand and the calculations she had made. Good, any comment on that? Seeing none, was there? Are, are you on, Cindy? Thank you. Bright green. Probably with good. Um, I so for twenty five thousand dollars for thirteen dollars per day, it's twenty twenty participants, right? Correct. But at eighteen dollars per day, at twenty five, it's forty six. It goes up because the number of total payments has increased because of the five dollar per day difference, and so eighteen dollars a day, well, getting it gets more people to the cap. They would have been below the cap at $13 a day, but with the additional $5 per 100 day, it increases their total payment. And so they are now at or over the cap. Okay. Any further comment? Dale? Well, not, I just have a, a quick question for Jason. One thing that really surprised me on here is the number of people in region three that are above or at the cap or above. And I would have thought region three would have had some of the less numbers. Is, is that largely elk hunters? That's correct, it's elk. Oh, wow, okay, thank you. And you've got urban populations, lots of people too that, I mean, you'll have Bozeman coming to Townsend and Helena coming to Townsend and Wilsaw and everywhere in between. Region one coming too. Region one, well, there's, there's, region there's, just a, there's a lot of urban, there's a lot of people in Western Montana that, that utilize the opportunity. And that goes to your variable on satisfaction. It really does. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks for the update. All right. We're going to jump again with Jason into uh, a la carte season sign up. Correct, Amundo? No. Under 115. Um, Mr. Chair, that's just a broad category of other concepts and considerations the committee might, might want to bring forward. You've previously mentioned, for in, instance, a la carte season sign up and that BMA quality experience discussion and in your May meeting had said you wanted to chew more, more on those in August and we didn't really get to them in August under the other considerations. So they're there simply as memory joggers. Okay. Um, Sorry, Jason. No, I think that's that's fine. Yeah. Our topic we've talked about and talked around is uh, alternatives to money, right? That's a I don't know if that's a conversation you want to talk about now. Um, but it, yeah, as far as other other, other alternatives to incentivize in, in opening up hunter access opportunities, okay. this would be a good time to do that. All right. So 
before we do that, um, I just want to be clear with uh, the director. Are we still looking at 1.30? That's the last I knew, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So just be aware that potentially at 1.30, uh, the director will be joining us to discuss uh, a couple issues, as noted. Okay, so on the a la carte, any discussion to bring forward from the past for any members in that regard? Dale? I know one of the concerns that I brought up and I think it was um, reiterated by somebody else for lock management signups on some of those that require um, you know, the type two where you call in and reserve spots that people would call in and, uh, you know, at 7.30 on the day and the, and the places were full for the entire season and really had led to some frustration. I just guess I'm, I would like to ask the department, what are you doing about that? I mean, I, that's a harsh question, but I mean, <clears throat> is there, you go to hunters and ask about their hunter satisfaction when they're out there, but is there a way to reach those people um, or try to collect some information from those that called up and said, gosh, we called in here on day one, an hour after it opened and we, and there are all these slots for five parking areas for the entire big game season are all closed. That's just doesn't make sense. Um, well, is there a way to to manage that or or maybe to work through some of that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a common question we get probably annually. I mean, it's property specific, so every year it's a little bit different. One of the ones we dealt with even just, I think last week was an antelope hunter wanting to get on and that was what the lander had told him. And so we looked back through the permission slips and ensure that yes, in fact, it's been different hunters every year. It wasn't just the same people coming back because that's another common complaint we get is that it's just, but reserved in advance for the same people every year and, and I never get a chance to go. So we, we deal with that. And then in terms of a volume or solutions right now, what we've done with a couple of properties is turn them into more of a lottery. And so we'll take phone calls for a week or a day for this property and then we'll randomize that list to say, here's the preferred order. Um, <clears throat> in absence of some kind of IT solution, it's it's been that yes. Yeah. So, I mean, we we've had uh, even up to probably five years ago, we would about crash the phone lines in Travis's region with number of hunters that are trying to call just even the agency to try and get a reservation, and, and we get complaints of you know I've spent hundreds of hours or hundreds of called hundreds of times and spent hours and hours to find out my preferred uh, opportunity is not available. But for some of those properties, we have gone to a a call for this day, and then we'll randomize that list. Um, we're also working on potentially some some pilot opportunities for some reservation properties, but that's what we're trying to do is balance that. Is is if you get a lot of demand, we'll go to a, a lottery draw or move it move the reservation date off the main date or something like that. And I, I appreciate that, and that was going to be a follow up question or comment I had is that I've heard from numerous people calling into the Region Seven office on the first day, and they they just never can get on. And I, I've been in that office, and the phones are continuously ringing so I, I i mean it's it's to no fault of the department they're doing the best they can but i wanted to ask about the possibility and, and you already alluded to it. it's like yeah we're going to take reservation you can call in email or whatever and after one week then we're going to put these into a drawing and uh and that's how we're going to decide and uh, the other thing with that is there's a lot of people that work and the, you know that two hours when you can call in to sign in, they're, they're in a meeting or they're, and they don't have that opportunity. Well, okay, it's noon on the first day, they call in and the places are, are filled up. So I like the idea of, of that lottery type system. I, I think that provides some opportunities to some people that may not otherwise have that. Thank you. Everett. I, I wanna echo what Dale says, but I wanna use, um, I want to be respectful, but use stronger language because I have just given up on trying to call in and get a reservation. Um, I don't do it anymore and haven't for years. And 
uh, the the availability of technology out there today, whether it's with our new app or our new um, website system, it blows my mind that we just do not have that availability <clears throat> now. Um, and so, again, I'm trying to not be disrespectful, and I, I understand the the processes that we have to go through within the department to get things established. But I, I just I would love to see that become a reality instead of something that we've talked about. I know I've talked about for, for four years now. And, and I think I want to stop there before I put my foot in my mouth and say something I shouldn't, but I'm just really strongly, um, I have strong feelings about this that uh, I would love to see addressed at some point. Well, uh, I'd like to make a motion that we recommend that. Is that something we want to do? So, so clarify your motion, your recommendation. My recommendation is that the department um, look into developing a online um, application and scheduling um, program to alleviate these problems. So everybody has a fair and equitable. Equitable. I love that word. Equitable for reservations. <laughs> yes. on type twos. Yeah, on type two. Further discussion? Everett? <clears throat> Can I amend it to say something like, we'll implement by 2023 season? <laughs> so you can do whatever you want to do. I, I just I, I just know that we've talked about it a lot. And, you know, like with the app, we've got phase one done, but we don't know what phase two is or what it's going to be in it or even when it's going to roll out. And and so I know there's a lot of technology pieces moving here. and We're building a lot of back end stuff, but I also know I can go on Airbnb anywhere in the world right now and get something and have a reservation. So I know there's technology out there that we can harness in some way. I just don't want to, I don't want to leave it that open-ended. I, I would like for there to be some kind of uh, urgency attached to it rather than just look into this. Cause I think that we already are. Great point. So I would have a question for clarification from Jason is in regards to, as Everett has pointed and others have pointed out, we've been talking about when and if a platform is created through a new system that may, shall, or will come at some point in time. So in the interim between the may, shall, will, um, first of all, what's that? period looking let like. me step in front of that one mr chair nice try though it was pretty good one <laughs> it was too obvious you're gonna have to try a lot harder than that. Uh -huh. um so we i hear you believe me and i'm advocating for the same as much expediency as we can get again we have our parameters between getting approvals through the state it um division and at the Department of Administration and the governor's office. There are multiple levers, levels of approval, including our own director's office. So where we're at right now, um, phase one, release one of XMT is concluding. The contract expires at the end of the year. We're working toward um, release two. It's going to be focused, as I understand it, on uh, the ALS database and rebuilding that. Um, and that's been what the governor's office has signed off on moving forward with, in addition to the commission's request about having har mandatory harvest reporting for e-tags. That's a, um, a priority the commission has put forward that wasn't necessarily in the priority the department had. And so that's a different layer of consideration in this. Um, and so um, it's expected I think roughly once the contractor's on board to take about a year to build that database, rebuild that ALS database piece. And then after that, we can work toward rebuilding the block database for our contracts. All of this is, I think in May, I talked about we're building a foundation and release one has been the foundation. There are some additional foundation blocks that have to go on top of that before we can get all the functionality that we want. And we'll try and fly in other components as soon as we can on top of that foundation piece 
what the most current discussion has been related to your question today is um, we are hoping to pilot a reservation, online reservations in the next biennium for block. I cannot promise 23 hunting season. I hope we can get there. I can't promise it. Right now we're refining the business case for review by the director's office. They had some specific follow-up questions. Um, and so we're working on that to get to them, to get the green light from the director's office. Still has to go through SITSD in the governor's office. Um, there are a lot of things that I honestly don't have the IT understanding to explain well, but in the conversations with our CIO, Jess Plunkett, in talking about some of the functionality we'd look for, I assumed that a res online reservation system would automatically get us to geofencing and um, automatic check-in. That's not necessarily the case um, due to things related to if you have cell service at the time and connectivity. Part of release one with the e-tags is they had to build the mobile application so it had offline capability and um, getting that piece built for a reservation system so that you could automatically check in while you were offline um, is a big question mark. There are some other pieces in the consideration in the conversation we had about different kind of equity. So for folks um, who might not be as tech savvy, um, uh, folks with various learning disabilities, et cetera, how do we still preserve reservation opportunity for them? Um, and so a pilot system would not likely be all online, it would still provide opportunity and avenues for other folks to get in if they're not someone who can use online, for instance. It's why we still have paper license applications. Um, so those kinds of considerations, there is a big web here. I'm hoping we could have a pilot. Sooner than later, I can't promise 20. So in that regard to that pilot, you said 23? For hunting season fall that's that was if everything goes super fast and well that would be ideal i can't promise that can i follow and that would be a pilot likely in a region or two not statewide <clears throat> Everett. so looking at the website um we I, I think it would be very helpful to know what phase two is going to be or what we're looking at i don't see that on the website for communication purposes or a timeline on that so that would be helpful for me to be able to see or expect what's coming next. But I have a real concern that we are years into this now and our functionality is minimal. And you're, you're talking about year or two year um, benchmarks before we get to the next phase of functionality. And then at what point are we just obsolete again? We got to call no joy and scrap it again. And so I, I look at the functionality of of Calchemy and other places. And while I understand we wouldn't own it, I also understand that we would have immediate functionality right now. And, and, and so again, I just, I get kind of spun up about this because I've been following this since 2018 and, and you're right. Not everybody's got a phone, but 90% of us have smartphones these days. And so when I think about what we could be doing and all the other everything else that could be taking place within that app or the new website that would increase our customer service, but also biological information that we could carry or just the ability to um, hunt better for lack of better words. Uh, I'm really concerned that it, it is, it is moving at such a, a slow pace. Mr. Chairman, I never, I, all I can say is I hear you. I, I can't make anything magically better and, and really the department can't either. Yeah. Any additional comments, questions, discussion? Just for a question for clarity on that. Wasn't that part of the le last legislative process on the app that you guys, we had to make our own or can you add light to that? Um, so Mr. Chairman and, and members, um, boy, I'm going to, I wish I had Jess or, Lena here to look at and remind me exactly what the appropriation was from last session. So the money was appropriated. Um, there were certain parameters of, about what that appropriation covered. Um, it, for, it did not include the uh, 
say, the block online reservation system. So a different funding source, for instance, has to, that's part of the equation, finding that. I think I have that solved for a pilot project, assuming we can get the IT functions in place. Um, but the, um, sorry, I'm just, there was a different thing I wanted to say in response to what you said. Um, the, yeah, and so you can get the appropriation and the authority, but you still, that does not guarantee you that the SITSD and the governor's office sign off or that it, everything, that all the other lay, layers of green light are put in place. So you get the authority and then you have to go through the rest of the process. So it's not guaranteed. Question, Jason, how many type two block managements are there? You know, I know that's throwing it out there. And out of those, <clears throat> how many reservation assistance requests are there within that? Any idea? I'd have to look up the exact number, but I know the department probably takes reservations for block management areas and conservation easements. We're probably about 65 BMAs where we're taking reservations for mm -hmm. between agency staff and then technicians on the ground that meet you have to go on site to meet with a technician to get permission or um, again, conservation easements as well. We, we handle the reservations for some of that. Um, probably roughly in there, but I'll get you the number on how many type twos exactly we have. Yeah, I don't know that I need that. I was just curious kind of what that looks like. And then um, how many of those types of requests or would you estimate the department is not able to accommodate at this point uh, regionally? It's hard to say. I mean, because, um, well, I guess. I mean, because some landowners want to take that reservation and they want to have that face to face interaction. And regardless, if we had an online system, they wouldn't want to give that up. Right. Um, <clears throat> I know it seems like annually we have this discussion with landowners and, and they would like us to do more of the work, whether that be physically take a reservation or some kind of system. <clears throat> and, and if we can't do that, then the landowner says thanks, but no thanks. Not going to do it. And I would, and I, I can't say it's like 10 a year. Um, it's, it's less than, probably less than that. But I know there's the conversation that happens annually of, can you guys, can you guys do all the work? Can you guys take all the reservations? I want to limit it, but can you guys handle it all? And if we have space, we will. Um, if we have call center lines, for example, in region four, we, we've used some region six properties on the region four call center and same with region seven. So we'll, we'll, do where we can, but there are properties that get turned down on an annual basis. So with that in mind, I mean, <clears throat> it seems to me like we could make a recommendation as Paul Everett proposed um, for an interim solution specifically and singly for reservations, realizing, you know, in, in the long run, you want to get all the data check-in, access, how many days, harvest reports, all that. Is that really necessary for our purpose with this discussion, knowing that in the end game, that's the goal? I just throw it back to you, Paul and Everett in that regard. So if there's an outside service that can be used for a period of time until this happens, just a recommendation to pursue that. Uh, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I think I still think we just should recommend it, no matter what, whether we have a, a time frame in there or not. I, obviously, they are working on it, but I think it's just it's just um, a little nudge, maybe to say we. It helps if we support it, and I think it's important that we do get to that point someday. Okay, sooner the better. <clears throat> Dale, I like Paul's idea that we encourage them to go forward with it. I think we need to be a little bit cautious about saying incorporate what you can now. And my concerns with that is, so we have an online system that allows a person to, to sign up and they get signed up, but there's not a component for them to be able to go in and say, you know, we're not going to show up and, and that component isn't a part of it, well, then that really creates some frustration where the landowner doesn't have those people in. They, there's not a, 
an ability for other people to come in. So I like your idea, but it, I think it needs to be well thought out in terms of what are the minimum that we need Criteria. to have in there and not just simply sign up. But to your point, you can sign up for a hunter education class and not show up, but that's still the process. It's not perfect, but it happens every class. Different issue. I think um, like doctor's appointments and stuff, they they text you and they say, you know, want you to confirm it. So yeah, I think that would be a good way to do it. Right. And that way we can, if, some, if they're not gonna come then. Oh. So how would we word a recommendation? I think I'm going to decline on this one. Yeah. So, Everett, would you like to consider wordsmithing? Um, as a first stab, uh, strongly recommend that we expedite our online reservation system within the current planned ecosystem so that we're not doubling up and then teaching somebody a new system in two or three years when we get it launched or whatever, but maybe rise it up in the priority level of the development. Um, and, and again, thinking out loud, Mr. Chair, I, I don't even know if that would be the number one thing I'd put on my app development wish list, but it, it's definitely, I think, something that, that needs to be there. Did that just muddy the waters? That was really bad. <clears throat> um, briefly re rewriting that expedite an online reservation system, interim system to meet current need from hunters and landowners on type two block management. <clears throat> this is again a very simple recommendation that only carries its own weight at the moment <clears throat> it's just a statement well and just making this relatively simple then it puts the responsibility on jason and hope staff and the regions to say what are the minimum components? Maybe the second iteration, we can pull some of this other information in, but what is it that we have to have on the, the initial layout? And instead of us trying to say, okay, you need to have check-in or, or reservations and check-in, take it to them and say, okay, iteration one, this is what we want. And having that encouragement for them to do that in an expedited manner might be a, good enough <clears throat> additional comments Everett no I, I I like that I mean we're not going to get it done tomorrow so you know I don't want to I, I want to leave that to the developers and I know we've got stuff like GPS privacy laws that we'd have to wade through on some things so I don't know what other hurdles we might get into but saying something like can we get this done quicker than <clears throat> 2024 or five Okay. Donna's writing. Have you condensed anything, Donna? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we do have our director here. Um, we can come back to the definition that we want to propose if we're good with that. You have some notes? Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> Everybody good that? Yeah. Okay. We're not dropping that. Okay. <laughs> so switching gears. No, continue on. Just some your observed for a while. Stay in the I don't I don't think. <laughs> um so I think two 
direct uh, areas where we're interested in hearing from you, Director Warsick, is uh, landowner preference and um, the bonus point discussion. At your preference for beginning. So what are you looking for for the bonus point discussion? So our last uh, meeting, we put forward the concept of offering a bonus point, bonus point for taking the Hunter Landowner Stewardship Updated Program. Yeah. And we were going to look at what those consequences of that bonus point might be. Well, it all depends on what you're looking for. <clears throat> There's a lot of issues. Anytime you add bonus points to it, it, it adds a lot of confusion for people. So if you're gonna, are we looking at doing a, a one-time bonus point for one species when you pick it? Are you looking for lifetime? I mean, all those things come into play. And um, what are you trying? What are you trying to gain from that? Are you trying to get an incentive, incentivize people to participate, or what? What is the driving force on this? Correct. Just <clears throat> incentivizing. Um, you know, honestly, I think it would be a lot of hassle to get it done right. And be able to track it from the, the bonus point perspective. And we're actually going through an audit right now. I just did the introduction on it um, about two weeks ago, I think. We're having the whole bonus point system audited right now to, to see how it works and making sure we're doing it the correct way. So I'd really like to see what that does before we even discuss bonus points any further on this. Um, one of the things I did think about coming over here, and we talked about before. If you want recognition for somebody that's completed this, we can easily put that on the license and have it reflected on their what they carry on their phone or anything like that, or show to a landowner that they've completed it. So they'd have something there to show that the class has been taken and that they invested something in that. And the goal isn't the goal to try to get landowners to appreciate that they've taken this, this course. I mean, isn't that kind of your motivation? One of them. What's the other motivation then? Well, I think. As far as the bonus point, it's it's to answer the question that's come historically with zero to low participation in the program. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, the two options were to incentivize it in a way to get more participation or to require it. Okay. And I'm not sure how having it noted on your on your conservation license that you've taken it and communicating that to the landowner. Um, get you there. So how does a bonus point get you there? It gets you there just to get more people involved? It's totally to get them to do it. <clears throat> okay. Um, so what were you thinking? Were you thinking about a, a one-time shot or to get it forever or what? I mean, do I get, do I apply it to a moose? Do I apply it to moose even goat or sheep? At our August meeting, I think the question that when this discussion <clears throat> came up, we asked Hope and her staff to come back to us and say, what's reasonable? Mm -hmm. um, and part of the thought, Hank, was the, the class that's offered right now online, a seven-year-old could pass that class without ever taking the, the test. And it, right. it's, so, it's so simplistic. If you're going to offer a bonus point to somebody, there's got to be some something of substance there that they're going to garner from taking the class and then is it a lifetime bonus point is it a bonus point for for one animal um what do you do for the people that only hunt deer and they don't need a bonus point and and it, there were just a lot of questions concerns and we, <clears throat> before we made a recommendation what came out of it was let's go back and have the department provide some feedback to us in terms of uh, what would be reasonable from the department. I don't know if that's helpful or not. Yeah, that, that helps a lot. <clears throat> so I, I guess what would be reasonable from my perspective from the department issue is a one-time bonus point when you complete it and pick a species. So you could use it for whatever species you wanted to, pick one bonus point and add it to it. Because you're taking a class once, continue, and then let's say in the future you develop a, an additional class or something more to it. And I agree with you, Dale, that it has to be some meat in this course, and you're working on that, correct? 
to make the course more and worthwhile and have something. Because if you're going to reward them with something, then there should be something that they have to go through. And it can be a combination of both. We can do a bonus point on one, but this, this lifetime would be a, would really be a, a pain to kind of track it. You know, because what the law says then too is once you once you're successful in that species, let's play this out. I put in for a sheep and get an additional sheep bonus take because I've taken this course. I get it. My bonus points are then put to zero. Now, if you do a lifetime, how does that work? So that's why you stay away from the lifetime part of it. So one time only is what I would recommend if you're going to do this and pick the species. I don't think it matters to us on that as far as putting it in there. And then if you want to, we can do a combination of both. You can do the, the one time, and then you can also display it on your license. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that to get that out there, to get people know that you've, you've committed to do this, that you, you care about it. But once again, I think that the course needs, to your point, needs to be brought up to a level that is worth something, that just not a, the average person could take and just whip right through it and get a bonus point. Does that answer your question? Pretty much. Yeah, no, I that was that's, easy. That's very much what we were looking for in the last discussion about how valid the or complicated the bonus point question was as a incentive. Yeah. Well, and your guess is as good as mine is what's going to incentivize people to do this, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I know, I know since I've been in, we, we really tried to get that, that landowner sportsman relationship built up and anything we can do to get those people talking and working together is, is always a plus, so. Any other questions on that? Any other ideas for that incentive outside of a one-time bonus point, one species, Everett? Did we come to a conclusion? We did discuss this last time. If you draw using that point, can you go back, take the class again and get that point again? Or is it once <clears throat> and done forever? Any conclusion on that. I, the only thing in that regard I recall was that at some point within creating the update to the program, there needs to be a process to update the program on a periodic basis to make it current. So instead of waiting 10 or 15 years to do it, it gets reviewed within three years or whatever the number is. That's the only other comment I recall in that regard. What are you thinking? <clears throat> kind of what you were thinking, like the continuing it portion of it, like updating it. And how do you incentivize people to do it 10 years later? I've still got my point. I haven't drawn my cheap tag, so what do I care? But super tags, maybe, I don't know. Uh, throw that in the mix. Sorry. Uh, that could be a component of, of keeping that bonus point. It could be just a continuing education. You know, no different than if you're an insurance salesman to keep your license, you have to still go through another deal once a year, or once every couple of years, or whatever we wanted to, or wanted to do on that. To be clear, you, I don't believe you'd keep that bonus point. No, so what I'm saying is if, if you took the initial course once, let's say you have your robust course to earn your point, right? right. You go through a lot of hoops, it's, it's, it's in the weeds, right? It's, it's, there's a lot of learning. And then to maintain that bonus point that you earned, you have to do some sort of continuing education yearly. I mean, there's a million courses that we could do on ethics and relationship and harvest. And you, know, you pick the topic, there's, there's lots of small courses. You could continue the education because we talked about <clears throat> with, with youth, right? That's our, that's our number one thing is let's, let's train them up from the beginning so they're not doing bad things as adults. You know, by the time you're an adult, it's usually too late. So we have a kid that goes through a hunter's education course, they spend a whole week doing it, but then they don't do anything else the rest of their life. Why not build little, little continuing education pieces? Ever? Uh, I like the idea. <clears throat> I think in phase one, it might muddy the waters too much. And if we simplified this and, and went with just take it, you get your one point, and then the, the conversation turns to, do we make that lifetime or do we make it once and done <clears throat> and then renewable after you've drawn? Right. I, don't, I just, I kind of see maybe two different conversations happening, Drew. Mm -hmm. 
just kind of the outside looking in. It appears that you're kind of putting the cart in front of the horse. You're telling me about this this course you're going to have designed and how to reward people for it, but I don't know what the, the course is going to look like. So what are we, what is the reward depending on what the course is? So if it's a really in-depth course, is a bonus point enough? If it's not, is it too much? I mean, I think you have to have the course designed and you need some layout of how you're going to reward this thing or incentivize people to come and take it. Um, is that what you're... Fair. And so a little bit later, uh, Greg Lemon and Wade Cooper Ryder will be commenting on where that course stands right now. But to revisit where we were at is um, <clears throat> building that new version of the Hunter Landowner Stewardship Program, period. And then how, what do we do about it? What's it for? The concept we brought forth is we would incentivize that, that course nothing beyond that at this point in time, just simply the updated course and encourage today's hunter to take that course, recognizing that course. You've all given some input into that and Wade and uh, Greg have that. And, and we'll hear about that in a little bit where that stands, but that would be pretty much the end of that. One bonus point is what the director had just clarified for one species to take that course as an incentive, as a possible incentive. <clears throat> so we would have to get this through the legislature though as well. Right. We would have to have a sponsor and do that. Yep. So I don't mean to interrupt, I'm no. gonna ask a question. I got Representative, Lo Representative Logies here. And I, I know you and I had talked about, you were gonna to talk to the superintendent about getting some landowner sports relationship in the schools. Have you done more of that, sir? <clears throat> okay. Mr. Chairman, Representative Logie, could you come to the microphone so pe people online could hear you? Thank you. Representative Denley Logie, and I know better than that too. <laughs> uh, I, I have, uh, it, in the initial conversation, she was quite interested in trying to bring in something in your curriculum into the like fifth, sixth, seventh grade. Uh, because of the importance of land ownership, uh, stewardship of land for the for the youngsters to learn that. But no, I haven't gotten any any response of any kind of curriculum been been brought up, and and I haven't drawn anything up myself. But I do think even a group like this could try and incorporate something like that with the superintendent of schools as well. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Representative Logie. Dale. So, Chairman, Director, when we start talking about incentivizing, mm -hmm. taking these online trainings, and we start talking about bonus points. And in the past, we talked about making access into block management areas, make having a person take that a class before they could go on to block management, which I I would have some real concerns with. <clears throat> why don't we why don't we look at changing just the culture and saying, okay, in a five year period, you have to take this five minute or ten minute online class before you can get a license. And there's no incentive other than the fact that you can get a license. And I'm not talking about something where you have to come and spend a half a day or a day in a classroom. It's something that you're going online and taking a class, but you can't just skip through it. And maybe there's some questions or whatever, you know, five questions you have to answer at the end of the training. But I just look at it and, and I know everything's possible in terms of the, the bonus points and that, but it just seems to me if our goal is to try to improve the, the culture and the behavior of hunters, it's something that we need to work towards that is ongoing and it's required by everybody. Thank you, Dale. Any other comments? <clears throat> so again, what we presented in our <clears throat> in our report is where we're at. And 
I think um, all those things combined is what we've had all these discussions about. And it began really with the Hunter Landowner Stewardship Update as it as we all took it. Um, and you'll hear from um, Greg Lemon and Wade Cooper Ryder, their, their outline essentially looks at a 30 minute online course. Right now, if you take the Hunter Landowner Stewardship Program, it's an hour plus. <clears throat> Doesn't mention block management once. Maybe your access in, in Mile City is better. But um, so they do have that in process to present to us. It, it gets down to the question of you, you stand up that program so that course is available. They've developed it. What do you do about it? Do you incentivize it again or do you require it? You know, um, and, and that's kind of where we're at. I mean, in regards to the bonus point, I think what I'm hearing the director say is with an audit coming, maybe we should see what the bonus point system looks like after that. But if we offer one bonus point, one species, you use it once and you're done, um, that might be acceptable, if I hear that correctly. Mm -hmm. um, once again, that would have to go through the legislature to right. allow us to do that. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. So one of the things I would like to bring up, too, is there there is going to be a bill out there to revise the hunter safety education laws from uh, Representative Durham. And I've already talked a little bit about that. So when I took over, we had, um, we'd gone through a, a year or two years of COVID and we had our, and our, our education was all done online and completed. So when, <clears throat> when, I, when I took over, I had asked Wade and some other ones, I said, we can't go back on that. We got to continue offering that, but we can do them in person. Mm -hmm. And there was a big push to have the field courses in person. And I said, once again, we need to try to incentivize them. I can't clear conscience force somebody to do it when in two years we've done this and had more participation in hunter education we've had in the past. So uh, Representative Durner and I have talked about trying to bridge that gap with the in-person field course and maybe set it up where we have it done in a regional office or a ward to be able to administer that course. I mean, that, that final to them to show that they have you know, safety, they understand these things, stuff like that. So that, I just wanted to give this group a heads up. That is gonna be in on the radar for coming up at this session. That's one bill that's, uh, we'll, I'm sure will be introduced and uh, brought forward. So to kind of to your point earlier, Dale, is this online stuff, who do you know is really taking it? You know, that's been the question on this. We've got the online, online hunter education. Is it the parent taking the course or is it the kid when they graduate this thing? So. Just to add some more confusion to you guys. So I'm clear on that with Durham. Um, that's legislation to potentially require an in-person field day. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Or yeah, field day or a test. There a lack of a field day. Yeah. Curriculum to be determined. Correct. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Any other? So, that, so that's not specific to shooting. That's only specific to. I, I'm a little confused. Is that going to be specific to a field test where they shoot? No. Is what what is happening right now is they can take the online course for hunter education and not come to the field course. So. And I'm going to be brutally honest on this. One of the things that they always talk about, it's a hunter safety course. It's not a hand or a rifle course or anything that is for hunter safety, but they do teach weapon safety on this thing. And that's their concern with it as we do this. And from my perspective, that should be taught at home before you come to hunter education, gun safety. I mean, and I'm going to go off on, on a limb on this, but right now you can get your concealed carry permits because you've taken a hunter education class. And I don't know how many people have taken hunter education classes, but you don't deal with a handgun for your concealed weapon, but yet they use that to allow somebody to take a, that. So my, my concern is, <clears throat> is this, the, the field course should be, you know, have you, have you done this? Can you do this? And I tried to get Wade and 
The other one is to incentivize that to get the kids to come to it. Or it's up to the parent to, to take it in person if they, if they want to bring it in person. Once again, that's the parent's decision. Do they have to, they want the kid to go in person to do it or can they do it online? And from my perspective, we've done things with school and everything else online. We continue to do it. So it's an open opportunity, it's just more opportunity for people. So I knew I'd get pushed on that during the session and it's gonna come up. Did that, did that answer your question? Or did I just confuse you more. <laughs> Thank you, I understand. I, I guess I just don't agree that there shouldn't be a, a <clears throat> hands-on shoot um, requirement has, like there has been up till COVID. Thank you. Any further questions or on that issue? No. no. Okay. Um, and I think the other question we had um, was in regards to landowner preference, where we might stand at this point on that. You know, there really hasn't been anything brought forward on landowner preference. I thought there would be some some appetite to look at change in that. Um, <clears throat> I'll give I'll give a little history on how it how it changed from my perspective. So, landowner preference probably ten years ago, you had to get certified by a regional office that you in fact had property that was used used by the animal, and that whatever you're getting the preference for elk, deer, or antelope that you had record of that and we had a case come before us we're getting ready to go to um uh, to trial when we had a, a game where we was going to write a person up for getting landowner preference when in fact he shouldn't have applied for landowner preference so i uh had the attorneys look through it when we looked through all the landowner preference and basically we had been interpreting the law incorrectly it just basically says used by that we have to use by game it doesn't say predominantly or anything else in there. We had added all that additional information in on our rule setting and stuff like that. So <clears throat> what the case ended up coming up to was they're gonna write this individual a ticket for having landowner preference and not having elk on his property. And I, when I talked to the biologists, there were elk on the property. So we didn't have somebody sign off and we do this. So. What the, the opinion from Leo come out is that we just basically come down to we have to prove because right now there's elk all over the whole state. We've got to basically, if you put in for it, we've got to prove that you don't have elk on your property. And it doesn't say during a certain time or during hunting season or anything else, the law was that. So I was hoping that somebody would bring that up and we'd be looking at a, a better definition of this for landowner preference. It didn't happen. Now, that doesn't mean it may still not come out of the session. I just don't know of it anything out so far and we didn't propose anything <clears throat> but what that did is change the number of people applying for landowner preference so in the past you had people that were signed off in the regional office and there were some some issues with that too that depending on the regional office some would get permission and some wouldn't to put in for landowner preference so it wasn't wasn't applied consistently across the state well now it's kind of wide open so more people are putting in for it as more people put in for it the chances of getting landowner preference has diminished. And that's that's why you're seeing more and more of a kind of a button heads on this thing. People that used to get it all the time before and not necessarily not getting it now because there's a lot more people applying for it. Rich. Yeah. <clears throat> Just a clarification, uh, Mr. Chairman. Hank, um, the, uh, I, cause I don't know that I fully understand how some of it is written cause I've, I've kind of heard some people in my area talk about so you're a landowner that has elk on your property, but the property you want to hunt on is somewhere else. And so you put in for landowner preference. It doesn't, that you can go on any any property then that, I, can you clarify how yeah, that? Landowner actually, preference is only to the district that you have the land in. Okay, only- But it's, it's good, so it's different than a um, elk hunting agreement. It's not for your property, it's for anything in the district. Right. So I'm just, and I'm, I don't, I don't, I can't recall this. I'm just thinking, so, so I've got, so there's a neighbor that has 10 acres and the elk happen to go through his 10 acres or whatever. He puts in for land or a preference, but then there's, then in that same district, there's me and I've got 
80 acres in there all, and, and he has landowner preference. He gets drawn for the, he can, he, I'd have to get permission obviously, but it doesn't, it's just for that region, right? I guess I've, I've been hearing like there, and I don't, it's not specific to me. I just heard that there was someone who had very little land, but there were some elk they put in for landowner preference. And then they were, then they were going on other people's or asking to go on other people's to hunt and still got it for that area. Is that, that, is that yes. possible? I'm just, I, I don't, I don't know if I'm even stating it right. Yeah, so what happens is they put in for a hunting district and you may own, I think, what is the minimum now, Denley, 160? For, for elk, it's 640. Okay, sorry, I didn't. No, the law was changed last session to 160. For, for B, B, B licenses yeah. and, and experiencing department documentation yeah. damage. So other than that, it's 640. So it's a, it's a sectional land, but they can put in for that within that whole hunting district. They may be in an area where the elk run through once a year, come through there. But they can hunt all the national, or I mean, they can hunt all that land, BLM, all that stuff within that, or or private property if they get permission. So that's that's what the change, the big change was. And there's a lot more people that were applying for it now, hunting in competition. Clear as mud. Dale. So as I've thought through landowner preference, and of course the argument to allow a person to hunt anywhere in that district is the elk are on my property and then during the hunting season, they're off. Then I mean, I've heard that many times. One of the things you hear quite often is, yep, people come in and let them in, elk run off, they don't come back until the day after the hunting season and they're back. I still think that if a landowner has landowner preference, he should be restricted to the private land that he owns. And one way to possibly work around that is to say, okay, we'll issue you a landowner preference tag. You tell us the, the elk or the deer or whatever else, or they come back the day after the season, so then maybe maybe they get the benefit of of the season plus the shoulder seasons to shoot their animals and on their own property. They don't get year round, but maybe they get an extended season because I just think that there are instances where the number of animals they have on their private land is, is minuscule, but yet they have they have utilized that loophole to get preference for a landowner tag, and then they go to their neighbors 20 miles away to, to hunt whatever the species is. And, and I, would like, I would like the department to relook at some of the sideboards, and that's just through one possibility out. Thank you. Additional questions on landowner preference? Anna. Have we heard a lot of complaints about this? Not really, other than it's changed for the people applying. We're making it easier for landowner preference to apply this year. The last year we had it where they had to have basically a whole bunch of documentation. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to um, Emily about that. And Dustin and I both did that. Once you already got it documented, there's no need to keep on documenting as long as the land hasn't changed hands. So there, that was the only thing we heard about it from the landowners was it was such a pain in the butt to put stuff in. We're going to fix that for this year. But other than the use of it, the, you know, there are people that are unsuccessful that are used to getting it all the time because there's more people applying for it. Right. So that, well, and there's still a limit on how many they can get, isn't there? Yeah, it's 15 percent, up to 15 percent of the, the of the total goes to landowner preference. Correct. So with that clarification, if somebody does put in for landowner preference, the elk are not on their property during the season, but they have ripped down their fences and they have eaten their crops. And we are trying to make better relationships with landowners across the state. Why would we put these sideboards on? All good points. 
I believe Representative Logie had a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Danley Logie. Uh, that bill that came through last session, it was Senator Ankney that brought it and it brought it down to 160. And part of that, I know I was part of behind that discussion because in Western Montana, there are a lot of small acreages, but they get the amount of elk damage in their crops uh, in the spring and sometimes don't even get a crop because of that. I'm, I'm one of those, the home place is 390 acres. I would have fallen into that this year. I didn't put in for it. I was out campaigning and <laughs> missed the deadline. Plus, plus, I didn't really want to, since I took it, would take advantage of it. I didn't want it to look like I had pulled anything in there. But, but the idea there, Dale, on, on that is that there is the damage. And and now I'm surrounded by state and forest service. I sit right in the middle of that. But the elk do all the damage. They come and eat all of my fields. So part of this is that crop damage to the small acreages. We have quite a few up Nine Mile Valley. It's the same way. They come down and eat in the private land through the summer, take the crop out. And of course, the first hunter can see them and they're gone. Uh, and it and that's why the, the outside area, they're allowed to hunt on that as long as it's in the district. So it's it that was part of the justification of the bill as I presented it or in the House side, but Senator Ankeny presented it in the Senate side. Thank you. I would like to thank you for that. And um, it's not a wide open. It's you're not guaranteed that you're still put into that 15%. So I I think it's a very good bill the way it was proposed. Yeah, it, it's and it is an automatic that you even get that you have to put in and it has to show that I think it was two years, isn't that, Jason? The way it, you had show that the elk had had been on and not just been on, but some damage for for two years. So it, it's it's not a automatic just because you have 160 acres, you'll get it, and they walk through it once. True. Just one quick question uh, for clarity: Do you have to be a resident of Montana to apply for that landowner preference for elk? No. Thank you. But you do have to have a license in order to do it. So that's the other issue I think a lot of people miss is the non-residents are restricted to a certain number of licenses they can get. So if they're a landowner and they and they don't fall in that category of getting one of the licenses, they're restricted so they don't put in for landowner preference. So you see there's a lot of people that are saying, well, the, all the landowners get it. Well, they have to, the non-residents have to get the license first. And that doesn't take into consideration. So Cindy. Could you just refresh my memory on how it works in permitted areas? Is it still 15%? It's not, is it? Yes, ma'am, 15% of permits. And then 10% of that, the, the, the non-resident still applies a 10% of that too. So it can't go above 10%, no matter how they're issued. I guess my only question or comment, Director, was with the advent of uh, the HEAs, or the HAs, the HAs. whatever they are, 454s, yeah. um, how those two programs uh, impact each other or if they do in regards to numbers and quotas and all those concerns, and if anything needs to be done in that regard. Well, as far as the quotas, if there's an area that um, that isn't under a limited quota, we do, we have, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, we went an additional 10% above and beyond that quota. And then if it was, the number was higher than that, and then we went through a drawing for those people to get that done. So it's <clears throat> it's basically the landowner preferences within that, within that quota. The EHAs are an additional 10%, up to an additional 10%. Thanks again. Quick, quick question on that. Can they apply for the permit first and find out if they actually drew the permit and if they did not, can they then put in for yeah. the EHA? So essentially they get two chances at that permit? Yeah. yeah, they could, as long as you had enough acreage on the landowner preference okay. side. That's one of the things we've seen different with the EHAs is that they would be less than a section. So 
there there's opportunity there in a lot of places that would not qualify for a land or a preference in the regular draw, which in theory is district, which is district wide versus a smaller acreage through EHAs, but you're restricted to hunt your own land. Do we see any issue with those that do qualify having two opportunities to, to get that or has that not been raised as a red flag by anybody? I don't know about red flag, but it's it's legal to do as it is currently. I understand it's legal. I'm saying, is there anybody raising concern on on the fact that they're getting <clears throat> multiple opportunities? Not no, that I I've heard. Speak to that. I, I've I've heard the conversation, but I haven't. Not a just asking argument. the question. Yeah. No. the The conversation that comes up is the 15 percent for landowner prefer preference and the 10 percent on top of that. And is there any consideration of the quota within those two things? So. Clear as mud. Oh boy. <clears throat> Wait until we start talking. <laughs> Wait until we start talking mule deer next year. Yeah. Your turn's coming, Lee. <laughs> okay. Um, any other uh, concerns you'd like to address the council with in particular? No, I just, I, I really do want to thank everybody for their dedication and time on this. I. The PLPW has always been near and dear to my heart, so I really do appreciate you all coming here. And I, and I, I on purpose stayed away and let you guys come up with your own solutions and ideas and stuff like that. So I, I, I think, and I had to off to the chair, and and we, he's running everything. But uh, I'm I'm here for if you have any questions, any questions of me at all, I do that wherever I go. So nothing off. Ask me anything you want to know. So do we want to talk technology? No, <laughs> I can talk technology. You missed the previous discussion, Director. I imagine. Which Everett was trying to pin me to the wall. Which we're going to continue. Everett, are you working for Helchemy or whatever the hell that company is? No, and, and I, we, you and I talk about it enough that I, know. I don't want to even bring it up. Um, <clears throat> I do want to go back to Ed's resolution or something at some point. But, yeah, we will. Um, yeah, we have time. No, once again, I, I appreciate everybody on this. I think there's a lot of dedication and a lot of time commitment. People don't realize that until you sit on one of these things, how much it takes and and uh, how much you get beat up over it. Yeah, and a comment to you in regards to these folks, you know, in this period of time, I think as a group of people, we really, um, we have varying opinions, widely varying opinions. And I, I really, I, I know this, I've been partaking in it. It's a lot, a good amount of respect and ability to hear and listen and move forward in a positive manner. I, I yeah, I just want to say that with you present, it's been a good process to bring that together. And I think we'll do even better in the next go round. Well, I've talked to several of you and I said, you know, it's, you get people to agree everybody agrees on everything you're not getting anything done you have to have people that are willing to stand up for their opinions and and understand you gotta bump heads once in a while and come up with a good solution so i appreciate everybody doing that just a question uh, in regards to the um the game wardens and things like that since you're here and asking just hearing if you're hearing anything out there we actually had kind of uh, it was interesting to hear because it is kind of a double double-edged sword you know most of us <laughs> that are land or i think business we're always like no more government no more employee you know we're all we always talk about that but then when we talk about issues where we're having and when it's specific to this you know we're having some of this stuff in eastern montana or in my area or central montana where major influxes of hunters during hunting season and lack of game wardens and so just asking more or less because i know it's a it is a, a very controversial but it's a it's a balancing act, right? Between more FTEs payment and then people being, oh, we don't need more government officials. So just any any thoughts on on that conversation of, of I mean, we really are kind of in a, where we got all this land to manage and watch over and all this, and there's more and more push for it, but then really no one to really, you know, over, I, I guess, help oversee it or to help with that process. Any any thoughts on where that may even go in those discussions as we go into legislative session? Yeah, a great question. I just actually just went through a head auditors in this morning that I had to talk about about enforcement. And um, one of the questions that would come up with that about additional enforcement as our 
our challenges. You know, and I, the reason I put the parks and, and outdoor recreation together and, and hope under over that is bringing it together is, is we used to have, uh, like for example, in fisheries, we had the same people doing the same job as we had in wildlife and then in parks and they'd have backhoes and stuff passing each other on the road doing different jobs. The idea was to put them together, take care of everything we own. And that's wildlife management areas, fishing access sites, the parks, all that stuff and maintain them and keep them up to a high standard. Because what being criticized for if we have this, we got to take care of it. So that's just one side of the equation, which we're expanding on that. The other part is as the outdoor recreation grows and builds and gets away from traditional, we have to stand up for that as well. So yes, there, there, there will be pushes for it. I don't know how much from the department, but we're hearing it constantly from other groups saying we need more people. You're absolutely right. You, you don't want to build bigger, you know, bigger government, but there's a need because we got more people outside that we have to, for lack of a better term, police and take people safe and doing these things. So as that expands, we have to meet that need. And um, <clears throat> I, I, one of the things I did when I went around the state last year, I really enjoyed, I got, got to go to region six and it was really fun because I got pretty well beat up about how the, all the out of state were coming to region six from like region seven, they had region seven license plates, region three license plates. They consider them out of staters coming to region six. And <clears throat> I said to her, I said, well, Andrew McKean's here. I said, would you stand up Andrew? So Andrew stood up and I said, you've been writing about this for the last 15 years about how great Montana is. Here's my surprise look that they're all coming to where you told them to come. And uh, that we've been discovered. I mean, you look at it, you look at the hunt talk, you look at this thing, as soon as you get a big bull in Ashland, everybody knows about it. And it, it's like that, that old thing about, you know, no tell them Ridge, you shouldn't tell them where you're hunting, but we got people out there making money telling them where to hunt. And here's our surprise look that they're taking advantage of it. And now we've got bills to look at how do we cut people down? How do we cut back on stuff? Um, it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be an interesting session, I think. I appreciate the question, but any other questions? Yes, sir. Policeman, but the here about a month ago, the sheriff's department took a fairly good cop car and parked it alongside the highway. Blew up a dummy in it? No, no, they didn't have a dummy in it. Oh. It was just sitting there pointed toward the highway. It's surprising how many brake lights come on that never <laughs> did before. You know, so maybe you need some blow up plastic game wardens or something. Well, oh. <laughs> you wouldn't need an FTE or anything. Just move them around. The deputy director and I are coming back from. Uh, where the hell were we? Up in Whitefish and coming back and uh, driving along. We went through a couple little towns and there were cop cars sitting there with the blow up dummies in the front seat. I thought, he says, you haven't seen them before? I said, no. And they have a little handlebar mustache on them and stuff. I'm like, wow, pretty neat. Yeah. Good idea, Lee. Yeah. 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 Yeah, nothing like seeing a car that looks like a Montana Highway Patrol yeah. car going down the interstate. Just slow you down. <laughs> is it or isn't it? Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Director. For yeah. Any other? I'll be here for a little bit more. Can you anything else? You gonna have these guys talk? Yes. I think uh, they're at three. Oh. Unless Greg's here. See, Greg. Uh, Paul, did you? Um, I was going to ask about corner crossing. No, <laughs> you can ask what you want, Paul. I know. I he's Paul. I do. I do want to give a. I do want to say something really. I really appreciate. It. I don't know if you guys have got a chance to see this, Marcus. You want to talk about? It? Have you talked about this thing at all? Okay. I just. I really appreciate what they did, put that together. Um, the other thing that's some of you are probably seeing is that public trust, what is a public trust coalition? What do you call it? You know what they're calling that? For the record, Marcus Strange with the Montana Wildlife Federation again. Um, I'm gonna take that as a two part question. First of all, uh, we, we did talk about that report. I'm glad you brought an example, folks. This was the report that the uh, symposium produced and would highly recommend you check it out. Um, the, the public trust coalition is not something MWF is involved in. 
Um, but it's another great group out there that's trying to find some solutions. So I can't speak to that, but it's uh, it's a separate group. So, so Mr. Director. I appreciate that, Marcus. So that the, the coalition, when, <clears throat> it's one of the things that I, I started when I took over as director is understanding our role under the public trust. And uh, I've been trying to explain that as, as a department, what our role is. And as a wildlife managers, our, our role is to provide the best information for the trustees, i.e. the legislature commission, to make the best informed decisions based on input from the public and making sure we do that and work with people to get together on that. So my goal has been really trying to be very, very transparent on everything we do, change the commission meetings so people can interact with the commission. I don't know if you've been paying attention to them or not, but we now do it at the Capitol. We do it through Zoom. It's reached a lot of people. If you watched the Wolf one last time, that was four hours of people commenting on it. Uh, the chair does an amazing job. Uh, it's, it's, it's really good and people are really getting heard. And uh, what I always tell these people is they're listening just because they don't necessarily agree with you doesn't mean they didn't listen to you. And um, so it is a good opportunity and we are slowly changing that to get more and more input from the public. And that's, to me, that's where it all belongs is the public is what drives what we do. It's up to you to tell us what, what you want done. We'll tell you what the science says, what we can, what the sideboards are, what we can do as far as numbers and stuff like that. It's up to you to decide what the social is, how to hunt them and things like that through the session, through the regulation setting. And um, that's the other thing we did work on is trying to simplify the regulations. And apparently we did that. Did you read the article in the paper? It yeah. surprised me. I read the headline and I didn't want to read the article. And then I read the article and said we did a pretty good job. So kudos. Yeah. Yeah. M Mr. Chair, while I enjoy standing up here, I'm going to go sit back down. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Marcus. Yeah, if you didn't read, I think it was in all the papers here just a few days ago. Yeah. Um, University of Montana did some research on what uh, inhibits hunting and, and such, and regulations can tend to be that, where they're confusing, onerous, et cetera. And uh, they found that Montana's regulations, as much as we think they're onerous and challenging and over-detailed and complicated, they found that across the West, that wasn't necessarily true, that Montana's regulations were actually a little easier for hunters to understand. Yeah, and, and we have a lot more opportunity. Which is sort of shocking to hear, wasn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Thank well, you. thank you all. Thanks for joining us. So, we were uh, on that question of electronic reservations. Everett and Dawn, I think maybe we're flushing something out. Well, I hope you didn't leave it all on my shoulders. Totally, Donna. Yeah. <laughs> um, in writing this, I also took into recognition that the department is working hard to try to come up with a solution for us. And I didn't want to limit it to just type two, because as changes are going through, if we do a master hunter program or a non-violation ranch or whatever um, comes out of the strainer per se, I did not want this to be limited. So um, up for comments, uh, current PLPW council recommends that the department to develop an effective online reservation system that will meet the needs of the BMA landowners and participants. We encourage the department to do this to prioritize this request to launch this site in as timely a manner as possible. It sound okay? Everett? Yeah, I think I'm okay with that. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the department's not deaf. They've definitely heard from me and they've heard today. Um, and I, I don't think we need to belabor, but I think as a committee that some, some kind of directive like that would be helpful. Recommendation, not directive. Strong suggestion. Two things. One, Donna, would you repeat it so I make sure I've accurately captured it, even though we have the audio recording as the true minutes. But then number two, director for your awareness and Everett's comments earlier 
um, he expressed interest in the department updating the public on, through our website on what the timeline and next steps are for XMT development at, you know, when we're able to share what phase two would be released to um, getting something out there to help answer people's questions. Donna? Would you please? <clears throat> Current PLPW Council recommends the department to develop an effective online reservation system that will meet the needs of the BMA land, uh, landowner and the participants. We encourage the department to prioritize this request to launch the site in as timely manner as possible. Thank you. He asked what I'm surprised you didn't. Timely. Timely as defined by what? Well, if it's defined by Everett, then. Um, I think Everett supplied minus two years. <clears throat> yeah, and I think, yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to, just my little quick, I think timely is so arbitrary. So, you know, you, I realize 2023, you can't, and, but, but maybe if we said 2024, it's not like we won't be coming back. If we don't hit that deadline, it's not like we've, I mean, it's not like we've lost something, but I mean, it, it certainly gives some teeth to doing that. Maybe it's 25. I don't know. I'm just, but timely when computers being, or software is being talked about. So. But if I change it to, we encourage the department to prioritize this request to launch this site by the 2024 season. That's at least a goal. There you go. <clears throat> Just a little background on the XMT. And I, I appreciate that when we get the uh, phase two release going out, we'll do this. I, th I think there's been a lot of confusion that everybody expects that we put this money that we're gonna have this grandiose system out right away. And you and I have talked about this. We had a system that was built in 99 and then foundation, we had to rebuild that whole foundation and change things over. So that's what the first part of this whole build was. We added a few things to it. The next build will be adding these pieces on there and we're still, we have to go through contractors and do things like that as well. So we're in that phase right now, but I, I will be talking with the governor in about 20 minutes and, um, and with Dustin, I'll, I'll see if I can get some more of an uh, uh, an idea when that we can anticipate that coming out. Yeah, and I think I would like you to know, Director, if you didn't hear it earlier, that I, I used the app to validate this past week. Oh, and, good. And everything went very, very well. And I took screenshots along the way because, again, I, I don't want you to hear that that you are doing nothing right, but I think you are. I think there's some really good things, some great potential from the app. Uh, I would just like to to know what's coming, and and I would like it to be sooner than later. Right. Well, Everett, I can tell you, so would we. You know, we'd like to have it like yesterday on the stuff we'd like to do. So, it, um, you know, I, I'm right there with you. We want to get this thing done, but we wanted to get it done right too. And the other thing I'd like to see is is we're going to talk about is I would like to add mandatory reporting in. And I tried to do that a couple of sessions ago and it got shot down at the Senate. But in your case and in, in point is you got that harvest, that information would be ready right away to let the biologist know and the commission know. And uh, I think that's a big plus that we can get on this thing and we'll do it. <clears throat> and I, I think you and I've talked about this. We, we actually, Dustin and I worked with Wisconsin about five years ago to develop what they've got. And they put it on the ground. Theirs have been working for a couple of years. And uh, they had mandatory reporting. They've always had mandatory reporting, but it works really well. And uh, did you just a quick question? Was it an Android or Samsung? I mean, Android. Yeah, not a, not a. So yeah, that's good because we've had issues with those, and that was a big, the big thing. So, um, yeah. Thank you. You didn't. You did paper, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, my elk would have been paper, and I've got some doe tags that are on my app. So we'll see how it works. Good. How does that work? Uh, when I purchased the licenses, I purchased them as e-tags through the online system. But when I bought my licenses this spring, I bought them on paper. So I have both paper and digital. 
I, at this point, I wish I had all digital, but I have both. Yeah. What, I don't know if this is a big deal at all, but uh, I bought my duck stamp and I have that physical copy and it's on the back of my phone. So I can be legal when I'm carrying that, but I don't know if we can do that digitally too at some point, because I know you can buy them online. So certain states did go to a, the feds have gone to a digital um, duck stamp for some right. states. Yep. Other than that, we don't have that. And actually there's some discussion about bringing the duck stamp back. Oh, I love that idea. For, for, for Montana, Just, yeah, the state duck stamp. Yeah. So um, we may be looking at that again. I mean, a lot of people, you know, kind of nostalgic and people look at it so that's Bought kind of sold to collect yeah well you're sold simply to collect yeah. i'd like to see the heads nodding on that that makes me feel better it took me several years to collect my montana duck stamps so i'm, I'm thrilled to hear i'm coming back yeah we're looking at it i'm not guaranteeing it i guess just one little clarification on this edu uh reservation piece you know i think our concern revisiting it was driven by the the trust landowner trust vrbo already being here and that opportunity to not being able the department not being able to do that for all those landowners that would request it um and then creating a situation where they can go otherwise and so we were discussing if there's another option in the interim and that's where this recommendation came forward because there are platforms to do that um, right now. Well, I right. think, yep. I think to that point, you know, that trying to adjust that, that's going to ebb and flow with what, a, what opportunities come available for people. You know, you're going to see landowners are going to have different opportunities come available, trying to control what they're going to do. I mean, we can do the best we can to keep up with it, but, um, We'll always be a little bit behind because we're the state, not the private sector. And the, the message I've gotten from the director's office, and most recently my conversation with the deputy director, is that we're not going to do an interim solution. If we're doing a pilot, it's with what we're going to use. So well, we're also looking at parks too. With yeah. reservations. Pardon me? With the reservation system. The last conversation I had with Jess Blunk at our CIO was that using the block reservation. Um, getting that component going in a pilot would be a building block for the state park reservation and camping reservation system. So, okay. All right. We're good there. Thank you. Um, so, we have a little bit of time here before um, Greg and Wade uh, present our Hunter Ed. Um, we miss anything on your end, Jason? No. Okay. Um, so then I, I believe we have some time for any other discussion in regards to other ideas. Um, yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Um, that we might want to just throw out a little bit at this point in time. We've got about 15 minutes. Um, before we start the Hunter Ed update. Paul. Um, one thing I was talking with Jason before earlier is, brought it up before is um, maybe we have some recommendation for hunt coordinators on some of these properties. But I think it would, uh, I think a lot of people just run rampant and they don't have any control on them whatsoever. But then again, it would help the landowners too, you know. So, can you clarify that? Hunt coordinator? Well, um, <clears throat> it'd be somebody that probably checking to see if people are checking in and, and uh, making sure they're supposed to be there. Basically, get the online reservation. Make sure they have checked in. Make sure they're not doing stupid things, you know, like whatever they do. So, do you mean on uh, block management? Yeah. In particular? Probably only block management. Okay. So we I think I think just maybe bring it out, and ask them to hook into it so I can see. 
Any other thoughts on that? No? I mean, currently, go ahead, Neil. Hearing what you say, Paul, one of our recommendations was um, when it came to block management was to encourage DNRC and BLM to have more boots on the ground. I see a little bit of a potential conflict there in that you know, BLM has no authority on, on private land. And I could also see the expectation that, okay, well, BLM's out there. Why are they not patrolling the people driving on, on muddy roads or whatever? So I, we've encouraged the department in the past to have more people just out patrolling the BMA areas. But I think we need to be real careful in terms of who it is, what entity is out there doing that patrol work. Because I, I could see that if we're asking, and, and, and believe me, I know you're, this is not what you said, but if, we're, if there's an expectation that BLM or DNRC is going to do some of this patrol work, I think it's going to get very crosswise with some of the private landowners. Like, what are they doing out here? Plus, I think there'll be significant amount of resistance from from those entities to do things on on private land so yeah um we do need more boots on the ground but we need to be very careful where those boots on the ground come from okay. and more um for service or any of that just i would say be probably a fish and game personnel to cord or just oversee and kind of make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be on block management because I think some of these places just get overrun. Just a thought. When you look at like Cherry Creek, the issues really occur when it's muddy out. I mean, I, to me, that's the biggest issue we have up there. And, and talking to those people that are part of the Cherry Creek BMA, they would love to have somebody that, you know, driving up and down the, and it, even though it's a big area, it's not so big that one person couldn't be very effective and just saying, hey, you know, your, your map that you got that has the rules say no driving when it's muddy, you know, it's muddy enough to where you need to be staying on the gravel and, and they would definitely appreciate that help. You know, in terms of regulating where people are at or what, I don't know that they would want to go go there. I mean, people somewhat self-regulate themselves. But I, again, in talking with those people up there, I think if if there's one thing they'd appreciate help with, it is when it's muddy out and and keeping people off of the two track trails. Yeah, and I know my experience on block managements that have hats. Um, I mean, that happens, you know, they're, they're big enough. Sometimes it can slip by, but they are actively from what I've seen working on, on trying to identify those problems as they occur. And usually they have within that reservation system, they've made the ability to know who was there when, and uh, when those things occurred. So it probably goes down that line of, is there an opportunity to have more hats in, in those big block mm -hmm. management areas? If I'm, Hearing Paul correctly. Yep. Yeah. I just think I just thought it was very simple. Thank you, Drew. Um, you know, again, we, we talk a lot about hunter behavior and that's one of the keys to in, improving. And we hear a lot of I thinks or I guess or I whatever's, but we don't have, have we been able to put together any actual data on citations, complaints, et cetera? Did we, I might've missed that in the last meeting. Sorry, I wasn't here, but we have a spreadsheet of actually how many people were cited over the last five, six years? And is that actually going up or down? Is hunter behavior actually getting worse or is it maybe getting better? 
What we had asked for for the last meeting or you had asked for was potentially having trespass citations, as I recall, which um, Ron Howell, we didn't have yet to share. Um, I'd ask, I, I think just for But I think for general yeah. citations, I don't think we have that, do we, Jason, that you recall? I mean, we can certainly ask for it to look at trends, but I don't think we have it readily at hand. Um, I, I'd have to look back on our, uh, I think it was August meeting, perhaps on the file that Ron gave us. Um, one of the things that he mentioned that I'll try my best to relay is that every situation is different. And so sometimes there are enforcement actions taken as such as citations, but not all the time. And so the severity and all the circumstances surrounding it may lead to an officer's discretion on one way or another. And when that happens, you're looking at apples and oranges to use just a raw number as. <clears throat> there's gotta be some sort of collective data though. I mean, these things are all- Certain, Certainly there's the, the metric on, on the number of violations. Yeah. That's certainly there, um, but the, the circumstances surrounding all of those violations, it's not everybody gets a ticket all the time. So thanks guys. My my brain was totally gone. Yeah, I have a sheet here I can get you. <laughs> okay. It looks at citations 2017 to 22, hunting without landowner permission and criminal trespassed property, written warnings and citations, a comparison. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I mean, because again, a lot of the stuff that we talk about, right? We we you know, we're in our own echo chambers or we talk to the same dozen people or whatever, and maybe we're just hearing the same things over and over. Maybe it truly isn't as bad as we think it is, or maybe it's worse. You know, we, we don't, it'd be nice to see that. So, Paul, did you want to just make that statement simply? Okay. Any opposition to that? Encouraging? No. Okay. So with that in mind, why don't we just take a like a a run to the bathroom break, stand up, and then we'll jump right into uh, our three o'clock hunter behavior ethics report. Thank you.
You don't really need this on, Jennifer. <laughs> okay, here it is. What's green, fuzzy, and if it fell out of a tree, it would kill you? Lean up. Lee, Lee knows the answer. You said it earlier. What's green and fuzzy, and if it fell out of a tree, it'd kill you? A pool table. <laughs> No? Okay. Why aren't dogs good dancers? Come on, all your ranchers should know this. Donna? They have two left feet. Way to go, Ray. All right. We awake now? Come on. You drove a long way, Denley. All right, so in our in our ever endeavoring pursuit of hunter education um, and ethic and all the above, uh, Greg Lemon is here to present the current marketing status, strategy status, and then um, the plan going forward with Hunter Ed, not Hunter Ed, landowner stewardship update. Right. Perfect. Take it away, Greg. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks you. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Pat Doyle and uh, Pat. If you could, uh, I'll, I'll if you get your presentation queued up, and then I'll kind of introduce the broader topic, and then hand it over to you. Pat is our marketing program guy in uh, communication and education, and we've been working really hard on this. So um, I've mentioned that this to the group before. Uh, we've been working with some partners on developing a marketing campaign that's focused on hunter ethics. Um, Marcus is here. Uh, Marcus has been helping us out a lot from the Wildlife Federation. Uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers has been involved. Pheasants Forever, uh, Meat Eater. Um, who else has been involved? Oh, Montana Stock Growers Association. Uh, and uh, we're reaching out to others. Um, as we go along, we're getting ready to launch this tomorrow. So uh, what that means is we'll have a website live tomorrow. We'll have a press release out and then you'll start to see more of our creatives and some of the campaign pieces, both from uh, Fish, Wildlife and Parks and from the partners who have uh, signed on to the project. So the idea when we came together was to come up with with a slogan that was effective at communicating what we what we wanted to communicate, which is um, access is important. And when hunters do things that um, are disrespectful to landowners, um, that are illegal, that are, are uh, unethical, it jeopardizes access. And so after uh, several meetings and a couple of rounds at the drawing board, we came up with the slogan that you see in front of you, it's up to us, respect access, protect the hunt. And so what uh, Pat will do is, is kind of walk you through some of the, the campaign materials. Uh, the plan this year, you know, you'll, you know, I'm sure people are aware now that just a few days from the opener of the general rifle season. So we'd like to get started earlier than this, but I think we're, what I think this year represents for us is the opportunity to give some of the messaging uh, and the uh, uh, campaign strategies, a test run, uh, and, and Pat will go through all, all of what we're going to be doing. But I think it's also going to give us a good uh, feel for how we can get started earlier next year and what we're going to need and how to engage some more partners uh, in this. What we really are looking for is <clears throat> for partners across the spectrum from landowner groups, um, hunting groups, uh, people who are involved in outdoor recreation to uh, share with share this message uh, far and wide that it's up to us. Um, it's our responsibility to respect access and protect the hunt. Um, one piece that, uh, you know, we're just, we've just been sort of talking through, I wanted to touch on given the conversation right before the break is we are gonna be doing some survey work. So uh, we have uh, a survey that we're ready, that we're, we're getting ready to uh, eventually send out what we'd like is a, a group of like a hundred landowners and a hundred hunters. 
in in a kind of an open ended survey to them, asking them if you know if they think hunter ethics is a problem. Uh, yes or no. If yes, is it getting worse? Is it the same? Is it better? Uh, and then what might be some of those problems that they see? And then we're going to have that same general survey on our on our website landing page for for this program. So we're going to be collecting that data in a couple of different ways, and it's it's just going to help uh, help everybody I think that's involved in this conversation about hunter ethics to understand kind of what hunters think or what landowners might think the problem is, and give us some some uh, good um, data that we can both steer our, our uh, outreach and marketing and also some of our other strategies on, on mm -hmm. getting the problem addressed. So with that, um, let's, I'll just, before we open up for questions, I'll kick it over to Pat and let Pat present the campaign and then, uh, then we'll take some questions. Pat. Great. Thanks, Greg. Chair Beal, members of the PLPW. It's a pleasure talking to you all again. I know that we um, had a presentation about our campaign from the 2021 um, big game season, which you presented on earlier this year. So this would be a good follow-up to them. It's been great listening to your conversation um, today. So yeah, as Greg said, I'm Pat Doyle. I'm the marketing manager for Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And our campaign this year is It's Up to Us, Respect, Access, Protect the Hunt. And before we get into that, just a quick recap from 2021, um, where we had our Pass It On campaign. And so just, a, I know a lot of you probably remember us talking about that at length. And I think that while well and mentioned um, the Pass It On campaign was, um, it really didn't set us up as an agency or with partners for uh, success in the long term when it focuses on um, hunter ethics, recreational ethics um, out there, especially during hunting season. Um, but just for, for your FYI, uh, last year we did reach over 6 million people um, through our campaign and had over 250,000 people engage with the campaign. Um, so some really high numbers there, but obviously we're hoping to do even better um, this upcoming season in 2022. Um, so as Greg did mention, I know that a lot of partners are in the room today and, and watching over uh, over Zoom. Um, one, of, one of the things that we really wanted to do this year in 2022 was reach out to partners, knowing that this was not, um, you know, the, the issue of hunting ethics or people being ethical um, when they're out recreating on, uh, on public or private land um, isn't our problem alone to solve. Um, you know, a lot of our partners, whether those are um, landowner organizations, um, conservation, uh, sports groups, um, you know, they have a really big vested interest in this too. And we're, we're, we're all stronger if we're on the same page um, with messaging and um, how we're pushing that out to our sometimes very unique and targeted audiences. Um, so just up on the screen right now, I'm an example of the partners that are currently on board with this campaign. So backcountry hunters and anglers, and these are in alphabetical order. So this is not showing any kind of favoritism, how they're listed on the slide. Uh, Meat Eater, Montana Stock Growers Association, Montana Wildlife Federation, Onyx Maps and Pheasants Forever. Um, as Greg did mention in his introduction, um, this is not a complete list to say the least. Um, we're always looking for to, to partner with other groups um, on this kind of shared language um, and, and really addressing this issue um, in, a, in a coordinated manner. Um, and our messaging did switch uh, a, a bit this year um, from kind of a messaging that focused on passing on that ethic, which obviously is still an issue, but 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 building out a campaign of it's up to us is, is what does that mean? How is it up to us as, as people recreating on the landscape? Um, and so just not to read off a slide, but it might be hard for some people in the room to see, um, ethical hunting ensures we get to keep doing what we love. In Montana, successful hunts often rely on good relationships and positive interactions with private landowners. Many of Montana's game species depend on private lands for habitat. A significant amount of hunting opportunity we have is due in large part to the work and stewardship of private landowners. Remember, hunting private land is a privilege. Respecting private land and building relationships with landowners protects hunting access opportunities. Ethical, fair chase hunting protects the future of hunting. Ask first to hunt, fish, and recreate on private land. It's up to us. Respect access or protect the hunt. Um, and so what does a campaign like this really um, come down to as far as implementing it um, with media outlets uh, across the state and in a lot of ways across the region? Um, 
targeted digital ads online, um, a lot of taking advantage of a lot uh, the popularity of streaming online services, so like YouTube TV, um, Roku, Paramount Networks, things like that, where people are not necessarily watching cable, but streaming um, online. Um, also taking advantage of, of, of traditional over the air, which is OTA um, over the air uh, television stations. Um, obviously, social media uh, has a large component, but also uh, real, uh, you know, utilizing what we call paid native content. So articles that we have written ourselves and paid to promote through other websites um, is key for this too. Things like um, top five ways to ensure an ethical hunt, top five ways to to, to make sure um, you're doing the right thing when you're hunting on private land. Um, email marketing as well, making sure we're utilizing not only our e uh, really vast email lists internally in Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, but also with our advertising partners and partner uh, organizations as well. Um, a lot of traditional advertising goes into a campaign like this, like print ads and radio ads and billboards and press releases as well. So we really view this as a, as a multifaceted approach um, that is going to reach, um, you know, obviously, hopefully more than our six over 6 million people um, in 2021. And so here's some uh, just examples of some of the um, digital ad copy that we're pushing out. Um, I know this kind of got formatted a little weird, so I promise it does say Montana FWP in the URL. Uh, <laughs> I promise the end of that is on there as well. And then here's a here here's an example of some of that advertising that we're sharing with our partner um, agencies as well that they can use. Thank you. And I did put in here an example of a radio um, PSA that will be. Um, on, on the air uh, for, for the entirety of the big game season. So hopefully um, your audio is good in there. Um, if it's not, there's some kind of technical difficulty. Um, I'll find a way to share this with the entire committee um, after. So it's about 30 seconds, so. Hunting opportunities can be found on private and public land. Wherever we hunt, it's important to respect that access. Here in Montana, access to private land is a key part of hunting and wildlife management. But that access is at risk with every gate left open, piece of litter left behind, and torn up ag field. As hunters, we can do better. Ask for permission. Know and follow the rules. Be respectful. Because we either do better or we lose access. It's that simple. It's up to us. Respect access. Protect the hunt. Hunting up. All right, almost technical difficulty. Almost got out of it unscathed. Um, and so, what 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 does um, it's up to us really mean? Looking at not just this year, but 2023 and beyond. And I think, like I said earlier, and Greg mentioned this in his introduction, um, we really feel that this campaign sets us up for success in the long term. We are not in the same position next year, saying, "What do we do? It's 2023. Um, how do we kind of repackage this messaging?" Um, in, in a way that is new and fresh. Um, with, with talking about the language of it's up to us, this gives us an example to develop content. When I say content, this is written content, video content, photo content that really can address how it is up to us to respect access, protect the hunt, do those things that we wanna see people doing when they're out um, in the field. And so building out process-oriented content, how to actually do things when you're in the field. Um, and I know that, you know, and this this committee has talked about it a lot in the past, you know, how do you reach those, that small percentage of people that are, that are giving people a bad name or a bad rap, um, you know, it, this this content is for them, but it's also content for the the overwhelming majority of the people that are doing the right thing to really re ingrain that when you're out in the field, um, you know you have the opportunity to lead by example with your behavior, and people, whether you want to see it or not, are are, are watching what you're doing and kind of you know just taking that upon themselves to be a leader when they're outside. 
Um, so in 2023 and beyond, we can look at things um, where we hear from our partner organizations. We can look at things we can hear back from our hunter and landowner surveys to develop content that really speaks to a lot of these concerns. Maybe these are big concerns like people leaving gates open or driving on ag roads, or maybe these are more nuanced things that are that are starting to come up that we don't necessarily know about. Um, so a lot of uh, really great opportunity, I think, going forward. And uh, we're very, very happy with all of our partners being on board contributing to this process and looking forward to this goes um not just this year but um beyond so um happy to take any questions um happy to touch base offline and, and share my contact and with any with information with anybody um that wants to have a more in-depth conversation at a later date so thanks pat so <clears throat> any any questions or comments on any of that we threw through a lot at you. <clears throat> Dale. Greg, one thing I have <clears throat> I heard previously, um, <clears throat> and maybe at one of these meetings was a slogan that if you see something, say something. Is that I mean it seems to me like that would be a natural subsection of this is that part of the campaign will there be parts of that that might speak to that uh so it's not it is that's something that we talked about uh with the partners quite a bit and there's there's been um i might have said this before i've said it to in other groups i sort of lean i'm, I'm frustrated with the hunter ethics problem um frust it frustrates me that that you know we have so many people that do it the right way that treat private land as if, if it were their own land that are respectful. And I mean, I, you know, not to, I'm not, don't, not, not a glowing beacon of, of goodness, but I just this year, I was out with my nine-year-old and I had a whole antelope on my back and, and I, instead of climbing over a fence, there was a gate and we we're still about three miles from the truck and I got the gate open and it was one of those gates where I knew when I got it open, I was going to have a hell of a time getting it closed. I was like, I had the antelope on my back. My nine-year-old can't really do anything. And it took us 20 minutes to get that gate closed. And I wanted to walk away so bad and just say, you know what? If you're going to string this gate so tight, what am I supposed to do? But I got it closed. And knowing that my nine-year-old is watching me you know, if I walk away, I mean, the next first time he runs into that problem, which he's going to run into it, we all have, he's going to walk away too. And, you know, so we do it, mo most of us do it the right way. And that's what makes this so difficult for me. And and I, I'm always sort of tending to want to do, be a little negative to, to put the pictures of the bad behavior on the ad and say, don't do this anymore. Like, this is not hunting. This is, this is not what our heritage is about. And almost every time that comes up, somebody's saying, we, we need to be positive. Like we still got to catch more flies with honey. And so uh, as we talked about with the partners, the see something, say something, I think what, where we landed, where I sort of took it is let's do, let's focus on personal responsibility this year. It's up to us. And, and let's see how that works. And if it's up to us, see something, say something, you know, be responsible for not just yourself, but making sure that the people are behaving right out on the landscape, you know, th that sort of stuff. Maybe that's something we incorporate and build upon this messaging in year two. So it's certainly not off the table. It was certainly discussed, but, but right now it's not part of it. Yeah. Just an interesting thing, too, that I, I see when we think positive things. It's when I look in my area, and I'm just going to say I, it's interesting that as much as we talk about in my area, the, the six license plates, the fives, the sevens, I will say that it is kind of interesting in some of these places where some of the worst offenders are the ones that live right there and know the area, and they're, they've kind of been doing it that way for 50 years, type of thing. There is that component of it, too, that, and I think. It is troubling to know that, you know, well, why we're spending all this focus on the 1%. It's frustrating, but I, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a necessary thing. 
I think, to just kind of keep in the minds of others. And I think that see, see something, say something, because I think, you know, people that are really value the opportunity to come and come and do that. If they saw even a local person do, you know, like I, I tell my guys that are on the ranch, I'm like, you guys are as much, you know, people are looking to you probably more than anything. And it's like you said about your son or whatever, you know, like it, it is setting the example. So hopefully that <clears throat> by promoting this in a positive, you know, we need to be the bar or set the bar, I should say. And so I guess that's just a quick point on, on that. Yeah. And I will say too, if you, if you want us to put some stuff in there from ranch and on how to open and close gates and how to set the bottom wire is just a quick little point on that, that I, and I think it's important because I am amazed. So on the fulcrum point of a bottom wire, if you put the wire all the way down at the bottom of the post, when you put it in and try to close it, Arnold Schwarzenegger can't close it. But if you really pull that bottom wire up high on that post, you can probably close any gate that comes in. And I'm not saying that was the case, but I've seen more. I, I don't understand it. I, I go up and I see it with our interns and stuff that come to the ranch and I watch them. They go, I'm waiting there five minutes. Like, and I go out and the, the bottom wire is right at the base of the post and they cannot. And I walk up there and I just take my boot and lift that up about three inches and close it with one arm on there. So <laughs> just a little sidebar, like maybe we, we could, just some fence education on how to close it because I, I, we're not intentionally trying to make gates so hard that people can't close them, but we we can't have them so loose that they just kind of hang there either. But I just thought it was funny you mentioned that. So great. That's your first nuance to advertise. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but you know, well, I uh, uh, my, my philosophy has always been work harder, not smarter. So. Yeah. <laughs> You can call it Rich's right boot. Never. Yeah, right. it would, reminds me of that Farsight commercial with the kid like pushing on the school door and it says pull. Like, <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. One comment I appreciate the uh, partnerships uh, being listed and recognized. I think it creates a sense of inclusiveness to the groups that matter to think about this. So yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, and, I, and we're going to have our partners on the web website. So as as the partner list expands, you know they'll be they'll be on our on the landing page. So they'll get some recognition. And really, we've we've given we're giving the creatives to them. And and but but you might my hope is that you'll see this in a lot of places you didn't really expect to see it. And and so some examples that we might talk about next year and Jason's. I'm maybe a little bit aware of this, but I'd like to, I'd like to see if there's some messaging we can put on signs at around, you know, some of our regions at block management areas or, you know, just something more than just a billboard. But when, you know, when you roll up to a block management area, it says, you know, it's up to us. Um, and I think th th that sort of stuff is kind of just things that we're going to be able to build on over time. So any other thoughts or questions on this marketing stuff? It's good. Great. Should we just roll into the hunter landowner stewardship piece? Unless anybody has any other in front, let's do her. Okay. So um, thanks, Pat, for uh, being on today. Um, Wade um, uh, Cooper Ryder is here. Uh, our our well our outdoor skills program. Uh, manager and, and um, most importantly for the conversation today, uh, hunter, bow hunter, and trapper education program person. So we we've talked over and over about the hunter landowner stewardship project, and a lot of the conversation here has been sort of around, you know, the incentive or the requirement or the the carrot or the stick to uh, you know further a uh, cliche. Uh, all that's good, but I, 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 we also need to redo the program. And so um, the conversation today is going to focus on at least initially sort of what we're thinking about from a, from a program redo standpoint. And um, so we, you guys got a, got a document, um, I think Saturday, maybe. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read it, it, it it's not a long one, um, but we want to just kind of go over kind of a general outline of what we're thinking and I'll let uh, Wade come up and answer any questions and talk about this. Um, and Ed can too. Uh, we've, 
we're looking at kind of three buckets of work, uh, the curriculum and test development. And along with that is the video content. Um, and so we're still looking to partners to help us with that. And, and I think we've got to get the curriculum and the test piece kind of nailed down so we know what the video piece needs to be. And then while those two things are working themselves out, we'll also be working uh, internally on the technology piece to make sure we've got a place to host the test, to do the, or host the curriculum, do the test, and then the certification piece so that we can get our certification piece um, into our system so that um, as, as, we, as our new uh, licensing system evolves that we we can have that ch that piece that that certification piece go with each person's account or profile within the licensing system. So those are kind of the three general areas. And Wade, you want to come up and just kind of outline kind of some of those details? Sure. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Um, yeah. Did everybody get a chance to see that document that got sent out? Okay. Yeah, sorry for the yeah. for the tardiness and getting that out to everybody. It was kind of a last minute thing, but hopefully it's provides some some good information. So Ed gave me um, a document a while back that full of information that y'all had come up with as far as things that you guys um, had as concerns and wanted to see in the new program. So I just took that document, and broke it down, and I think there's there's ten nine or ten components to it, and tried to flesh out some of the main learning points for each one of those. So <clears throat> the, uh, the idea then is to uh, create a series of two to four minute videos for each one of those subtopics and have you know, a couple of questions that persons would have to answer to go on to the next unit. And then a final test that covered a compilation of questions uh, over the whole course. So I, I'm, I'm happy to get way down into the weeds. I don't know if y'all want to go that far or not. Uh, one of the conversations that we were having was incentives and, and how do we incentivize people to do that? I, I think you know, Ed and I and, and Greg talked about it right now. And Jason, you jump in here if I'm way off, uh, but I'm, I'm thinking there's somewhere between two and 300 people a year that take the current course. And <clears throat> most of those are required to take it for one reason or another. So the question becomes, and I'm sure y'all have talked about this, how do we incentivize people to take it in mass? And how do we get people who need it to take it? And Everett and I were talking at the break there, um, that carrot is a whole lot more effective than a stick uh, for these for folks. So some, some ideas that, that kind of got kicked around um, a bonus point, take it passage, get a bonus point. Good idea. Um, we have some some IT, some tracking things to address if that if that's an option. Um, and then how often do we do that? Award those points every year, every five years. Um, another option that came up was um, awarding a, a an opportunity for a super tag. Well, that's easy enough to do and, and can happen every year. And, and would be a really, I, I personally, I think it'd be a great encouragement to folks to get that refresher annually, right? Which also puts a little burden on, on me or us to kind of keep that course freshened up a bit here and there, which I'm gonna go back to the, to the uh, video segments, having, having each one of these units broken down into two to four minute videos makes it pretty simple to plug a new video or update a piece of it with some of our editing technology. Another piece that, another idea that came up, <clears throat> and I, I think if I'm not wrong, did the director talk about or kind of return back to some level of in-person hunter ed classes? Mm -hmm. you mentioned that. So right now, of course, we're all, the option is to be all online. Once we get this course up and running, or the, the idea is for it to be about 30 minutes plus or minus, um, we could actually, and I'm going to say this with the caveat of I'm pretty sure get this incorporated into our current online hunter ed course. 
so that would that would create the 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 necessity for every student who went online to be exposed to this. So so it's not just the people who are wanting to get a bonus point or wanting to get a, a super tag opportunity, but everybody that you know from our young people, and that that I think is our our, our real target audience is, is our young folks to get that that impression on them. Um, so we start exposing them early. They get the information. It's consistent, um, and and it's it's there. They have to do it if they're going to get get their hunter education certificate you know, through this online course. Um, yeah. So that I, I guess if, if questions, that's kind of a pretty high level overview. Greg touched on some of the technology challenges we might have to face, but we can overcome those. Give enough time and money, anything's possible, right? Mr. Chairman, um, so in that, so in my industry, we call it Beef Quality Assurance. It's a national program. It's very much like this is about an hour to do the test. You get a certificate, it's good for three years. It actually goes into their database. And then as they go to different feedlots, places like that, that information is readily available to feedlots to, you know, to access, know if you've actually taken that or whatever. It, it, and it's, and it's kind of limited. I mean, it's, it's not a super like popular and, and really gone across the whole country. Yeah, but it's there. So my question is, is that when you take this, when, when you, as far as their certificate or whatever you get, when you finish this, will it like somehow tie to your license or tie so that it stays with you that, that, that even FWP knows, or if a game warden's out there and you run across it, they know that when they look up your license, you've actually, I guess, how, how will it be used in that, that regard um, <clears throat> as far as qualifying? or I guess how it'll be used in that regard. Great question. So <clears throat> there's two answers to that, uh, or two parts to the answer. If it's part of the hunter education course, once it you know becomes that, there'll be a, a, a date and time where it's just an automatic, yeah, they've had it. While it's a standalone piece, uh, the, the idea is that, um, and, and this is conceptual, um, it would be modeled after our current hunter, bow hunter education programs, wherein a, a person goes out there, they create an account, it's got their name, address, phone number, email address. We would add in the, their ALS number as a requirement. Uh, and, and it may require uh, a, a unique identifier from our, our provider to, to go with that person as well. At that point, and this is the technology piece on, on our end, we have to be able to take that information, the, the, the student records, and not only bring them into our, our, our Hunter ed Education student database, but to also pipe it into our ALS system. So then, yes, it, it would uh, populate and show that they've, just like your bear, te uh, bear test and so forth. <clears throat> Pretty quiet group here. <laughs> yes, sir? <clears throat> Wade, one of the discussion points that we've had for several times as we've talked about this is our target audience. And I just heard you mention that, you know, that we really want to focus on the young people. But for you and Greg and people that deal in this, what is the target audience and how how do you how do you determine who your target audience is. I mean, I struggle with that all the time when I think about this and just, can you talk to that a minute? Sure, that's a great question. <clears throat> and I guess part of the answer is, who are, whose behavior are, are we wanting to affect? <clears throat> do we wanna, do we wanna affect our, our young people coming up and, and give them better ethics, better understanding, better, bigger, better responsibilities? Do we want to target dads and grandpas um, who maybe not have to go through the program? So I, I think the, the answer is, is kind of a twofold piece. Um, get this program up and running, get it incorporated into our hunter education program, the online portion, so that it's, we've got it there, it's consistent, they all get it. Um, and then, and then have, have this incentive piece. The, you know, something we've, we've all talked about, and I'm sure you guys have discussed too, our, our ethical hunters are gonna feel like, yeah, this would be kind of cool, we'd take this. 
the folks that, that are, aren't ethical or responsible or, or necessarily legal, what incentive do they have to do it? Which comes back to the incentive piece. If, we're, if we as an agency can say, and again, hypothetically, here's a bonus point. Here's, a, here's an opportunity for a super tag. Um, that, that has a, a, a better tendency to get those, those people who do need it in, into the program and to see it. Uh, will, it will it change behaviors? Maybe. Um, I, I'd like to think that <clears throat> focusing on our young people and, and, and growing that behavior is a lot easier than trying to go in and weed the garden and you know, make your crop better after it's been seeded and gone, gone to fruition there. I'm just going to mention uh, just one idea as I think about this. I mean, in our town, we have a really great ag teacher. Um, he does FFA and everything too. And I know in class, he's always, you know, taking them out. They're doing field trips or doing things like that. But this could be potentially for like school, you know, not, I don't know how to tie it, but you know, ag teachers are kind of there. They like doing things, but maybe it's a way to at some point for it, even if they were just made aware of like the school ag teacher was made aware that, Hey, there's this 30 minute thing. You take your classroom. Maybe they just want to do something extracurricular, but as a class sit down again, in my industry, when they did beef quality assurance, we would bring our groups, groups of ranchers together and sit down at a, at a research center, all in a big classroom, watch it all on TV. And then we would as a class or as a group, just take the test, you know, together and work through it. But anyway, just so a, a suggestion or a comment about how to get it in the hands of, of young kids and, and just maybe again, not tie it, but just offer it that, that, hey, school, OAG, FFA teachers, you know, they're, they kind of like that stuff. So just a comment. Sure, that, that good idea. And it's certainly a doable thing. Um, <clears throat> we already have a number of schools around the state, a handful of schools around the state that are doing hunter education as part of their, yeah. Um, Did we <clears throat> uh, talk about remedial hunter in the Oh, sure, sure. Is that you? There you go. So uh, uh, did you? That was my question. Okay. Do we still have yes. <laughs> Great question, Everett. Thank you. <laughs> Not that you got prompted in here. <laughs> so, so yes, we still have remedial hunter education. And, and for those of you that, that might be unfamiliar, that's a that's a statutorily mandated mandated program for the people that need it. Uh, these are the folks that are violators. They've, they've done something, and and they're sentenced to complete this program. Uh, it, it costs them fifty dollars and a couple hours of their time to do. So we were we were talking this through the other day, and, and one of the big one of the big points I think that that at least for me, and I think maybe perhaps all of you, um, ethics ethics is and that's that's a huge umbrella, right? That, that covers a lot of different aspects. So part of our remedial program has is, is got a, a series of videos that people have to watch and have to hand write out an essay answer to four or so of them um, that are ethical dilemmas. So this program lends itself nicely to uh, replacing or augmenting our current remedial program with, with one slight adjustment, and that is to, to keep that um, uh, written response portion. Um, it's a small enough group of people that it's not onerous on us to read them and grade them, so to speak. Um, whereas if we tried to do that with two or 5,000 people, it'd be a little bit cumbersome. So I, 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 I'm kind of excited. We've, we've been needing to update this remedial program for a number of years, and, and this would lend itself nicely to, to something like that as well and, and kind of get to your, your point about the people that do need it. Anybody wonder about time frame? <laughs> Ed, why you got to be like that? <clears throat> time frame. Thanks for the question, Mr. Chair. Yes. Sir. <clears throat> That's a great question. Um, there's a lot of variables that, that factor into this. Um, this is kind of a build up from scratch. Um, we do have a lot of talented people to draw upon. Our, I think probably our, our biggest challenge is going to be some of the video aspects of it. We've got 10 videos of four minutes a piece. That's going to be about four or 500 hours worth of video. It has to be compiled, put together. Uh, 
narratives for each one of these pieces of that to go into the video. Um, I, I know Greg and I have talked a little bit. He's he's wanting July first. July first. Yeah. So so that's the date to shoot for. Um, I'm going to have to start going to the gym and uh, getting pumped up to lift this. But we can certainly certainly give that a shot. So so I guess the, the end result is that it, the goal is to have it ready for the 23 hunting season. It's rolled out. Did I say that right? Okay. So in that regard, would you need anything particular from us from this point to that point that you can think of at this time? And unless there's some some major change in the in the document that the uh, points of concern, the desired learning points, I think we're we're good. If somebody has something they want to add, please do so. Yes, sir. You look at this and you look at the different points here that heritage habitat relationships. Is the idea way that in one year you'd focus on one of these, maybe the next year you'd focus on the next one, or is the idea to develop some type of a learning product for each of these that it would be largely available in the first couple of years for, for each and every one of them? So, so my vision, if you will, is to have the entire program, each one of these pieces as a whole. So, um, for example, if I find my own notes here. The heritage piece. And again, we're talking two to four minute videos, which is that, that's kind of a standard attention span. We talk about Montana, the public land, the private land, um, how many acres we have in the BMA in BMAs and, and why that's important. And so that, you know, cover, we're going to cover some numbers, uh, some history, a um, couple other pieces, and then a couple of quiz questions when they're done written with that. How many acres of BMA do we have in, in Montana on average? How many acres of private land do we have? Or how many, how many uh, uh, providers do we have for BMAs? And some things of that nature, get people, make sure they understand the concepts. And the same, same with the habitat. You know, there's a lot of folks that don't realize that landowners are, are key players in wildlife habitat. Because landowners house a lot of habitat and do water projects and fencing projects and, you know, salting and so forth. Not that they're salting for, for wildlife, but their stock. Um, that the alfalfa, the irrigation, uh, those kinds of things. So, so folks, and maybe I'm wrong with my understanding of this, but I think folks really need to understand how key that landowners are in, in, a, in healthy wildlife. But also, and again, if I'm wrong, let me know here, but that there's a concern amongst landowners and livestock producers about diseases. We've got tuberculosis. Um, what's the other one? Brucellosis, thank you. I had a brain, brain seizure there for a second. Um, you know, that, that I'm sure is a, is a huge concern you know, for the cattle industry. So to convey that information to, to the general sports people, um, you know, and today we've got the, the chronic wasting disease, how to keep that from spreading. Um, I, I think you kind of get the, the gist of it and, and have that as one, one program, one, one half hour, 40 minute piece to, to go through. Is that answer your question? Yes, sir. Drew Steinberger. So, uh, with those cooperating groups, did did you develop all of these points with them, or was this just done internally? With so, I can answer that. So these all came from all our minutes. From, okay, so it's it's a collective them. piece. Okay. Yes. Ranch ring chair. And I I think that those groups have a lot of input into, you know, as this goes forward. What are the key points? How do you flush them out? You know, in a 
in a great, great way that attracts the attention, answers or addresses the issue. <clears throat> so these are actually thoughts that all of you have had through the course of the year plus previous in one piece of paper back to the department. So I was gonna yeah. so I, you know, last time we did talk about a few folks being interested in participating in this. And we're gonna wrap up today with some information looking at 23 and where we go in 23 and such. I I would ask that each of us look through these again. You know, if you have any suggestions to these key learning points, if there's anything that you should be, you, you believe should be added or dropped, make your comments. So take this document and we will send those probably to, what's the best way? You want them all directly, Wade? I, I'm happy to take them. Um, okay. Send we'll them get, to Greg, send them to me. It, we'll get you Wade's not. email. Um, but really, you know, when we look at this whole point of the education question that we've been addressing, if you have something that is not on here, or if you think something in here is unclear or should be condensed, this is your opportunity to impact that now in a very productive way. And I, I would just add, um, please keep in mind that this, this is a rough draft. It's not the final working document. So yeah, this, is, this would be good to get a little extra input. So then um, <clears throat> kind of looking at that update, you know, there's been some discussion about you have a, a program you introduce and you can incorporate it in the many ways that you could. Um, would you see updating these by segment? So heritage or landowner concerns, do you, do you see that going forward as the potential to just say, we need to take this one and, and update it and making that a possibility in the program? Or how do you see that, Wade? No, it, it, exactly. And, and that's why um, the concept of, of segmenting, segmenting it into separate little video components, uh, it makes it real easy to either, either refilm, edit a piece, insert a piece into that one, one little um, two to four minute chunk in, in the program. Okay. I would say just to that point, you know, the ongoing uh, having some ongoing dialogue with this group, <clears throat> you know, year after year, uh, you know, doesn't become a big lift to create a new program, but dialogue for feedback so that maybe there's a four minute learning module that we need to insert into the program, or maybe there's one that just doesn't seem to resonate after a couple of years. So we take one out, put a new one in, hits a different topic. So, so this group, and then the, that feedback to us is going to be helpful and on how, because the last thing we want to do is what we've done, which is create something that we just don't touch for 20 years and then come back and go, well, well, you got to start from scratch. So avoiding okay. stagnation. <clears throat> right. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments with, for waiter Greg? Thank you. I really appreciate what you put together and, and Pat on the creative side there. You know, the marketing campaign for this year looks like a good thing going forward. And uh, yeah, there's a lot. It's a lot to do and timelines are tough, but uh, hopefully that all reaches lots of people that need to hear it and everybody gets on board. So we appreciate it. Great. Right. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. So 
we have a final comment, public comment period coming up. Um, but I think uh, a couple of things we want to put forward. Stephanie, would you like? Yeah. yeah. Been able to share my voice at all. Uh, <laughs> Stephanie Brown, I'm the Access and Landowner Relations Bureau Chief. And I had a good conversation with Ed last week about 2023 and just asking that we start thinking about some of the things that as a council you'd like to accomplish. So that was really one of our topics that we had just really batted around just a little bit. We didn't go into anything, but just thinking about what are those things that you are interested in accomplishing in 2023 and starting to think about just meeting dates. How many meetings is it that you are hoping to gather for in 23? Um, and then we had also just talked about the December meeting where we can talk a little bit more about that in detail, but maybe between now and then you can go ahead and, and think about it and think about some of those items so that we can talk about it at the December meeting. And I had also shared with Ed that prior to that December meeting, the regional access managers, Jason and myself will be gathering together to really talk about the ideas that have been discussed around that one menu for all of the access programs. And how is it that we're going to bring all of these hunting access programs together into one menu that is easily to easy to understand for staff to be able to present to anybody, any staff member really can take that one menu, go share it, or even a landowner could take it and bring it to their neighbor or anybody could just pick it up and really understand what are all of these options when it comes to hunting access programs. So when the regional access staff um, and Jason and I meet in December, that's what we're going to be working on. I don't think we'll be ready to present for that December meeting because we're meeting like the day or two before your meeting, but we might be able to just have a couple casual conversations about some of the ideas that we're tossing around. So I I'm just wondering if um, leaving from here, if we send an email out with a survey to all of you, let's say a questionnaire in regards to 2023 goals, uh, that we want to work towards um, the number of meetings. We'll have some input on that and then look at that. Um, some you can think about where you're driving all the way home, Lee, all the way right after HAPS. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and then also ideas about um, this council, how we can improve our. Um, effectiveness any ideas you will have we'll put that on a, a survey to answer um, so we can look at how to be the most effective going into 23 um, and we'll probably yeah. add, <clears throat> add one comment or thought about with 23 being uh, at least the spring being a led legislative session um, what we might need to be aware of or how we respond um, if needed uh, as things arise going forward. And we, we can talk more thoroughly about that in December for sure. Um, <clears throat> so those are some things we'll throw at you here uh, in an email. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll send that follow-up email out tomorrow. Actually. Okay. Yep. I'll bring you all a discount card, Lee. How's that? <clears throat> incentivize, incentivize you. Bring the. We are certainly going to make sure you're you're part of that review <laughs> for it creative side. I think that's would probably actually work really well. Oh, it'd be embarrassing. 
bad boys and you have to try and keep that up for like three years. <laughs> you don't know how much I love that idea. <clears throat> I was thinking of the movie. It's my whole <laughs> There you go. I think he's on the ethical hunter guy. We've observed your microphone is wrong. All right. So um, let's. Uh, Let's just, before we go to public comment, I'm gonna switch that just a bit because I know a couple of people have to hit the road. Um, and maybe we'll start with you, Lee, any final comments for today? Well, I think we forgot to, it takes a while to get one of these. Thanks, Lee. Lee Cornwell, takes a while for you to get one of these consensus groups to a consensus. I think we've shown that today that we've been respectful of everybody's opinions and joked about it and joshed about it. And Everett's kind of the kind of has the he's the high high mark for us to all watch in order to get get to the good the uh, the best board member. So you're, it's not ins, it's not insulting. This is not insulting. This is in jest. <laughs> he and Rich Rich is taking notes and Everett's keeping us up. And that, but we've we've come together on one of these things and it's worked well. And, and I think it it's there's a benefit to a citizen group. Everybody's respectful of everybody else's idiotic ideas and we don't say anything about it. <laughs> it's fine. How do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Lee. Drew. Um I gotta hit my button now, Lee. Got me a bad habit there. <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I'm actually really looking forward to the upcoming legislature and then the next uh, meeting, and and you know, work on some more of these recommendations. Thought we made some good headway, um, uh, especially with this last piece here. Uh, this education piece, I think, is is critical. A uh, critical piece that we can recommend and help bring forth some information on. So, I'm looking forward to digging into that and, and helping there a bunch. Great, thank you, Mr. Trivi. <clears throat> thought our meeting was very productive I guess if there's one place where we need to maybe focus on is uh, and this is maybe something we, uh, that I'd respond to to your email Stephanie is I'm not sure we've done a particularly good job of marketing the 454s. I think we could put out some information um, on the 454s that might explain better why we've done what we've done, where they've headed. Um, I'm not certainly <clears throat> in love with the program as a whole, but I don't think we've done a particularly good job of explaining what some of our rationale has been. And I think that could be beneficial. And uh, um, maybe that's something that we could look at in, in more than just that program, block management, some of the other things, really having a little bit better discussion of why we are in support or maybe in opposition to, to a certain um, task or topic that's come up. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Ray? Well, I, actually, I thought it was a good meeting. We did uh, actually come uh, to um, some conclusions on things and that, which it seems like a lot of times we don't, we talk about them, but we never really come to anything solid. And we did do that with this meeting. Uh, the one thing we could do away with is Ed's jokes. <laughs> Therefore, in December, you will come prepared. Please. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Ray. Cindy. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty good meeting. I'm looking forward to the legislative session and see how these things actually work out. Thank you. Donna. <clears throat> well, I, 
I feel the last year we've been pretty darn busy and we've made some strides in the right direction. I think we're giving more strength to block management. Hopefully with the incentive increase, we will get more people and ranchers involved in the program. I think the, we've proven to the public that we care about access and that we're trying to improve both that in education. And so I think as a group, we've uh, covered a lot, a lot of topics, a lot more than I thought when I said, sure, I'm happy to be on the board or the council. And, and so I'm, I'm pretty pleased where we are ending up today. Thank you. Everett? I, I really don't have anything to, to add, but uh, I think we've kind of started to congeal as a group better. And I, I really appreciate that. And uh, I missed last night's dinner, but those those opportunities for us to be social without an agenda, I think are important to the dynamic of the group. So um, I would encourage us to do more of those if possible and attend if you haven't. So that's just my final thought. Thank you, Everett. Mr. Ellis. Um, I think the group's been overall real well. I think a lot of us have intentions of uh, trying to find access and trying to work together. I'd like to see um, maybe some of these groups out there try to work together a little better. Um, but other than that, I think we accomplished a lot. I think we uh, the 454 wasn't really our, our program, but we've directed it in a in a positive direction. I think it's coming together. I think the palace have come out good. I think I think it just overall has been a pretty good deal to uh, try to open up more access for the for the public. So I think it was a win win. Thank you. Rich. I my sen sentiments the same with <clears throat> everyone that said it's a good group. I think we're moving forward. I don't think you can expect giant changes, but I look forward to a legislative session as well and, and moving forward. I think what's kind of cool is when you look at what our objectives or our, our ideas, our goals, what you'll send out, probably Stephanie, that we all want to look for. I think, I think as a whole, there's a lot of great things that we all want to work on um, that may take, may take some time, but it's nice to see that I think that all the concepts, ideas, everything, I would think we have the, uh, as a group have a consensus towards some of those really important things. So I think that's a good thing. It's their starting points. And so Hopefully we can kind of move forward as a group on those. So I thought it was productive as well. Thanks. Yeah, I think the video that the education video is going to be a big key. How we how we get people to take it and, and take advantage of it will be the next step for us. But I think we need to all weigh in on that video and get that message out. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, and again, I I appreciate each of you coming from your different points in life view of how it works I to me that's the critical factor we can't agree on everything it's not helpful for us to just say yes and I appreciate the fact that nobody really here does that and yet we can we can hash it through and and come to an understanding we're not always all tickled to death with every aspect of this and in review you know I mean we're not quite there yet but in review there was a fairly large plate of things we had to do, fairly large slate of things that were already set in force and had to be addressed. And that's always gonna be the case with these programs that exist is dealing with any improvement or uh, change that comes up as time presents. So I appreciate that. You know, it's, it's easy to feel like, man, we're stuck in it. And I do believe we've talked about them a lot. Um, I like to see things come to a head too within that consensus, and we didn't have to use that, right? We didn't have to use this yeah. thing. Well, we've never used that. No, it was, it was part of our mandate. Yeah. We shouldn't do it again. <laughs> well, we first Don't have to. Like we first really have to disagree. <laughs> you know, it's just a, a point of how we would operate. So, yeah, maybe we'll get there. You know, and to the point about going forward, um, just to emphasize again, uh, Tyranny kind of capped it up. If you have an opinion on this educational piece, you need to put it forward because they're working on it. And this really did come from all of us at some point in time. Um, there'll be other aspects with those partners that you saw listed and some others in formulating a message that everybody thinks effective. So if you want to put something in there, uh, 
that needs to go now, okay? Um, and then just encourage you really, whatever it is that you see, you know, I asked you all to do uh, uh, type three, enhanced block management, whatever comments for this, we didn't get there. It's not that it isn't off or is off the table. You know, we need to look at how we improve these things with what we see on the landscape now. Those need to be the 23 uh, agenda items, if you have them. Okay, so please, please add to that uh, email in that regard. And then also about how we can function the best. You know, any uh, critique, suggestion that we would have, we wanna consider to do this the best we can. Okay. And then we have time for public comment. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Except Don's gonna comment. Yeah. <laughs> so those, those present, one one is Don. Thank you, Don. Representative Logie here. Uh, I thank you for all your work. And one of the things I in in looking at this education program possibly coming these little videos it it could be your responsibility to go back home to some of your school boards if you see a really good little film strip that they have and ask your school board to have have a teacher show that or go over that and have somebody a rancher or anyone a sportsman go in and explain a little bit of that and that'd be a good way to bring some of those same messages back to the schools and the, and the kids that it needs to get to and then getting to legislation coming forward out of this group, uh, I don't have to be the one to take it, but you know, if you have somebody else in mind, but I, I would, and I would maybe ask, and maybe if you and Hope get together and I'll have to drop some uh, bill requests in. So just if you guys get together and uh, next week, drop me a note and say how many bill requests I'll have to drop. And thank you, everyone, for the work and having me. Just a comment, Denley, on your uh, educational piece in the schools. You know, it, it triggered a thought in my mind about I had one of my daughters was in third grade when one of her teachers said, hey, would you come and talk to us about the harvest at Thanksgiving? And it was an interesting thing because it was just simply talking about what I thought about hunting and the harvest at Thanksgiving time. So as you work towards you know, trying to put something in a curriculum. I don't know if there's a way to do that around that time that would be acceptable, but it's just something that when you were speaking about it, I thought of. Kids well, loved it. And and a lot of that, like I say, it ends up being the local school boards that really bring that in. But I had talked to the superintendent of schools and she, she liked the idea of trying to bring something in, you know, pu pushing it a little harder from the state level because of, the importance of agriculture, the importance of wildlife, the importance of habitat, all of that bring it together, you know, not relating it necessarily to hunting because that'll turn some people off, but the important things to that keep us loving Montana. Thank you. Marcus, you good? Good. Thanks for being here. Jennifer? We have one commenter online, if you're ready, Mr. Chair. Yes, who's up? Kevin, you can now unmute. Thank you, can you hear me? I hear you, Kevin. Awesome, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Kevin Farron again, uh, spelled F-A-R-R-O-N, and I am the chapter coordinator for Montana BHA. Um, after another three plus hours of great conversations, I do have comments on a number of your agenda items. Thank you for the opportunity to weigh in. First, I for one appreciate Ed's jokes. Uh, second, in regards to the committee recommending that FWP implement an online reservation system for the type two block management with a focus on equitable opportunities rather than just the first come first serve. Um, we would like to add a full-throated yes, please. Um, and yes, let's take it a step further and encourage FTP to include this on their phase two or maybe three mobile app. 
Um, this could also allow the ability for hunters to check in and check out of BMAs, allowing the department and importantly landowners to track the comings and goings, which could help increase both landowner confidence and public hunters behavior and also likely lead to better behavior on the ground. Couple this with Director Warshek's desire uh, for mandatory reporting on the app, and now we're really getting somewhere. This sort of functionality could also provide some valuable information based on today's earlier conversations regarding block management satisfaction, um, the amount of game seen, harvests, number of other hunters, et cetera. Let's get the data, then let's make decisions and create incentive based on what we wanna see happen on these properties. And while I'm not a mobile app developer and don't claim to fully understand what it would take to, to implement this, um, I'm a little disappointed to hear the roadblocks being thrown up by the department in regards to this request. If we can get a pheasant rearing program built and operational at the state penitentiary in relatively no time, I'm confident that the department can find a way to implement this request in less than two years. As Chair Beal mentioned, um, with programs that do have mobile capabilities like the Land Trust app that we see um, directly competing with block management in the here and now, this is no longer just a good idea or a want. It's becoming a necessity to keep up with the changing landscape of both hunter access and landowner convenience and confidence and knowing who is in their land or who is on their land and when. Um, thirdly, regarding the bonus points for advanced hunter ed incentive, um, we want to again reiterate that, you know, we're supportive of the online private land specific hunter ed course that focuses on hunter behavior and ethics. We can be our own worst enemy in this regard and Montana BHA supports efforts to improve hunter behavior, including helping work with Greg to create and launch the Respect to Access Protect the Hunt campaign. That said, while we're not necessarily opposed to the bonus point incentive or any other creative carrot ideas, we would prefer that this simply be a requirement for anyone wishing to participate in the privilege of hunting private lands enrolled in public access. Um, we make this a requirement for trapping, black bear hunting, why can't we do the same here? As members of the committees have said, the bonus point incentive will not apply to everyone. You know, some of us don't really play the bonus point game including a big chunk of non-residents who really just purpose or purchase preference points for the general tag opportunities. So, and I have to imagine that non-residents are a big part of the contingent we're targeting here with this private lands hunter ed course. So let's be conscious of that incentive. Um, and if we incorporated this into the existing hunter ed course, like we've mentioned, that assumingly would only hit the new hunters coming through the ranks and it would fail to address, you know, the existing hunters um, in addition to all the states that offer reciprocity for having taken their own state's hunter as hunter's ed. So if we went that route, my concern is that we're definitely going to address the 12, 13, 14 year olds coming into the hunting world. But, you know, by the time they're 25, we might not have black management to hunt anymore. We, we need to fix this across the board right now. Um, but the best part about this being a requirement is that if folks really don't want to participate and take the course, then great. They don't have to but then they also shouldn't expect to be granted the privilege to hunt private lands enrolled in the block program. And then finally guys, um, regarding the landowner preference that we've talked about, you know, if there's some concern that landowners are potentially abusing the program by not having adequate elk habitat or elk on their property for any substantial amount of time, I would agree that a good way to fix this would be to make that landowner permit applicable for their deeded land only. Um, to representative Logie's point, Someone with 160 acres could be offering better elk habitat than someone with 640 acres. Plus, Montana has 11 weeks of the general big game season and up to six months of shoulder seasons. If that's not enough time to find an elk on whatever property, then I think it's a fair question to ask whether the landowner should be entitled to an elk permit for providing quote unquote elk habitat. This change would take the subjective nature of the program out of the equation in terms of what constitutes as good elk habitat or what acreage is appropriate. And it would probably make FWP's job easier, um, but it would definitely prevent abuse. And plus, if we made these deeded land only, it could actually help address some of the elk concentration issues we're experiencing in the state. Um, but without the change, we potentially have landowners targeting and pressuring the quote unquote good elk on public lands, pushing them somewhere else in the district, um, potentially back onto private lands, you know, further, um, I think, making this program even worse. So, with that, um, I really, really appreciate all the conversations and all the time and all the progress that you all are making. Thank you again for everything you're doing and for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, that concludes your commenters. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, any last word? 
Okay. Motion to adjourn accepted. Thank you all. Travel safe. Y'all filled out your yeah, if you have to turn in your travel, travel docs. Travel.